1. Argument. The Contention of Achilles and Agamemnon. In the War of Troy, the Greeks, having sacked some of the neighboring towns, and taken from thence two beautiful captives, Chryseis and Briseis, allotted the first to Agamemnon, and the last to Achilles. Chryses, the father of Chryseis and priest of Apollo, comes to the Grecian camp to ransom her, with which the action of the poem opens in the tenth year of the siege. The priest, being refused and insolently dismissed by Agamemnon, entreats for vengeance from his god, who inflicts a pestilence on the Greeks. Achilles calls a council and encourages Calchas to declare the cause of it, who attributes it to the refusal of Chryseis. The king, being obliged to send back his captive, enters into a furious contest with Achilles, which Nestor pacifies. However, as he had the absolute command of the army, he seizes on Briseis in revenge. Achilles, in discontent, withdraws himself and his forces from the rest of the Greeks, and complaining to Thetis, she supplicates Jupiter to render them sensible of the wrong done to her son by giving victory to the Trojans. Jupiter, granting her suit, incenses Juno, between whom the debate runs high, till they are reconciled by the address of Vulcan. The time of two and twenty days is taken up in this book, nine during the plague, one in the council and quarrel of the princes, and twelve for Jupiter's stay among the Ethiopians, at whose return Thetis prefers her petition. The scene lies in the Grecian camp, then changes to Chrysa, and lastly to Olympus. Of Peleus's son, Achilles, sing, O Muse, the vengeance deep and deadly, whence to Greece unnumbered ills arose, which many a soul of mighty warriors to the viewless shades untimely sent. They on the battle plain unburied lay, a prey to ravening dogs and carrion birds. But so had Jove decreed from that sad day when first in wordy war the mighty Agamemnon, king of men, confronted, stood by Helius's godlike son. Say then, what god the fatal strife provoked? Jove's and Latona's son. He, filled with wrath against the king, with deadly pestilence, the camp afflicted, and the people died. For Chryses' sake, his priest, whom Atreus' son with scorn dismissed, when to the Grecian ships he came, his captive daughter to redeem with costly ransom charged, and in his hand the sacred fillet of his god he bore, and golden staff. To all he sued, but chief to Atreus' sons, twin captains of the host. Ye sons of Atreus, and ye well-grieved Greeks, may the great gods, who on Olympus dwell, Grant you yon hostile city to destroy, and home return in safety. But my child, restore, I pray, her proffered ransom take, and in his priest the Lord of Light revere. Then through the ranks 
assenting murmurs ran. The priest to reverence, and the ransom take. Not so Atrides. He, with haughty mien and bitter speech, the trembling sire addressed. Old man, I warn thee, that beside our ships I find thee not, or lingering now, or back returning, lest thou prove of small avail thy golden staff and fillet of thy god. Her I release not, till her youth be fled. Within my walls, in Argos, far from home, her lot is cast. Domestic cares to ply, and share a master's bed. For thee be gone, incense me not, lest ill betide thee now. He said, the old man trembled and obeyed. Beside the many dashing ocean's shore, silent he passed, and all apart he prayed to great Apollo, fair Latona's son. Hear me, god of the silver bow, whose care Chrysa surrounds, and Scylla's lovely veil, whose sovereign sway o'er Tenedos extends. O Smintheus, hear! If e'er my offered gifts found favor in thy sight, if e'er to thee I burned the fat of bulls and choicest goats, grant me this boon. Upon the Grecian host let thine unerring darts avenge my tears. Thus, as he prayed, his prayer Apollo heard. Along Olympus' heights he passed, his heart burning with wrath. Behind his shoulders hung his bow and ample quiver. At his back rattled the fateful arrows as he moved. Like the night cloud he passed, and from afar he bent against the ships and sped the bolt, and fierce and deadly twanged the silver bow. First on the mules and dogs, on man, the last was perfect the hourly storm, and through the camp constant and numerous blazed the funeral fires. Nine days the heavenly archer on the troops hurled his dread shafts. The tenth the assembled Greeks Achilles called to council, so inspired by Juno, white-armed goddess, who beheld with pitying eyes the wasting hosts of Greece. When all were met, and closely thronged around, rose the swift-footed chief, and thus began. Great son of Atreus, to my mind there seems, if we would scape from death, one only course, home to retrace our steps, since here at once by war and pestilence our forces waste. But seek we first some prophet, or some priest, or some wise vision seer, since visions too from Jove proceed, who may the cause explain which with such deadly wrath Apollo fires? If for neglected hecatombs or prayers he blame us, or if fat of lambs and goats may soothe his anger and the plague assuage. This said, he sat, and Thestor's son rose, Calchas, the chief of seers, to whom were known the present and the future and the past, who, by his mystic art, Apollo's gift, guided to Ilium's shore the Grecian fleet, who thus with cautious speech replied and said, 
Achilles, loved of heaven, thou bidst me say why thus incensed the far destroying king. Therefore I speak, but promise thou, and swear by word and hand, to bear me harmless through, for well I know my speech must one offend the Argive chief or all the Greeks supreme, and terrible to men of low estate the anger of a king. For though a while he veil his wrath, yet in his bosom pent it still is nursed until the time arrive. Say then, wilt thou protect me if I speak? Him answered thus Achilles, swift of foot. Speak boldly out, whate'er thine art can tell, for by Apollo's self I swear, whom thou, O Calchas, servst, and who thy words inspires, that while I live and see the light of heaven, not one of all the Greeks shall dare on thee beside our ships, injurious hands to lay. No, not if Agamemnon's self were he, who mid our warriors boasts the foremost place. Emboldened thus, the unerring prophet spoke. Not for neglected hecatombs or prayers, but for his priest, whom Agamemnon scorned, nor took his ransom, nor his child restored. On his account the far destroyer sent this scourge of pestilence, and yet will send. Nor shall we cease his heavy hand to feel, till to her sire we give the bright-eyed girl, unbought, unransomed, and to Chrysa's shore a solemn hecatomb dispatch. This done, the god appeased, his anger may remit. This said, he sat, and Atreus's godlike son, the mighty monarch Agamemnon, rose, his dark soul filled with fury, and his eyes flashing like flames of fire. On Calchas first a withering glance he cast, and thus he spoke. Prophet of ill, thou never speak'st to me but words of evil omen, for thy soul delights to augur ill, but aught of good thou never yet hast promised nor performed, and now among the Greeks Thou spreadst abroad thy lying prophecies, that all these ills come from the far destroyer, for that I refused the ransom of my lovely prize, and that I rather chose herself to keep, to me not less than Clytemnestra dear, my virgin wedded wife, nor less adorned in gifts of form, of feature, or of mind, yet if it must be so, I give her back. I wish my people's safety, not their death. But seek me out forthwith some other spoil, lest empty-handed I alone appear of all the Greeks, for this would ill be seen. And how I lose my present share, ye see. To whom Achilles, swift of foot, replied, Haughtiest of men, and greediest of the prey, How shall our valiant Greeks for thee seek out some other spoil? No common fund have we of hoarded treasures, what our arms have won from captured towns has been already shared. Nor can we now resume the apportioned spoil. Restore the maid, 
obedient to the god. And if heaven will that we the strong-built walls of Troy should raise, our warriors will to thee a threefold, fourfold recompense assign. To whom the monarch Agamemnon thus Think not, Achilles, valiant though thou art in fight, and godlike, to defraud me thus, thou shalt not so persuade me, nor o'erreach. Think'st thou to keep thy portion of the spoil, while I with empty hands sit humbly down? Bright-eyed girl, thou bidst me to restore, if then the valiant Greeks for me seek out some other spoil, some compensation just, tis well. If not, I with my own right hand will from some other chief, from thee perchance, or Ajax, or Ulysses, rest his prey, and woe to him on whomsoe'er I call. But this for future counsel we remit. Haste we then now our dark-ribbed bark to launch, muster a fitting crew, and place on board the sacred hecatomb. Then last embark the fair Chryseis, and in chief command let some one of our counselors be placed, Ajax, or Ulysses, or Idomeneus, or thou, the most ambitious of them all, that so our rights may soothe the angry god. To whom Achilles thus with scornful glance, O oh, Clothed in shamelessness, O oh, sordid soul, How canst thou hope that any Greek For thee will brave the toils of travel or of war? Well dost thou know that t'was no feud of mine With Troy's brave sons that brought me here in arms? They never did me wrong, they never drove my cattle Or my horses never sought in Phaea's fertile life-sustaining fields to waste the crops. For wide between us lay the shadowy mountains and the roaring sea. With thee, O oh void of shame, with thee we sailed, for Menelaus and for thee, ingrate, glory and fame on Trojan crests to win. All this hast thou forgotten, or despised, and threatenest now to wrest from me the prize I labored hard to win, and Greeks bestowed? Nor does my portion ever equal thine, when on some populous town our troops have made successful war. In the contentious fight the larger portion of the toil is mine. But when the day of distribution comes, thine is the richest spoil, while I, forsooth, must be too well content to bear on board some paltry prize for all my warlike toil. To Phaea now I go, so better far to steer my homeward course, and leave thee here. But little like I deem dishonoring me. To fill thy coffers with the spoils of war. Whom answered Agamemnon, king of men. Fly then, if such thy mind. I ask thee not on mine account to stay. Others there are will guard my honor and avenge my cause and, chief of all, the Lord of Council, Jove. Of all the heaven-born kings, thou art the man I hate the most, for thou delight'st in naught but war and strife. 
thy prowess, I allow. Yet this, remember, is the gift of heaven. Return then with thy vessels, if thou wilt, and with thy followers home, and lord it there over thy myrmidons. I heed thee not, I care not for thy fury, hear my threat. Since Phoebus rests Chryseis from my arms in mine own ship, and with mine own good crew, her I sent forth, and in her stead, I mean even from thy tent, myself to bear thy prize, the fair Briseis, that henceforth thou know how far I am thy master, and that, taught by thine example, Others too may fear to rival me, and brave me to my face. Thus while he spake, Achilles chafed with rage, and in his manly breast his heart was torn with thoughts conflicting, whether from his side to draw his mighty sword, and thrusting by the assembled throng, to kill the insulting king, or school his soul, and keep his anger down. But while in mind and spirit thus he mused, and half unsheathed his sword, from heaven came down Minerva, sent by Juno, white-armed queen, whose love and care both chiefs alike enjoyed. She stood behind, and by the yellow hair she held the son of Peleus, visible to him alone, by all the rest unseen. Achilles, wondering, turned, and straight he knew the blue-eyed palace. Awful was her glance, whom thus the chief with winged words addressed. Why comest thou, child of each sparing Jove, to see the arrogance of Atreus' son? But this I say, and will make good my words, this insolence may cost him soon his life. To whom the blue-eyed goddess thus replied, From heaven I came, to curb, if thou wilt hear, thy fury, sent by Juno, white-armed queen, whose love and care ye both alike enjoy. Cease then these broils, and draw not thus thy sword. In words, indeed, assail him as thou wilt. But this I promise, and will make it good, a time shall come, when for this insolence a threefold compensation shall be thine. Only be swayed by me, and curb thy wrath. Whom answered thus Achilles, swift of foot? Goddess, I needs must yield to your commands, indignant though I be. For so tis best. Who hears the gods, of them his prayers are heard. He said, and on the silver hilt he stayed his powerful hand, and flung his mighty sword back to its scabbard, to Minerva's word obedient. She her heavenward course pursued to join the immortals in the abode of Jove. But Peleus' son, with undiminished wrath, Atrides thus with bitter words addressed, Thou sought, with eye of dog, and heart of deer, who never darest to lead in armed fight the assembled hosts, nor with a chosen few to man the secret ambush, for thou fearest to look on death, no doubt tis easier far, 
girt with thy troops to plunder of his right, whoe'er may venture to oppose thy will? A tyrant king, because thou rulest over slaves, were it not so, this insult were thy last. But this I say, and with an oath confirm, by this my royal staff, which never more shall put forth leaf nor spray, since first it left upon the mountain side its parent stem, nor blossomed more, since all round the axe hath lopped both leaf and bark, and now tis born emblem of justice by the sons of Greece who guard the sacred ministry of law before the face of Jove. A mighty oath! The time shall come when all the sons of Greece shall mourn Achilles' loss, and thou, the while heart rent, shalt be all impotent to aid, when by the warrior slayer Hector's hand many shall fall, and then thy soul shall mourn the slight on Grecia's bravest warrior cast. Thus spoke Pelides, and upon the ground he cast his staff, with golden studs embossed, and took his seat. On the other side, in wrath, Atrides burned. But Nestor interposed. Nestor, the leader of the Pylian host, the smooth-tongued chief, from whose persuasive lips Sweeter than honey flowed the stream of speech. Two generations of the sons of men for him were past and gone, who with himself were born and bred on Pylos's lovely shore, and o'er the third he now held royal sway. He thus with prudent words the chiefs addressed. Alas! Alas, what grief is this for Greece! What joy for Priam, and for Priam's sons! What exultation for the men of Troy to hear of feuds between you, of all the Greeks, the first in council, and the first in fight! Yet hear my words, I pray, in years at least, ye both must yield to me. And in times past, I lived with men, and they despised me not. They were in counsel, greater than yourselves. Such men I never saw, and ne'er shall see, as Pyrithus and Trius, wise and brave, Sinus, Exodius, godlike Polypheme, and Theseus, Aegeus, is more than mortal son, the mightiest they among the sons of men, the mightiest they, and of the forest beasts strove with the mightiest, and their rage subdued. With them from distant lands, from Pylos's shore, I joined my forces, and their call obeyed? With them I played my part? With them not one would dare to fight Of mortals now on earth? Yet they my counsels heard, my voice obeyed? And hear ye also, for my words are wise? Nor thou, though great thou be, Attempt to rob Achilles of his prize? But let him keep the spoil assigned him by the sons of Greece. Nor thou, Pelides, with the monarch strive in rivalry? For ne'er to sceptred king hath Jove such powers as to Atrides given. And valiant though thou art, and goddess born, 
yet mightier he, for wider is his sway. Atrides, curb thy wrath, while I beseech Achilles to forbear, in whom the Greeks from adverse war their great defender see. To whom the monarch Agamemnon thus O father, full of wisdom are thy words, but this proud chief o'er all would domineer, o'er all he seeks to rule, o'er all to reign, to all to dictate, which I will not bear. Grant that the gods have given him warlike might. Gave they unbridled license to his tongue? Whom Achilles interrupting thus. Coward and slave indeed I might be deemed, Could I submit to make thy word my law, To others thy commands. Seek not to me to dictate, For I follow thee no more. But hear me speak, and ponder what I say, For the fair girl I fight not, since you choose to take away the prize yourselves bestowed, with thee or any one, but of the rest my dark swift ship contains, against my will on naught shalt thou unpunished lay thy hand. Make trial, if thou wilt, that these may know thy life-blood soon should reek upon my spear. After this conflict, keen of angry speech, the chiefs arose, the assembly was dispersed, with his own followers and Menetius his son. Achilles to his tents and ships withdrew, but Atreus' son launched a swift sailing bark with twenty rowers manned, and placed on board the sacred Hecatomb. Then last embarked the fair Chryseis, and in chief command, Laertes' son, the sage Ulysses, placed. They swiftly sped along the watery way. Next, proclamation through the camp was made to purify the host, and in the sea, obedient to the word, they purified. Then to Apollo solemn rites performed, with faultless hecatombs of birds and goats, upon the margin of a watery waste, and, wreathed in smoke, the savor rose to heaven. The camp thus occupied, the king pursued his threatened plan of vengeance. To his side, calling Talthybius and Eurybates, heralds and faithful followers, thus he spoke. Haste to Achilles' tent, and in your hand, back with you, thence, the fair Briseis bring. If he refuse to send her, I myself, with a sufficient force, will bear her thence, which he may find, perchance, the worse for him. So spake the monarch, and with stern command dismissed them. With reluctant steps they passed along the margin of the watery waste, till to the tents and ships they came, where lay the warlike Myrmidons. Their chief they found, sitting beside his tent and dark-ribbed shed. Achilles marked their coming, not well pleased, with troubled mien and awe-struck by the king, they stood nor dared accost him, but himself divined their errand, and addressed them thus. Welcome, ye messengers of gods and men, heralds, approach in safety. Not with you, but with Atreides is my just offense, who for the fair Briseis sends you here. Go then, Patroclus, bring the maiden forth, and give her to their hands. 
But witness ye before the blessed gods and mortal men, And to the face of that injurious king, When he shall need my arm from shameful rout To save his followers, Blinded by his rage, he neither heeds experience of the past, Nor scans the future, provident how best To guard his fleet and army from the foe. He spoke, obedient to his friend and chief, Patroclus led the fair Briseis forth, And gave her to their hands. They to the ships retraced their steps, and with them the fair girl reluctant went. Meanwhile Achilles, plunged in bitter grief, from all the band apart, upon the margin of the hoary sea, sat idly gazing on the dark blue waves, and to his goddess mother long he prayed, with outstretched hands. O oh, mother, since thy son to early death by destiny is doomed, I might have hoped the thunderer on high, Olympian Jove, with honor would have crowned my little space. But now disgrace is mine, since Agamemnon, the wide ruling king, hath wrested from me, and still holds my prize. Weeping, he spoke. His goddess mother heard beside her aged father, where she sat in the deep ocean caves. Ascending quick through the dark waves, like to a misty cloud, beside her son she stood, and as he wept, she gently touched him with her hand and said, Why weeps my son, and whence his cause of grief? Speak out that I may hear, and share thy pain. To whom Achilles swift of foot replied, groaning, Thou knowest? What boots to tell thee all? On Thebes we marched, the Asians' sacred town, And stormed the walls, and hither bore the spoil. The spoils were fairly, by the sons of Greece, apportioned out, And to Atrides' share, the beauteous daughter of old Chryses fell. Chryses, Apollo's priest, to free his child, came to the encampment of the brass-clad Greeks, with costly ransom charged. And in his hand the sacred fillet of his god he bore, and golden staff. To all he sued, but chief to Atreus' sons, twin captains of the host. Then through the ranks assenting murmurs ran, the priest to reverence, and the ransom take. Not so Atreides. He, with haughty mien and bitter words, the trembling sire dismissed. The old man turned in sorrow, but his prayer Phoebus Apollo heard, who loved him well. Against the Greeks he bent his fatal bow, and fast the people fell. On every side, throughout the camp, the heavenly arrows flew. A skillful seer, at length, the cause revealed, Why thus incensed the archer god? I, then, the first, gave counsel to appease his wrath. Whereat Atrides, full of fury, rose, And uttered threats, which he hath now fulfilled. For Chryses' daughter to her native land In a swift sailing ship the keen-eyed Greeks have sent With costly offerings to the god But her assigned me by the sons of Greece Chryses' fair daughter From my tent e'en now the heralds bear away Then 
goddess. Thou, if thou hast power, protect thine injured son. Fly to Olympus, to the feet of Jove, and make thy prayer to him, if on his heart thou hast, in truth, by word or deed, a claim. For I remember, in thy father's house, I oft have heard thee boast, how thou, alone of all the immortals, Saturn's cloud-girt son, didst shield from foul disgrace, when all the rest, Juno and Neptune and Minerva joined with chains to bind him. Then, O goddess, thou didst set him free, invoking to his aid him of the hundred arms, who Briarius, the immortal gods, and men, Aegean call. He, mightier than his father, took his seat by Saturn's side in pride of conscious strength. Fear seized on all the gods, nor did they dare to bind their king. Of this, remind him now, and clasp his knees, and supplicate his aid for Troy's brave warriors, that the routed Greeks back to their ships with slaughter may be driven, that all may taste the folly of their king, and Agamemnon's haughty self may mourn the slight on Grisha's bravest warrior cast. Thus he, and Thetis weeping, thus replied, Alas, my child, that ere I gave thee birth, would that beside thy ships thou couldst remain from grief exempt and insult, since by fate few years are thine, and not a lengthened term, at once to early death and sorrows doomed beyond the lot of man. In evil hour I gave thee birth, but to the snow-clad heights of great Olympus, to the throne of Jove who wields the thunder, thy complaints I bear. Thou, by the ships, meanwhile, against the Greeks thine anger nurse, and from the fight abstain. For Jove is to a solemn banquet gone beyond the sea, on Ethiopia's shore, since yesternight, and with him all the gods. On the twelfth day he purposed to return to high Olympus. Thither then will I, and to his feet, my supplication make. And he, I think, will not deny my suit. This said, she disappeared, and left him there, musing in anger on the lovely form torn from his arms by violence away. Meantime, Ulysses, with his sacred freight, arrived at Chrysus' strand, and when his bark had reached the shelter of the deep sea bay, their sails they furled and lowered to the hold, slacked the retaining shrouds, and quickly struck and stoned away the mast. Then with their sweeps pulled for the beach, and cast their anchors out, and made her fast with cables to the shore. Then on the shingly breakwater themselves they landed, and the sacred hecatomb to great Apollo, and Chryseis last. Her to the altar straight Lysis led a wise counsel. In her father's hand he placed the maiden, and addressed him thus. Chryses, from Agamemnon, king of men, to thee I come 
thy daughter to restore, and to thy God, upon the Greeks' behalf, to offer sacrifice, if haply so we may appease his wrath, who now, incensed with grievous suffering, visits all our host. Then to her sire he gave her, he with joy received his child. The sacred hecatomb around the well-built altar for the god in order due they placed. Their hands then washed and the salt cake prepared. Before them all, with hands uplifted, Chryses prayed aloud. Hear me, god of the silver bow, whose care Chrysa surrounds, and Scylla's lovely veil, whose sovereign sway o'er Tenedos extends. Once hast thou heard my prayer, avenged my cause, and poured thy fury on the Grecian host. Hear yet again, and grant what now I ask. Withdraw thy chastening hand, and stay the plague. Thus, as he prayed, his prayer Apollo heard. Their prayers concluded, and the salt cake strewed upon the victim's head. They drew them back, and slew and flay. Then, cutting from the thighs the choicest pieces, and in double layers, or spreading them with fat, above them placed the due meat offerings. Then the aged priest the cleft wood kindled, and libations poured of ruddy wine. Armed with the five forked prongs, the attendant ministers beside him stood. The thighs consumed with fire, the inward parts they tasted first, the rest upon the spits roasted with care, and from the fire withdrew. Their labors ended, and the feast prepared, they shared the social meal, nor lacked their aught. A rage of thirst and hunger satisfied, the attendant youths the flowing goblets crowned, and in fit order served the cups to all. All day they sought the favor of the god, the glorious paeans chanting, and the praise of Phoebus. He, well pleased, the strain received. But when the sun was set, and shades of night o'erspread the sky, upon the sandy beach, close to their ship, they laid them down to rest. And when the rosy-fingered morn appeared, back to the camp they took their homeward way. A favoring breeze the far destroyer sent. They stepped the mast and spread the snowy sail. Full in the midst the bellying sail received the gallant breeze, and round the vessel's prow the dark waves loudly roared as on she rushed, skimming the seas and cut her watery way. Arrived where lay the widespread host of Greece, their dark-ribbed vessel on the beach they drew, high on the sand, and strongly shored her up. Then, through the camp, they took their several ways. Meantime, beside the ships, Achilles sat, the heaven-born son of Peleus, swift of foot, chafing with rage repressed. No more he sought the honored council, nor the battlefield, but wore his soul away, and inly pined for the fierce joy and tumult of the fight. But when the twelfth revolving day was come, 
back to Olympus's heights, the immortal gods, Jove at their head, together all return. Then, Thetis, mindful of her son's request, rose from the ocean wave, and sped in haste to high Olympus and the courts of heaven. The all-seeing son of Saturn there she found, sitting apart upon the topmost crest of many ridged Olympus. At his feet she sat, and while her left hand clasped his ease, her right approached his beard, and suppliant thus, she made her prayer to Saturn's royal son. Father, if e'er amid the immortal gods, by word or deed, I did thee service true, hear now my prayer. Avenge my hapless son, of mortals shortest lived, insulted now by mighty Agamemnon king of men, and plundered of his lawful spoils of war. But Jove, Olympian, lord of counsel, thou avenge his cause, and give to Trojan arms such strength and power, that Greeks may learn how much they need my son, and give him honor due she said. The cloud compeller answered not, but silent sat. Then Thetis clasped his knees and hung about him, and her suit renewed. Give me thy promise, sure, thy gracious nod, or else refuse, for thou hast none to fear that I may learn of all the immortal gods how far I stand the lowest in thine eyes. Then, much disturbed, the cloud compeller spoke. Sad work thou makest in bidding me oppose my will to Juno's when her bitter words assail me. For full oft amid the gods, she taunts me that I aid the Trojan cause. But thou return, that Juno see thee not, and leave to me the furtherance of thy suit. Lo, to confirm thy faith, I nod my head. And well among the immortal gods is known the solemn import of that pledge from me. For ne'er my promise shall deceive, or fail, or be recalled, if with a nod confirmed. He said, and nodded with his shadowy brows, waved on the immortal head the ambrosial locks, and all Olympus trembled at his nod. They parted thus. From bright Olympus's heights, the goddess hasted to her ocean caves, Jove to his palace. At his entrance, all rose from their seats at once. Not one presumed to wait his coming, but advanced to meet. Then on his throne he sat, but not unmarked of Juno's eye had been the council held in secret with the silver-footed queen, the daughter of the aged ocean god. And with sharp words, she thus addressed her lord, Tell me, deceiver, who was she with whom thou late houndst council? Ever tis thy way, apart from me, to weave thy secret schemes. Nor dost thou freely share with me thy mind? To whom the sire of gods and men replied, 
Expect not, Juno, all my mind to know. My wife thou art, yet would such knowledge be too much for thee. Whate'er I deem it fit that thou shouldst know, nor God nor man shall hear before thee. But what I in secret plan, seek not to know, nor curiously inquire. Whom answered thus the stag-eyed queen of heaven? What words, dread son of Saturn, dost thou speak? Ne'er have I sought, or now, or heretofore, thy secret thoughts to know. What thou think'st fit to tell, I wait thy gracious will to hear. Yet fear I in my soul thou art beguiled by wiles of Thetis, silver-footed queen, the daughter of the aged ocean god. For she was with thee early, and embraced thy knees, and has, I think, thy promise sure thou wilt avenge Achilles' cause, and bring destructive slaughter on the Grecian host. To whom the Cloud Compeller thus replied, Presumptuous! To thy busy thoughts thou givest too free a range, and watchest all I do. Yet shalt thou not prevail, but rather thus be aliened from my heart, the worse for thee. If this be so, it is my sovereign will. But now keep silence, and my words obey. Lest all the immortals fail, if I be wroth to rescue thee from my resistless hand. He said, and terror seized the stag-eyed queen. Silent she sat, curbing her spirit down, and all the gods in pitying sorrow mourned. Oaken, the skilled artificer, then first broke silence, and with soothing words addressed his mother Juno, white-armed queen of heaven. Sad wert indeed, and grievous to be born, if for the sake of mortal men you too should suffer angry passions to arise, and kindle broils in heaven. So should our feast, by evil influence, all its sweetness lack. Let me advise my mother, and I know that her own reason will my words approve, to speak my father fair, lest he again reply in anger, and our banquet mar. For Jove, the lightning's lord, if such his will, might hurl us from our seats, so great his power. But thou address him still with gentle words, so shall his favor soon again be ours. This said, he rose, and in his mother's hand a double goblet placed, as thus he spoke. Have patience, mother mine, though much enforced, restrain thy spirit, lest perchance these eyes, dear as thou art, behold thee brought to shame, and I, though grieved in heart, be impotent to save thee, for tis hard to strive with Jove. When to thy succor once before I came, he seized me by the foot, and hurled me down from heaven's high threshold. All the day I fell, and, with the setting sun, on Lemnos's isle, lighted, scarce half alive. There I was found, and by the Sintian people kindly nursed. Thus, as he spoke, the white-armed goddess smiled, and smiling, from his hand 
receives the cup. Then to the immortals all, in order due, he ministered, and from the flagon poured the luscious nectar, while among the gods rose laughter irrepressible at sight of Vulcan hobbling round the spacious hall. Thus they, till sunset, passed the festive hours, nor lacked the banquet aught to please the sense, nor sound of tuneful lyre by Phoebus touched, nor Muse's voice, who in alternate strings responsive sang. But when the sun had set, each to his home departed, where for each the crippled Vulcan, matchless architect, with wondrous skill a noble house had reared. To his own couch, where he was wont of old, when overcome by gentle sleep, to rest, Olympian Jove ascended. There he slept, and by his side the golden throned queen. Book Two Argument The Trial of the Army and Catalogue of the Forces Jupiter, in pursuance of the request of Thetis, sends a deceitful vision to Agamemnon, persuading him to lead the army to battle, in order to make the Greeks sensible of their want of Achilles. The general, who is deluded with the hopes of taking Troy without his assistance, but fears the army was discouraged by his absence and the late plague, as well as by length of time, contrives to make trial of their disposition by a stratagem. He first communicates his design to the princes in council, that he would propose a return to the soldiers, and that they should put a stop to them if the proposal was embraced. Then he assembles the whole host, and upon moving for a return to Greece, they unanimously agree to it, and run to prepare the ships. They are detained by the management of Ulysses, who chastises the insolence of Thersites. The assembly is recalled, several speeches made on the occasion, and at length the advice of Nestor followed, which was to make a general muster of the troops and to divide them into their several nations before they proceeded to battle. This gives occasion to the poet to enumerate all the forces of the Greeks and Trojans in a large catalogue. The time employed in this book consists not entirely of one day. The scene lies in the Grecian camp and upon the seashore. Toward the end it removes to Troy. All night, in sleep, reposed the other gods and helmet warriors. But the eyes of Jove, sweet slumber, held not, pondering in his mind how to avenge Achilles' cause, and pour destructive slaughter on the Grecian host. Thus, as he mused, the wisest course appeared, by a deluding vision to mislead the son of Atreus, and with winged words thus to a phantom form he gave command. I thee, deluding vision, to the camp and ships of Greece, to Agamemnon's tent, there changing not as I command thee, speak. Bid that he arm in haste the long-haired Greeks to combat, for the wide-built streets of Troy he now may capture, since the immortal gods watch over her no longer. All are gained by Juno's prayers, and woes impend for Troy. He said, the vision heard and straight obeyed. Swiftly he sped, and reached the Grecian ships, and sought the son of Atreus. Him he found within his tent, wrapped in ambrosial sleep. Above his head he stood, like Neleus' son, Nestor, whom Agamemnon reverenced most of all the elders. 
in his likeness clothed, thus spoke the heavenly vision. Sleeps thou, son of Atreus, valiant warrior, horseman bold? To sleep all night, but ill becomes a chief, charged with the public weal and cares of state. Hear now the words I bear. To thee I come, a messenger from Jove, who from on high looks down on thee with eyes of pitying love. He bids thee arm in haste the long-haired Greeks to combat, since the wide-built streets of Troy thou now mayst capture. For the immortal gods watch o'er her no longer. All are gained by Juno's prayers, and woes impend o'er Troy. Bear this in mind, and when from sleep aroused, let not my words from thy remembrance fade. This said, he vanished. And the monarch left, inspired with thoughts which ne'er should come to pass. For in that day he vainly hoped to take the town of Prime, ignorant what Jove designed in secret, or what woes, what groans, what lengthened labors in the stubborn fight were yet for Trojans and for Greeks in store. He woke from sleep. But o'er his senses spread, dwelt still the heavenly voice. He sat upright, he donned his vest of texture fine, new wrought. Then o'er it threw his ample robe, and bound his sandals fair around his well-turned feet. And o'er his shoulders flung his sword, adorned with silver studs. And bearing in his hand his royal staff, ancestral, to the ships where lay the brass-clad warriors, bent his way. Aurora now was rising up the steep of great Olympus, to the immortal gods pure light diffusing, when Atrides bade the clear-voiced heralds to the assembly call the general host, they gave the word, and straight from every quarter thronged the eager crowd. But first of all the elders, by the side of Nestor's ship, the aged Pylian chief, a secret conclave Agamemnon called, and prudent, thus the chosen few addressed. Hear me, my friends! In the still hours of night, I saw a heavenly vision in my sleep, most like it seemed in stature, form, and face to reverend Nestor. At my head it stood, and with these words addressed me, Sleepst thou, son of Atreus, valiant warrior, horseman bold? To sleep all night but ill becomes a chief, charged with the public weal and cares of state. Hear now the words I bear. To thee I come, a messenger from Jove, who from on high looks down on thee with eyes of pitying love. He bids the arm in haste the long-haired Greeks to combat, since the wide-built streets of Troy thou now mayst capture. For the immortal gods watch o'er her no longer. All are gained by Juno's prayers, and woes impend o'er Troy. Bear thou my words in mind. Thus, as he spoke, he vanished, and sweet sleep forsook mine eyes. Seek we then straight to arm the sons of Greece. But first, as is our wont, Myself will prove the spirit of the army, and suggest their homeward voyage. Ye, throughout the camp, restore their courage, and restrain from flight. Thus, having said, he sat, and 
and next arose Nestor, the chief of Pylos' sandy shore, who thus with prudent speech replied and said, O friends, the chiefs and counselors of Greece, if any other had this vision seen, we should have deemed it false and laughed to scorn the idle tale. But now it hath appeared of all our army to the foremost man. Seek we then straight to arm the sons of Greece. He said, and from the council led the way. Up rose the sceptered monarchs and obeyed their leader's call, and round them thronged the crowd. As swarms of bees that pour in ceaseless stream from out the crevice of some hollow rock, now clustering, and anon mid vernal flowers, some here, some there, in busy numbers fly, so to the assembly from their tents and ships the countless tribes came flying. In their midst, by Jove and kindled, Hunger urged them on. Great was the din, and as the mighty mass sat down, the solid earth beneath them groaned. Nine heralds raised their voices loud to quell the storm of tongues, and bade the noisy crowd be still and listen to the heaven. At length they all were seated, and a while their clamors sank to silence. Then up rose the monarch Agamemnon, in his hand his royal staff, the work of Vulcan's art, which Vulcan to the son of Saturn gave, to Hermes he, the heavenly messenger, Hermes to Pelops, matchless charioteer, Pelops to Atreus, Atreus at his death bequeathed it to Thyestes, wealthy lord of numerous herds, to Agamemnon, last Thyestes left it, token of his sway o'er all the Argive coast and neighboring isles. On this the monarch lent, thus as he spoke. Friends, Grecian heroes, ministers of Mars, grievous and all unlooked for is the blow which Jove hath dealt me. By his promise led, I hoped to raise the strong-built walls of Troy and home return in safety, but it seems he falsifies his word and bids me now return to Argos. Frustrate of my hope, dishonored, and with grievous loss of men. Such now appears the o'erruling sovereign will of Saturn's son, who oft hath sunk the heads of many a lofty city in the dust, and yet will sink, for mighty is his hand. Tis shame indeed that future days should hear how such a force as ours, so great, so brave, hath thus been baffled, fighting as we do, against numbers far inferior to our own, and see no end of all our warlike toil. Or should we choose, on terms of plighted truce, Trojans and Greeks, to number our array, of Trojans all that dwell within the town, and we by tens disposed to every ten to crown our cups, one Trojan should assign, full many a ten no cup-bearer would find. So far the sons of Greece outnumber all that dwell within the town, but to their aid Old warriors come from all the cities round, who greatly harass me, and render vain my hope 
to storm the strong-built walls of Troy. Already now, nine weary years have passed. The timbers of our ships are all decayed. The cordage rotted. In our homes, the while our wives and helpless children sit in vain expecting our return. And still the work for which we hither came remains undone. Hear then my counsel. Let us all agree home to direct our course, since here in vain we strive to take the well-built walls of Troy. Thus, as he spoke, the crowd that had not heard the secret counsel, by his words was moved, and so swayed and heaved the multitude, as when o'er the vast billows of the Icarian Sea, Eurus and Notus, from the clouds of heaven, pour forth their fury, or as some deep field of wavy corn, when sweeping o'er the plain the ruffling west wind, sways the bending ears, so was the assembly stirred, and toward the ships, with clamorous joy, they rushed. Beneath their feet rose clouds of dust, while one to other called to seize the ships and drag them to the main. They cleared the channels, and with shouts of HOME that rose to heaven, they knocked the shores away. Then had the Greeks in shameful flight withdrawn, had Juno not to Pallas thus appealed. O oh, heaven, brave child of Aegis bearing Jove, shall thus the Greeks, in ignominious flight, o'er the wide sea their homeward course pursue? And as a trophy to the sons of Troy, the Argive Helen leave, on whose account, far from their home, so many valiant Greeks have cast their lives away? Go quickly thou amid the brass-clad Greeks, and man by man address with words persuasive, nor permit to launch their well-trimmed vessels on the deep. She said, nor did Minerva not obey, but swift, descending from Olympus heights, with rapid flight, she reached the Grecian ships. Laertes' son, in council, sage as Jove, there found she standing. He no hand had laid on his dark vessel, nor with bitter grief his heart was filled. The blue-eyed maid approached and thus addressed him. Great Laertes' son, Ulysses, sage in council, can it be that you, the men of Greece, embarking thus on your swift ships in ignominious flight o'er the wide sea will take your homeward way? And as a trophy to the sons of Troy, the Argive Helen leave, on whose account, far from their homes, so many valiant Greeks have cast their lives away? Go quickly thou among the multitude, and man by man address with words persuasive, nor permit to launch their well-trimmed vessels on the deep. She said, the heavenly voice Ulysses knew, straight Springing to the course, he cast aside, and to Eurybates of Ithaca, his herald and attendant, threw his robe. Then to Atrides hastened, and by him, armed with his royal staff ancestral, passed with rapid step amid the ships of Greece. Each king or leader whom he found, he thus with cheering words encouraged and restrained. O oh, gallant friend, tis not for thee to yield like meaner men to panic, 
but thyself sit quiet, and the common herd restrain. Thou knowest not yet Atrides' secret mind. He tries us now, and may reprove us soon. His words in council reached not all our ears. See that he work us not some ill, or fierce his anger. And the Lord of Council, Jove, from whom proceeds all honor, loves him well. But of the common herd, whom e'er he found clamoring, he checked with staff and threatening words. Good friend, keep still, and hear what others say, thy betters far, for thou art good for naught. Of small account in council or in fight, all are not sovereigns here. Ill fares the state where many masters rule. Let one be lord, one king supreme, to whom wise Saturn's son, in token of his sovereign power, hath given the scepter's sway and ministry of law. Such were his words, as through the ranks he passed. They from the vessels and the tents again thronged to the assembly, with such rush of sound as when the many dashing ocean's wave breaks on the shore and foams the frothing sea. The others all were centered in their seats. Only Thersites, with unmeasured words, of which he had good store, to rate the chiefs, not overseemly, but wherewith he thought to move the crowd to laughter, brawled aloud. The ugliest man was he who came to Troy, with squinting eyes and one distorted foot, his shoulders round and buried in his breast his narrow head, with scanty growth of hair. Against Achilles and Ulysses most his hate was turned, on them his venom poured. Anon, at Agamemnon's self, he launched his loud-tongued ribaldry. Against him he knew incensed the public mind, and Falling loud with skill words, he thus addressed the king. What's more, thou son of Atreus, wouldst thou have? My tents are full of brass, and in those tents many fair women, who, from all the spoil, we Greeks, whene'er some wealthy town we take, choose first of all, and set apart for thee? Or dost thou thirst for gold, which here perchance some Trojan brings, the ransom of his son, captured by me or by some other Greek? Or some new girl to satisfy thy lust, kept for thyself apart? A leader. Thou shouldst not do evil, lead the sons of Greece, ye slaves, ye coward souls, women of Greece. I will not call you men. Why go we not home with our ships, and leave this mighty chief to gloat upon his treasures, and find out whether in truth he needs our aid or no? who on Achilles is superior far. Foul scorn hath passed, and robbed him of his prize, which for himself he keeps. Achilles, sure, is not intemperate, but mild of mood. Else, Atreus' son, this insult were thy last. On Agamemnon, leader of the host, with words like these, Thersites poured his hate. But straight Ulysses, 
at his side appeared and spoke with scornful glance in stern rebuke. Thou babbling fool, Thersites, prompt of speech, restrain thy tongue, nor simply thus presume the kings to slander. Thou, the meanest far of all that with the Atreides came to Troy. Ill it be seems that such an one as thou should lift thy voice against the kings, and rail with skill or liberty, and prates of home. How these affairs may end, we know not yet, nor how, or well or ill, we may return. Cease then, against Atreides, king of men, to pour thy spite, for that the valiant Greeks to him, despite thy railing, as of right an ample portion of the spoils assign. But this I tell thee, and will make it good, if e'er I find thee play the fool as now, then may these shoulders cease this head to bear, and may my son Telemachus no more own me his father, if I strip not off thy mantle and thy garments, I expose thy nakedness, and flog thee to the ships howling, and scourged with ignominious stripes. Thus as he spoke, upon Thersites' neck and back came down his heavy staff. The wretch shrank the blow, and scalding tears let fall. Where struck the golden-studded staff appeared a bloody wheel. Thersites quailed, and down quivering with pain he sat and wiped away with horrible grimace the trickling tears. The Greeks, despite their anger, laughed aloud, and one to other said, Good faith, of all the many works Ulysses well hath done, wise in the council, foremost in the fight, he ne'er hath done a better than when now he makes this skill babbler hold his peace. Methinks his headstrong spirit will not soon lead him again to vilify the kings. Thus spoke the general voice, but staff in hand Ulysses rose. Minerva by his side, in likeness of a herald, bade the crowd keep silence, that the Greeks from first to last might hear his words and ponder his advice. He thus with prudent phrase his speech began. Great son of Atreus, on thy name, O king, throughout the world will foul reproach be cast. If Greeks forget their promise, nor make good the vow they took to thee, when hitherward we sailed from Argos' grassy plains, to raise, ere our return, the well-built walls of Troy. But now, like helpless widows, or like babes, they mourn their cruel fate, and pine for home. Tis hard indeed, defeated, to return. The seaman murmurs, if from wife and home, even for one month, his well-found bark be stayed, tossed by the wintry blasts and stormy sea. But us, the ninth revolving year, beholds, still lingering here. I cannot therefore blame our valiant Greeks, if by the ships I hear their murmurs, yet twere surely worst of all, long to remain, and bootless to return. Bear up, my friends, remain a while, and see if 
Calchas truly prophesy or know. For this ye all have seen, and can yourselves bear witness, all who were yet spared by fate. Not long ago, when ships of Greece were met at Aulis, charged with evil freight for Troy, and we, around a fountain, to the gods our altars reared with faultless hecatombs, near a fair plane tree where bright water flowed, behold, a wonder, by Olympian Jove sent forth to light a snake, with burnished scales of aspect fearful, issuing from beneath the altars, glided to the plane tree straight. There, on the topmost bough, beneath the leaves, cowering, a sparrow's callow nestlings lay. Eight fledglings, and the parent's bird, the nine. All the eight nestlings, uttering piercing cries, the snake devoured. And as the mother flew, lamenting o'er her offspring, round and round, uncoiling, caught her, shrieking by the wing. Then, when the sparrow's nestlings and herself the snake had swallowed, by the god who first sent him to light, a miracle was wrought. For Jove, the deep-designing Saturn's son, turned him to stone. He stood, and wondering, gazed. But when this prodigy befell our rites, Calchas, inspired of heaven, took up his speech. Ye long-haired sons of Greece, why stand ye thus in mute amaze? To us Olympian Jove, to whom be endless praise, vouchsafes this sign, late sent of late fulfillment. As ye saw the snake devour the sparrow and her young, eight nestlings, and the parent bird the ninth, so for so many years are we condemned to wage a fruitless war. But in the tenth, the wide-built city shall at last be ours. Thus he foretold, and now the time is come. Here then, ye well-grieved Greeks, let all remain till Priam's wealthy city be our own. He said, and loudly cheered the Greeks, and loud from all the hollow ships came back the cheers in admiration of Ulysses' speech. Gerenian Nestor next took up a word. Like children, Grecian warriors, ye debate. Like babes, to whom unknown are feats of arms, where then are now our solemn covenants, our plighted oaths. Go, cast we to the fire our counsels held our warriors' plans matured, our absolute pledges, and our hand plight given, in which our trust was placed. Since thus in vain, in words, we wrangle, and how long soe'er we here remain, solution none we find. Atrides, thou, as is thy wont, Maintain unchanged thy counsel. For the stubborn fight array the Greeks, and let perdition seize those few, those two or three among the host, who hold their separate counsel. Not on them depends the issue. Rather than return to Argos, ere we prove if Jove indeed will falsify his promise word or no. For well I ween that on the day when first we Grecians hitherward our course addressed to Troy the messengers of blood and death, the o'er-ruling Saturn, on our right his lightning flashing, 
with auspicious sign assured us of his favor. Let not then the thoughts of home be breathed, and Trojan wives given to our warriors retribution pay for wrongs by us in Helen's cause to sustain. But who so longs, if such an one there be, to make his homeward voyage, let him take his well-rigged bark and go before the rest to meet the doom of death. But thou, O king, be well advised thyself, and others lead by wholesome counsel, for the words I speak are not to be despised. By tribes and clans, O Agamemnon, range thy troops, that so tribe may to tribe give aid, and clan to clan. If thus thou too, and Greeks thy words obey, then shalt thou see of chiefs and troops alike the good and bad, for on their own behoof they all shall fight. And if thou fail, shalt know whether thy failure be of heaven's decree, or man's default and ignorance of war. To whom the monarch Agamemnon thus, Father, in counsel of the sons of Greece, none can compare with thee, and would to Jove, to Pallas, and Apollo, at my side I had but ten such counselors as thee. Then soon should royal Priam's city fall, taken and destroyed by our victorious hands. But now on me hath each sparing Jove, the son of Saturn, fruitless toil imposed, and hurtful quarrels. For in word you war about a girl, Achilles and myself engaged, and I, alas, the strife began. Could we be friends again, delay were none, how short soe'er of Ilium's final doom. But now, to breakfast ere we wage the fight, each sharpen well his spear, his shield prepare, and to his fiery steeds their forage give. Each look his chariot o'er, that through the day we may unwearied stem the tide of war. For respite none, how short soe'er shall be, till night shall bid the storm of battle cease. With sweat shall reek upon each warrior's breast the leathern belt beneath the covering shield, and hands shall ache that wield the ponderous spear. With sweat shall reek the fiery steeds that draw each warrior's car. But whomsoe'er I find loitering beside the beaked ships, for him twere hard to scape the vultures and the dogs. He said, and from the applauding ranks of Greece rose a loud sound, as when the ocean wave, driven by the south wind on some lofty beach, dashes against a prominent crag, exposed to blasts of every storm that roars around. Uprising then, and through the camp dispersed, they took their several by their tents, the fires they lighted, and the meal prepared, and each to some one of the immortal gods his offering made, that in the coming fight he might escape the bitter doom of death. But to the o'erruling son of Saturn, Jove, a sturdy ox, well fattened, five years old, attracted 
to the banquet called the ancient chiefs and counselors of Greece. Nestor the first, the king Idomeneus, the two Ajaces next, and Tydeus' son, Ulysses sixth, as Jove in council sage. But uninvited Menelaus came, knowing what cares upon his brother pressed. Around the ox they stood, and on his head the salt cake sprinkled. Then amid them all the monarch Agamemnon prayed aloud, Most great, most glorious Jove, who dwellst on high in clouds and darkness veiled, grant thou that ere the sun shall set, and night o'erspread the earth, I may the haughty walls of Priam's house lay prostrate in the dust, and burn with fire his lofty gates, and strip from Hector's breast his sword-rent tunic, while around his corpse many brave comrades prostrate bite the dust. Thus he. But Saturn's son, his prayer, denied, received his offerings, but his toils increased. Their prayers concluded, and the salt cake strewed upon the victim's head. They drew him back, and slew, and flayed, and cutting from the thighs the choicest pieces, and in double layers, or spreading them with fat, above them placed the dew meat offerings. These they burnt with logs of leafless timber, the inward parts first to be tasted, or the fire they held. The thighs consumed with fire, the inward parts they tasted first, the rest upon the spits roasted with care, and from the fire withdrew. Their labors ended, and the feast prepared, they shared the social meal, nor lacked their aught. The rage of thirst and hunger satisfied, Gerenian Nestor, thus his speech began. Most mighty Agamemnon, king of men, Great Atreus, son, no longer let us pause the work delaying which the powers of heaven have trusted to our hands. Do thou forthwith bid that the heralds proclamation make, and summon through the camp the brass-clad Greeks, while in a body through the widespread ranks we pass and stimulate their warlike zeal. He said, and Agamemnon, king of men, obedient to his counsel, gave command that to the war the clear-voiced heralds would call the long-haired Greeks. They gave the word, and straight from every quarter thronged the eager crowd. Heaven-born kings, encircling Atreus' son, the troops inspected. Pallas, blue-eyed maid, before the chiefs her glorious aegis bore, by time untouched, immortal. All around a hundred tassels hung, rare works of art, all gold, each one a hundred oxen's price. With this, the goddess passed along the ranks, exciting all, and fixed in every breast the firm resolve to wage unwearied war, and dearer to their hearts than thoughts of home or wished return became the battlefield. As when a wasting fire on mountain tops hath seized the blazing woods, afar is seen the glaring light. So, as they moved, to heaven flashed the bright glitter of their burnished arms. 
as when a numerous flock of birds, or geese, or cranes, or long-necked swans, on Asian mead beside Caster's stream, now here, now there, disporting, ply their wings, then settle down with clamorous noise that all the mead resounds. So, to Scamander's plain, from tents and ships, poured forth the countless tribes. The firm earth groaned beneath the tramp of steeds and armed men. Upon Scamander's flowery mead they stood, unnumbered as the vernal leaves and flowers, or as the multitudinous swarms of flies that round the cattle sheds in springtide form, while the warm milk is frothing in the pail. So, numberless upon the plain, arrayed for Troy's destruction, stood the long-haired Greeks. And, as experienced goat herds, when their flocks are mingled in the pasture, portion out their several charges, so the chiefs arrayed their squadrons for the fight, while in the midst the mighty monarch Agamemnon moved, his eye and lofty brow a counterpart of Jove, the lord of thunder, in his girth another Mars with Neptune's ample chest. As mid the thronging heifers in a herd stands proudly eminent the lordly bull, so by Jove's will stood eminent that day, mid many heroes, Atreus' godlike son. Say now, ye nine, who on Olympus dwell, muses, for ye are goddesses, and ye were present, and know all things. We ourselves but hear from rumor's voice, and nothing know. Who were the chiefs and mighty lords of Greece? But should I seek the multitude to name? Not if ten tongues were mine, ten mouths to speak, voice inexhaustible, and heart of brass, should I succeed? Unless, Olympian maids, the progeny of Aegis bearing Jove, ye should their names record, who came to Troy. The chiefs and all the ships I now rehearse. Boeotia's troops by Peneleus were led, and Leitus, and Prothoenor bold, Arcesilus and Clonius, they who dwell in Tyria, and down Aulus's rocky coast, Scinis and Scolus, and the highland range of Aetionus, in Thespius Vale, Graia, and Michalessus' widespread plains, and who in Harma and Elysium dwelt, and in Erythe, and in Elian, Hyli, and Tian, and Ocalia, and Copi, and in Medean's well-built fort, Eutresis, Thisbe's dove-frequented woods, and Coronea, and the grassy meads of Haliartus, and Plataea's plain, in Glessus, and the foot of Lower Thebes, and in Onchestus, Neptune's sacred grove, and who in viney-clustered Arne dwelt, and in Medea, and the lovely site of Nysa, and Anthedon's utmost bounds, with these came fifty vessels, and in each were six score youths, Boeotia's noblest flower. Who in Aspledon dwelt, and in Minyas' realm, Orihamenus, two sons of Mars, obeyed, Ascalaphus and bold Ialmenus. In Actor's house, the son of Asius, born of fair Astyoche, a maiden, pure, till in the upper chamber where she slept, stout Mars, by stealth her virgin bed assailed. Of these came thirty ships in order due. 
by Scedius and Epistrophus, the sons of great Iphetus, son of Naubolus, who were led the Phocian forces. These were they who dwelt in Cyparissus, and the rock of Python, and on Chrysa's lovely plain, and who in Daulis, and in Panope, and Emoria, and Iampolis, and by Cephesus' sacred waters dwelt, or in Lelia, by Cephesus' springs. In their command came forty dark-ribbed ships. These were the leaders of the Phocian bands, and on Boeotia's left their camp was pitched. Ajax, Oileus' son, the Locrians led, swift-footed, less than Ajax Telamon, of stature low, with linen breastplate arm, but skilled to throw the spear o'er all who dwell in Hellas or Achaia. These were they from Sinos, Opus, and Calarius, Bisa, and Scarfe, and Augia Fair, Tarpha, and Thronium, by Boagrius' stream, Hem, from beyond Eubea's sacred isle of Locrians, followed forty dark red ships. Breathing firm courage high, the Abantian host, who from Eubea and from Chalcis came, or who in vine-clad Histia dwelt, Eretria and Cerinthus maritime, and who the lofty fort of Diem held, and in Charistus and in Styra dwelt, these Elephenor led, true plant of Mars, Chalcotin's son, the brave Abantian chief. Him, all conspicuous with their long black hair, the bold Abantians followed, spearmen skilled, who, through the foeman's breastplates knew full well, held in firm grasp, to drive the ashen spear. In his command came forty dark-ribbed ships, those who in Athens' well-built city dwelt, the noble-souled Erechtheus' heritage, child of the fertile soil, by Pallas reared, daughter of Jove, who him in Athens placed in her own wealthy temple, there with blood of bulls and lambs at each revolving year, the youths of Athens do him sacrifice. These by Menestheus, Petian's son, were led. With him might none of mortal men compare, in order due of battle, to array chariots and bucklered men. Nestor alone, perchance, might rival him, his elder far. In his command came fifty dark-ribbed ships, Twelve ships from Salamis with Ajax came, and they beside the Athenian troops were ranged. Those who from Argos and the well-walled town of Tyrans came, and from Hermione and Asini, deep-bosomed in the bay, and from Trezene and Ioni and fine-clad Epidaurus, and the youths who dwell in Macy's and Aegina's isle, o'er all of these the valiant Diomed held rule, and Sthenelus, the illustrious son of far-famed Capenus. With these, the third, a godlike warrior came, Euryalus, son of Mesestheus, Teleus's royal son. Supreme o'er all was a valiant Diomed. In their command came eighty dark-ribbed ships, who in Mycenae's well-built fortress dwelt, and wealthy Corinth, and Cleone fair, Orneia, and divine Eratheria, and Sicyon, where Adrastus reigned of old, and Genesis' promontory steep, and Hyperesia, and Bellini's rock, and Aegeum, and the scattered towns that lie along the beach, and widespread Halak. Of these, a hundred ships obeyed the rule of mighty Agamemnon, Atreus's son. The largest and the bravest host was his, 
and he himself in dazzling armor clad o'er all the heroes proudly eminent went forth exulting in his high estate lord of the largest host and chief of chiefs those who in lacedaemon's lowland plains and who in sparta and in ferry dwelt and who on messes dove frequented cliffs Brice. and aegea's lovely vale and in imicli and the sea bathed fort of helos oileus and laus dwell his valiant brother menelaus led with sixty ships but ranged apart they lay their chief himself in martial order bold inspiring others filled with fierce desire the rape of helen and his wrongs to avenge they who in pylos and arene dwelt and thyram by the ford of alpheus's stream in cyparissus and amphigeny ptelion and lofty on us well-built fort helos and dorium where the muses met and put to silence thracian thamorous as from echalia from the royal house of eurytus he came he over bold boasted himself pre-eminent in song even though the daughters of olympian jove the muses were his rivals they in wrath him of his sight at once and power of song immersed and bade his hand forget the lyre these by gerenian nestor all were led in fourscore ships and ten in order due they of arcadia and the realm that lies beneath selene's mountain high around the tomb of epitus a warrior race the men of Phineus and Orchomenus, in flocks abounding, who in Ripa dwelt in Stratia, and in Nisbe's breezy height, or Tichina held, and sweet Mantinea, Stymphalus, and Parsethia. These were led by Agapenor, brave, and Chius's son. In sixty ships, in each a numerous crew of stout Arcadian youths to war inured. The ships wherewith they crossed the dark blue sea were given by Agamemnon, king of men, the son of Atreus, for the Arcadian youth had ne'er to maritime pursuits been trained. Who in Buprasium and in Elis dwelt, far is Hermione, and the extremest bounds of Ursinus, and all the realm that lies between Aleisium and the Olinus rock, these by four chiefs were led, and ten swift ships by bold Epeans manned. Each chief obeyed. Amphimachus and Thalpius were the first, sons of two brothers, Cateatus the one, the other, Eurytus, to Actor born. Next, Amarynceus's son, Diores, bold. The fourth, Polyxenus, the godlike son of Aegeus's royal heir, Agasthenes. They, of Dulichium and the sacred isles of the Achaenides, which face from o'er the sea, the coast of Elis, whereby Meges led, the son of Phileus, dear to Jove, in arms valiant as Mars, who, with his sire at feud, had left his home, and to Dulichium come. In his command were forty dark-ribbed ships. Those who from warlike Cephalonia came, and Ithaca, and leafy Neritus, and Crossilium, rugged Aegilips, and Samos, and Zacynthus, and the coast of the mainland, with its opposing isles, these in twelve ships, with scarlet-painted bows, 
Ulysses led in council sage as Jove. Tossus, Andremon's son, the Aetolians led from Puron. And Pylon. Olinus, Chalcus by sea, and rocky Calydon. The race of Aeneus was no more. Himself and fair-haired Meleager both were dead, whence all Aetolia's rule on him was laid. In his command came forty dark-ribbed ships. A king Idomeneus the Cretans led, from Knossus and Cortina's well-walled town, Miletus and Lycastus's white stone cliffs, Lyctus and Feastus, Rhytium and the rest whom Crete from all her hundred cities sent. These all, Idomeneus, a spearman skilled, their king commanded, and Meriones, in battle terrible as blood-stained Mars. In their command came fourscore dark-ribbed ships. Valiant and tall, the son of Hercules, Tlepolemus, nine vessels brought from Rhodes, by gallant Rhodians manned, who, tripartite, were settled, and in Elysus dwelt, in Lindus and Camirus' white-stoned hills. These all-renowned Tlepolemus obeyed, who to the might of Hercules was born of fair Astyoche. His captive she, when many a goodly town his arms had raised, was brought from Ephora by Celis's stream, reared in the royal house Tlepolemus, in early youth his father's uncle slew, a warrior once, but now in life's decline, Lysimnius. Then in haste a fleet he built, mustered a numerous host, and fled by sea the threatened vengeance of the other sons and grandsons of the might of Hercules. Long wanderings past, and toils and perils borne, to Rhodes he came, his followers, by their tribes three districts formed. And so divided, dwelt, beloved of Jove, the king of gods and men, who showered upon them boundless store of wealth. Nyrus three were Tron ships from Sime brought Nyrus to Charops who were Glabal. Nyrus, the goodliest man of all the Greeks who came to Troy, save Peleus's matchless son. But scant his fame, and few the troops he led. Who in Nysiris dwelt, and Carpathus, and Cos, the fortress of Eurypolis, and in the Cassian and Calydnian Isles, whereby Phidippus led, and Antiphus, two sons of Thessalus, Alcides' son. With them came thirty ships in order due. Next those who in Pelagian Argos dwelt, and who in Alos, and in Alope, Trachis, and Phaea, and in Hellas, famed for women fair. Of these, by various names, Achaeans, Myrmidons, Helens, known. In fifty ships, Achilles was the chief. But from the battle strife, these all abstained, since none there was to marshal their array. For Peleus' godlike son, the swift of foot, lay idly in his tent, the loss resenting of Bryce's fair-haired daughter, whom himself had chosen, prize of all his warlike toil, when he, Ernesus, and the walls of Thebes overthrew, and Mines and Epistrophus struck down, bold warriors both, Evenus' sons, Celepius' royal heir. For her, in wrath, he held aloof, but 
would soon again to appear. Those in the flowery plain of Pyrasus, to Ceres dear, who dwelt in Phylace and Iton, rich in flocks, and by the sea, in Antron and in Italian's grass-clad meads, these led Protesilaus, famed in arms while yet he lived, now laid beneath the sod. In Phylace were left his weeping wife, and half-built house. Him, springing to the shore, first of the Greeks a Dardan warrior slew, nor were his troops their leader, though they mourned, left leaderless. The post of high command Padarsis claimed of right, true plant of Mars, Iphiclus' son, the rich Phylacides. The brother of Protesilaus, he, younger in years, nor equal in renown, yet of a chief no want the forces felt, though much they mourned their valiant leader slain. In his command came forty dark-ribbed ships. Those who from Phiri came, beside the late Bebeus, and who dwelt in Glaphory, in Bebe, and Iolcus' well-built fort, these in eleven ships Eumelus led, whom Papelius' daughter, fairest of her race, divine Alcestis to Admetus bore, who in Methone and Thamasia dwelt, and Melibea and Olyson's rock, these Philoctetes, skillful archer, led. Seven ships were theirs, and every ship was manned by fifty rowers, skillful archers all. But he, their chief, was lying, racked with pain, on Lemnos's sacred isle, there left her force in torture from a venomous serpent's wound. There he in anguish lay. Nor long, ere Greeks of royal Philoctetes felt their need, yet were his troops, their leader though they mourned, not leaderless. Oileus's bastard son, Medon of Rhene born, their ranks arrayed, who in Echalia, Eurytus' domain, and Tricca, and in rough Ithome dwelt, these Podolirius and Machaean led, two skillful leeches, Esculapius' sons. Of these came thirty ships in order due, who in Ormenium and Asterium dwelt, by Hyperia's fount, and on the heights of Titanum's white peaks, of these was chief Eurypolis, Euemon's gallant son. In his command came forty dark-ribbed ships, who in Argisa and Girtona dwelt, or the Eloni, at the white-walled town of Aloasan, Polypetes led, son of Pyrithuus, progeny of Jove, a warrior bold. Hippodamia, fair, him to Pyrithuus bore, what time he slew the shaggy centaurs, and from Pelion's heights, for refuge, mid the rude Ethyses drove. Nor he alone with him to Troy, there came a scion true of Mars, Leontius, heir of nobly born Coronus, Cynthius' son. In their command came forty dark ribbed ships. With two and twenty vessels, Gineas came from Scythus. He the Enenes led, and the Berebians warlike tribes, and those who dwelt around Dodona's wintry heights, or tilled the soil upon the lovely banks of Titeresius, who to Peneus pours the tribute of his clearly flowing stream, 
yet mingles not with Aeneas's silver waves, but on the surface floats like oil, his source from Styx deriving, in whose awful name both gods and men by holiest oaths are bound. Magnesia's troops, who dwelt by Peneus' stream, or beneath Pelion's leafy quivering shades, swift-footed Prothous led, Tenthredon's son. In his command came forty dark-ribbed ships. These were the leaders and the chiefs of Greece. Say, Muse, of these who with the Atridae came, horses and men, who claimed the highest praise. Of steeds, the bravest and the noblest far, were those Eumelus drove, Admetus' son, both swift as birds, in age and color matched, alike in height as measured o'er the back. Both mares, by Phoebus of the silver bow, reared in Pyrea, thunderbolts of war. Of men, while yet Achilles held his wrath, the mightiest far was Ajax Telamon. For with Achilles, and the steeds that bore the matchless son of Peleus, none might fie, but mid his beaked ocean-going ships, he lay with Agamemnon, Atreus' son, indignant, while his troops upon the beach, with quoits and javelins, wild away the day, and feats of archery. Their steeds, the while, the lotus grass and marsh-grown parsley cropped, each standing near their car, the well-wrought cars, lay all unheeded in the warriors' tents. They, inly pining for their godlike chief, roamed listless up and down, nor joined the fray. Such was the host, which, like devouring fire, o'erspread the land. The earth beneath them groaned, as when the Lord of Thunder, in his wrath, the earth's foundations shakes, in Arime, where, buried deep, tis said, Typhius lies. So, at their coming, groaned beneath their feet the earth, as quickly o'er the plain they spread. To Troy, sent down by Aegis-bearing Jove, with direful tidings, storm-swift Iris came. At Priam's gate, in solemn conclave met, were gathered all the Trojans, young and old. Swift Iris stood amidst them, and the voice, assuming of Polites, Priam's son, the Trojan scout, who, trusting to his speed, was posted on the summit of the mount of ancient Isuites, there to watch till from their ships the Grecian troops should march. His voice assuming, thus the goddess spoke. Old man, as erst in peace, so still thou lovest the strife of words, but fearful war is nigh. Full many a host in line of battle ranged my eyes have seen, but such a force as this, so mighty and so vast, I ne'er beheld. In number, as the leaves, or as the sand, against the city or the plain they come, then, Hector, for to thee I chiefly speak, this do, thou knowest how various our allies of different nations and discordant tongues. Let each, then, those command o'er whom he reigns, and his own countrymen in arms array. She said, and Hector knew the voice divine, and all, 
dissolved the council, flew to arms, the gates were opened wide. Forth poured the crowd, both foot and horse, and loud the tumult rose. Before the city stands a lofty mound in the mid-plain, by open space enclosed. Men call it Batia, but the gods, the tomb of swift Myrina, mustered there the Trojans and allies, their troops arrayed. The mighty Hector of the glancing helm, the son of Priam, led the Trojan host. The largest and the bravest band were they, bold spearmen all who followed him in arms. Anchises' valiant son, Aeneas, led the Dardans. Him, mid Ida's jutting peaks, immortal Venus to Anchises bore, a goddess yielding to a mortal's love. With him, well skilled in war, Archilochus and Acamas, Antenor's gallant son, who in Zelia dwelt, at Ida's foot, of Trojan race, a wealthy tribe who drank of dark Esipus' waters. These were led by Pandarus, Lycaon's noble son, taught by Apollo's self to draw the bow, who from Adrasti and the Pesis realm from Cadia, and the lofty hill Tyrian came with linen corslets good. Adrastus and Amphius led two sons of Merops of Percoti. Deeply versed was he in prophecy, and from the war would fain have kept his sons. But they, by fate doomed to impending death, his caution scorned. Those who from Practium and Percoti came, and who in Sestos and Abydos dwelt, and in Arisba fair, those Asius led the son of Hurtacus, of Hera's chief, Asius the son of Hurtacus, who came from fair Arisba, born by fiery steeds, of matchless size and strength from Celis's stream. Hippothous led the bold Pelagian tribes who dwell in rich Larissa's fertile soil. Hippothous and Peleus, Lathus's sons, the son of Teutimus, Pelagian chief. The Thracians, by fast-flowing Hellespont encompassed, Acamas and Pyrrhus brave, the spear skilled to come you from us led, son of Trisinus, Saeus' highborn son. From distant Amidon, Perismus brought the Paean archers from broad Axius's banks. Axius, the brightest stream on earth that flows. The hairy strength of great Pelimenes, the Paphlagonians led from Aeneti, whence first appeared the stubborn race of mules who in Cytorus and in Sesamum and round Parthenius' waters had their home, who dwelt in Cromni and Aegilus, and on the lofty Erthinian rock. Biobius and Epistrophus were brought from distant Alibi, the wealthy source of silver ore. The Halazonian bands. Chromis, the Mycians led, and Enomus, a skillful augur, but his augury, from gloomy death to save him, not availed. Slain by the son of Peleus in the stream, where many another Trojan felt his arm. From far Ascania's lake, with foresight joined, the godlike presence of Ascanius brought the Phrygians, dauntless in the standing fight. From Lydia came Telamone's two sons, born of the Lake Chigian, and Typhus and Mestlus. These, 
Meonia's forces led, who dwelt around the foot of Tmolus's hill. In charge of Nastes came the Carian troops, of barbarous speech, who in Miletus dwelt, and in the dense and tangled forest shade of Thyrus Hill, and on the lofty ridge of Mercalli, and by Meander's stream. These came with Nastes and Amphimachus, Amphimachus and Nastes, Nomian's sons. With childish folly to the war he came, laden with store of gold, yet naught availed his gold to save him from the doom of death. Slain by the son of Peleus in the stream, and all his wealth Achilles bore away. Sarpedon, last, and valiant Glaucus led the Lycian bands from distant Lycia's shore, beside the banks of Xanthus's eddying stream. Book 3 Argument The Duel of Menelaus and Paris The armies, being ready to engage, a single combat is agreed upon between Menelaus and Paris, by the intervention of Hector, for the determination of the war. Iris is sent to call Helen to behold the fight. She leads her to the walls of Troy, where Priam sat with his counselors, observing the Grecian leaders on the plain below, to whom Helen gives an account of the chief of them. The kings on either part take the solemn oath for the conditions of the combat. The duel ensues, wherein Paris, being overcome, is snatched away in a cloud by Venus, and transported to his apartment. She then calls Helen from the walls and brings the lovers together. Agamemnon, on the part of the Cretans, demands the restoration of Helen and the performance of the articles. The three and twentieth day still continues throughout this book. The scene is sometimes in the fields before Troy, and sometimes in Troy itself. When by their several chiefs the troops were ranged, with noise and clamor, as a flight of birds, the men of Troy advanced, as when the cranes, flying the wintry storms, send forth on high their dissonant clamors, while o'er the ocean stream they steer their course, and on their pinions bear battle and death to the Pygmian race. On the other side, the Greeks in silence moved, breathing firm courage, bent on mutual aid. As when the south wind o'er the mountain tops spreads a thick veil of mist, the shepherd's bane, and friendly to the nightly thief alone, that a stone's throw the range of vision bounds, so rose the dust cloud as in serried ranks with rapid step they moved across the plain. But when the opposing forces near were met, a panther's skin across his shoulders flung, armed with his bow and sword, in front of all advanced the godlike Paris. In his hand he poised two brass-tipped javelins, and defied to mortal combat all the chiefs of Greece. Him, when the warlike Menelaus saw, with haughty strides, advancing from the crowd, as when a lion, hunger pinched, espies some mighty beast of chase, or antlered stag, or mountain goat, and with exulting spring strikes down his prey, and on the carcass feeds, unscared by baying hounds, and eager youths. So Menelaus saw with fierce delight the gods like Paris, for he deemed that now his vengeance was at hand. 
and from his car, armed as he was, he leaped upon the plain. But when the godlike Paris saw him spring, defiant from the ranks, with quailing heart, back to his comrades' sheltering crowd, he sprang in fear of death. As when some traveler spies, coiled in his path, upon the mountainside, a deadly snake, back he recoils in haste, his limbs all trembling, and his cheek all pale. So, back recoiled, in fear of Atreus' son, the godlike Paris, mid the Trojan host, to whom in stern rebuke, thus Hector spoke. Thou wretched Paris, though in form so fair, thou slave of woman, manhood's counterfeit, would thou hadst ne'er been born, or died at least unwedded. So twere better far for all, than thus to live a scandal and reproach. Well may the long-haired Greeks triumphant boast, who think thee, from thine outward show, a chief among our warriors. But thou hast, in truth, nor strength of mind, nor courage in the fight. How was that, such as thou, could e'er induce a noble band, in ocean-going ships, to cross the main with men of other lands, mixing in amity, and bearing thence a woman fair of face, by marriage ties bound to a race of warriors, to thy sire, thy state, thy people, cause of endless grief, of triumph to thy foes, contempt to thee. Durst thou the warlike Menelaus meet, thou to thy cost should learn the might of him whose bride thou didst not fear to bear away. Then shouldst thou find of small avail thy lyre, or Venus's gifts of beauty and of grace, or trampled in the dust thy flowing hair. But too forbearing are the men of Troy, else for the ills that thou hast wrought the state, ere now thy body had in stone been cased. To whom the godlike Paris thus replied, Hector, I needs must own thy censure just, nor without cause, Thy dauntless courage knows nor pause nor weariness, but as an axe that in a strong man's hand, who fashions out some naval timber, with unabated edge cleaves the firm wood and aids the striker's force, even so unwearied is thy warlike soul. Yet blame not me for golden Venus's gifts, the gifts of heaven are not to be despised, which heaven may give, but man could not command. But if thou wilt that I should dare the fight, bid that the Trojans and the Grecians all be seated on the ground, and in the midst the warlike Menelaus and myself stand front to front, for Helen and the spoils of war to combat, and where shall prove the better man in conflict, let him bear the woman and the spoils in triumph home, while ye, the rest, in peace and friendship sworn, shall still possess the fertile plains of Troy, and to their native Argos they return, for noble steeds and lovely women fame. He said, and Hector joyed to hear his words. Forth in the midst he stepped, and with his spear, grasped by the middle, stayed the Trojan ranks. At him the long-haired Grecians bent their bows, 
prompt to assail with arrows and with stones. But loud the monarch Agamemnon's voice was heard. Hold, Argives, hold, ye sons of Greece, shoot not! For Hector of the glancing helm hath, as it seems, some message to impart. He said. They held their hands, and silent stood, expectant, till to both thus Hector spoke. Hear now, ye Trojans, and ye well-grieved Greeks, the words of Paris, cause of all this war. He asks through me that all the host of Troy and Grecian warriors shall upon the ground lay down their glittering arms, while in the midst the warlike Menelaus and himself stand front to front, for Helen and the spoils of war to combat, and whoe'er shall prove the better man in conflict, let him bear the woman and the spoils in triumph home, while we the rest firm peace and friendship swear. Thus Hector spoke, the rest in silence heard, but Menelaus, bold in fight, replied, Hear now my answer. In this quarrel I may claim the chiefest share, and now I hope Trojans and Greeks may see the final close of all the labors ye so long have borne to avenge my wrong at Paris's hand sustained. And of us two, which heir is doomed to death, so let him die. The rest depart in peace. Bring then two lambs, one white, the other black, for Tellus and for Sol. We, on our part, will bring another for Saturnian Jove. And let the majesty of Priam too appear, himself to consecrate our oaths. For reckless are his sons, and void of faith, that none Jove's oath may dare to violate. For young men's spirits are too quickly stirred, but in the councils checked by reverend age, alike are weighed the future and the past. And for all interests due provision made. He said, and Greeks and Trojans gladly heard, in hopes of respite from the weary war. They ranged their cars in ranks, and they themselves descending doffed their arms, and laid them down close each by each, with narrow space between. Two heralds to the city Hector sent, to bring the lambs, and aged Priam call, while Agamemnon to the hollow ships their lamb to bring, in haste Talthybius sent. He heard, and straight the monarch's voice obeyed. Meantime, to white-armed Helen, Iris sped, the heavenly messenger. In form she seemed her husband's sister, whom Antinor's son, the valiant Helicaean, had to wife, Laodice, of Priam's daughters all, loveliest of face. She, in her chamber, found her whom she sought. A mighty web she wove, of double wool and brilliant hues, whereon was interwoven many a toilsome strife of Trojan warriors and of brass-clad Greeks, for her encountered at the hand of Mars. Beside her Iris stood, and thus she spoke, 
Come, sister dear, and see the glorious deeds of Trojan warriors and of brass-clad Greeks. They, who erewhile, impatient for the fight, rolled o'er the plain the woeful tide of war, now silent sit, the storm of battle hushed, reclining on their shields, their lances bright beside them reared, while Paris in the midst, and warlike Menelaus, stand prepared with the long spear for thee to fight, thyself the prize of conquest, and the victor's wife. Thus, as she spoke, in Helen's breast arose fond recollection of her former lord, her home, and parents. O'er her head she threw a snowy veil, and shedding tender tears, she issued forth, not unaccompanied, for with her went fair Aethra, Pithuus's child, and stag-eyed Clymene, her maidens twain. They quickly at the Sean gate arrived. Attending there on aged Priam sat the elders of the city, Panthous and Lampus and Thymetes, Clytius, bold Asetion, and Eucalycon, with sage Antenor, wise in counsel both. All these were gathered at the Sean gate, by age exempt from war, but in discourse abundant, as the cricket that on high from topmost boughs of forest tree sends forth his delicate music. So on Ilium's towers sat the sage chiefs and counselors of Troy. Helen they saw as to the tower she came, and, "'Tis no marvel," one to other said, the valiant Trojans and the well-grieved Greeks, for beauty such as this should long endure the toils of war, for goddess-like she seems. And yet, despite her beauty, let her go, nor bring on us and on our sons a curse. Thus they, but aged Priam Helen called. Come here, my child, and sitting by my side, from whence thou canst discern thy former lord, his kindred, and thy friends. Not thee I blame, but to the god I owe this woeful war. Tell me the name of yonder mighty chief among the Greeks, a warrior brave and strong. Others in height surpass him, but my eyes a form so noble never yet beheld, nor so august. He moves a king indeed. To whom in answer, Helen, heavenly fair. With reverence, dearest father, and with shame I look on thee. Oh, would that I had died that day when hither with thy son I came, and left my husband, friends, and darling child, and all the loved companions of my youth, that I died not, with grief I pine away. But to thy question I will tell thee true. Yon chief is Agamemnon, Atreus' son, wide reigning mighty monarch, ruler good, and valiant warrior. In my husband's name, lost as I am, I called him brother once. She spoke. The old man, admiring, gazed and cried, O oh, blessed Atreides, child of happy fate, Favored of heaven, how many noble Greeks obey thy rule! 
in vine-clad Phrygia once, I saw the hosts of Phrygian warriors wheel their rapid steeds, and with them all the bands of Otreus and of Migdon, godlike king, who lay encamped beside Sangarius's stream. I too with them was numbered in the day when met them in the field, the Amazons, the woman warriors, but their forces all reach not the number of the keen-eyed Greeks. Ulysses next the old man saw, and asked, Tell me again, dear child, who this may be, in stature less than Atreus's royal son, but broader shouldered, and of ampler chest. His arms are laid upon the fertile plain, but he himself is moving through the ranks, inspecting, like a full-fleeced ram that moves majestic through a flock of snow-white ewes. To whom Jove's offspring, Helen, thus replied, The wise Ulysses, that, Laertes' son, though bred in rugged Ithaca, yet versed in every stratagem and deep device. O oh, woman, then the sage Antenor said, of these thy words I can the truth avouch. For hither, when on thine account to treat brave Menelaus, and Ulysses came, I lodged them in my house, and loved them both, and studied well the form and mind of each. As they, with Trojans, mixed in social guise, when both were standing, or his comrade high, with broad-set shoulders, Menelaus stood. Seated, Ulysses was the nobler form. Then, in the great assembly, when to all their public speech and argument they framed in fluent language, Menelaus spoke, in words though few, yet clear, though young in years, no wordy babbler, wasteful of his speech. But when the skilled Ulysses rose to speak, with downcast visage would he stand, his eyes bent on the ground, the staff he bore, nor back he waved, nor forward, but like one untaught he held it motionless. Who only saw would say that he was mad, or void of sense, but when his chest its deep-toned voice sent forth, with words that fell like flakes of wintry snow, no mortal with Ulysses could compare. Then little wrecked we of his outward show. At sight of Ajax next, the old man inquired, Who is yon other warrior, brave and strong, towering o'er all with head and shoulders broad? To whom in answer, Helen, heavenly fair, Gigantic Ajax that, the prop of Greece, and by his side Idomeneus of Crete stands godlike, circled round by Cretan chiefs. The warlike Menelaus welcomed him oft in our palace, when from Crete he came. Now all the other Kenite Greeks I see, whom once I knew, and now could call by name. But two I miss, two captains of the host, my own two brethren, and my mother's sons, Castor and Pollux, Castor, charioteer unrivaled, Pollux, matchless pugilist. In Lacedaemon have they stayed behind? Or can it be in ocean-going ships that they have come indeed? but shun to join the fight of warriors, 
fearful of the shame and deep disgrace that on my name attend. Thus she, but they beneath the teeming earth in Lacedaemon lay their native land. Meanwhile, the heralds through the city bore the treaty offerings to the gods, the lambs and genial wine, the produce of the soil in goatskin flasks. Therewith a flagon bright and cups of gold Ideas brought, and stood beside the aged king as thus he spoke. Son of Laomedon, arise! The chiefs of Trojan warriors and of brass-clad Greeks call for thy presence on the battle plain to swear a truce where Paris in the midst and warlike Menelaus stand prepared with the long spear for Helen and the spoils of war to combat, but whoe'er may prove the better man in fight may bear away the woman and the spoils in triumph home, while we, the rest in peace and friendship sworn, shall still possess the fertile plains of Troy, and to their native Argos they return, for noble steeds and lovely women famed. He said, the old man shuddered at his words, but to his comrades gave command forthwith to yoke his car, and they his word obeyed. Priam, ascending, gathered up the reins, and with Antenor by his side, the twain drove through the Sean gate their flying steeds. But when between the opposing ranks they came, alighting from the car, they moved on foot between the Trojan and the Grecian hosts. Up rose then Agamemnon, king of men. Up rose the sage Ulysses. To the front the heralds brought the offerings to the gods. And in the flagon mixed the wine and poured the hallowing water on the monarch's hands. His dagger then the son of Atreus drew, suspended, as was wont, beside the hilt of his great sword. And from the victim's head he cut the sacred lock, which to the chiefs of Troy and Greece the heralds portioned out. Then, with uplifted hands, he prayed aloud, O oh, Father Jove, who rules from Ida's height, most great, most glorious. And thou, sun, who seest and hearest all things, rivers, and thou, earth, and ye, who after death beneath the earth, your vengeance wreak on souls of men forsworn. Be witness ye, and this our covenant guard. If Menelaus fall by Paris's hand, let him retain both Helen and the spoil, while in our ships we take our homeward way. If Paris be by Menelaus slain, Troy shall surrender Helen and the spoil, with compensation due to Greece that so a record may to future days remain. But Paris slain, if Priam and his sons the promised compensation shall withhold, then here my rights in battle to assert will I remain, till I the end achieve. Thus as he spoke, Across the victim's throats he drew the pitiless blade, and on the ground he laid them, gasping, as the stream of life poured forth, their vigor by the blade subdued. Then, 
from the flagon drawn, from out the cups the wine they poured, and to the eternal gods they prayed. And thus from Trojans and from Greeks arose the joint petition. Grant, O Jove, most great, most glorious. Grant, ye heavenly powers, that whosoe'er this solemn truce shall break, even as this wine we pour, their hearts' best blood, theirs and their children's, on the earth be poured, and strangers in subjection take their wives. Thus they, but Jove, unyielding, heard their prayer. The rites performed, then aged Priam spoke. Hear me, ye Trojans, and ye well-grieved Greeks. To Ilium's breezy heights I now withdraw, for that mine eyes will not endure the sight of warlike Menelaus and my son engaged in deadly combat. Of the two which may be doomed to death is only known to Jove and to the immortal powers of heaven. Thus spoke the godlike king, and on the car he placed the consecrated lambs. Himself ascending then, he gathered up the reins, and with Antenor by his side, the twain, to Ilium's walls, retraced their homeward way. Then Hector, son of Priam, measured out, with sage Ulysses joined, the allotted space. Next, in the brass-bound helmet, cast the lots, which of the two the first should throw the spear. The crowd, with hands uplifted to the gods, Trojans and Greeks alike, addressed their prayer. O Father Jove, who rulest from Ida's height, most great, most glorious, grant that whosoe'er on both our armies hath this turmoil brought, may undergo the doom of death, and we, the rest, firm peace and lasting friendship swear. Thus they, great Hector of the glancing helm, with eyes averted, shook the cask, and forth was cast the lots of Paris. On the ground, the rest lay down by ranks, where near to each were ranged his active steeds and glittering arms. Then o'er his shoulders, fair-haired Helen's lord, the godlike Paris, donned his armor bright. First on his legs the well-wrought greaves he fixed, fastened with silver clasps. His ample chest, a breastplate guarded, by Lycian lent his brother, but which fitted well his form. Around his shoulders slung, his sword he bore, brass-bladed, silver-studded, then his shield, weighty and strong. And on his firm-set head, a helm he wore, well-wrought, with horsehair plume, that nodded, fearful, o'er his brow. His hand grasped the firm spear, familiar to his hold. Prepared alike, the adverse warrior stood. They, from the crowd apart, their armor donned, came forth, and each, with eyes of mutual hate, regarded each. Admiring wonder seized the Trojan warriors and the well-grieved Greeks, as in the center of the measured ground they stood opposed, and poised their quivering spears. First, 
Paris threw his weighty spear and struck fair in the midst Atrides' buckler round, but broke not through. Upon the stubborn targ was bent the lance's point. Then, thus to Jove, his weapon hurling, Menelaus prayed, Great king, on him who wrought me causeless wrong, on Paris, grant that retribution due my arm may bring, that men in days to come may fear their host to injure, and repay with treacherous wile his hospitable cares. He said, and poising, hurled his weighty spear. Full in the midst, it struck the buckler round. Right through the buckler passed the sturdy spear, and through the gorgeous breastplate, and within cut through the linen vest. But Paris, back inclining, stooped, and shunned the doom of death. Atrides, then his silver-studded sword, rearing on high, a mighty blow let fall on Paris' helm. But shivering in his hand, in countless fragments, knew the faithless blade. Then thus to Jove, with eyes uplift to heaven, Atrides made his moan. O oh, Father Jove, of all the gods, the most unfriendly thou! On Paris's head, I hoped for all his crimes to wreak my vengeance due. But in my grasp, my faithless sword is shattered, and my spear hath bootless left my hand, nor reached my foe. Then, onward rushing, by the horsehair plume, he seized his foeman's helm, and, wrenching round, dragged by main force amid the well-breathed Greeks. The broidered strap that passed beneath his beard, the helmet held, the warrior's throat compressed. Then had Atrides dragged him from the field, and endless fame acquired. But Venus, child of Jove, her favorite's peril quickly saw, and broke the throttling strap tough bull's hide. In the broad hand, the empty helm remained. The trophy by their champion whirled amid the well-greaved Greeks, his eager comrades seized, while he, infuriate, rushed with murderous aim on Priam's son. But him, the queen of love, as gods can only, from the field conveyed. Wrapped in a misty cloud, and on a couch, sweet perfumes breathing, gently laid him down. Then went in search of Helen, her she found, circled with Trojan dames on Ilium's tower. Her, by her airy robe, the goddess held, and in the likeness of an aged dame, who oft for her in Sparta when she dwelt, many a fair fleece had wrought, and loved her well, addressed her thus, Come, Helen, to thy house, come, Paris calls thee. In his chamber he expects thee, resting on luxurious couch, in costly garb, with manly beauty graced. Not from the fight of warriors wouldst thou deem he late had come, but for the dance prepared, or resting from the dance's pleasing toil. She said, and Helen's spirit within her moved, and when she saw the goddess's beauteous neck, her lovely bosom, and her glowing eyes, 
She gazed in wonder and addressed her thus. Oh, why, great goddess, make me thus thy sport? Seek'st thou to bear me far away from hence, To some fair Phrygian or Meonian town, If there some mortal have thy favour gained? Or for that Menelaus in the field hath vanquished Paris, And is willing yet that I, his bane, Should to his home return? Here art thou found, to weave again thy wiles. Go then thyself, thy godship abdicate. Renounce Olympus, lavish here on him thy pity and thy care. He may perchance make thee his wife, at least his paramour. But thither go not I. Foul shame it were again to share his bed. The dames of Troy will for a byword hold me, and e'en now my soul with endless sorrow is possessed. To whom in anger heavenly Venus spoke, Incense me not, poor fool, lest I in wrath desert thee quite, and as I heretofore have loved, so make thee object of my hate, and kindle, twixt the Trojans and the Greeks, such bitter feuds as both shall wreak on thee. She said, and tremble Helen, child of Jove, she rose in silence, in a snow-white veil, all glittering shrouded. By the goddess led, she passed, unnoticed by the Trojan dames. But when to Paris's splendid house they came, thronging around her, her attendants gave their duteous service. Through the lofty hall, with queenly grace, the godlike woman passed. The seat. The laughter-loving goddess placed by Paris's side. There Helen sat, the child of Aegis bearing Jove, with downcast eyes. Yet with sharp words she thus addressed her lord. Back from the battle? Would thou there hadst died beneath a warrior's arm, Whom once I called my husband? Vainly didst thou boast, erewhile, thine arm, Thy dauntless courage, and thy spear, The warlike Menelaus should subdue. Go now again, and challenge to the fight The warlike Menelaus. Be thou where, I warn thee, Pause, ere madly thou presume with fair-haired Menelaus to contend. Soon shouldst thou fall beneath his conquering spear. To whom thus Paris? Ring not thus my soul with keen reproaches. Now, with Pallas's aid, hath Menelaus conquered but my day will come, I too can boast my guardian gods. But turn we now to love, and love's delights, for never did thy beauty so inflame my sense, not when from Lacedaemon first I bore thee in my ocean-going ships, and reveled in thy love on Crane's Isle. As now it fills my soul with fond desire. He said, and led her to the nuptial couch. Her lord she followed, and while there, reclined upon the richly inlaid couch they lay, Atrides, like a lion baffled, 
rushed amid the crowd, if haply he might find the godlike Paris. But not one of all the Trojans and their brave allies could aid the warlike Menelaus in his search. Not that, for love, would any one that knew had screened him from his anger, for they all abhorred him as the shade of death. Then thus outspoke great Agamemnon, king of men, Hear me, ye Trojans, Dardans, and allies. With warlike Menelaus rests, tis plain, the prize of victory. And surrender ye the Argive Helen and the spoils of war, with compensation due to Greece, so that a record may to future days remain. Thus he, the Greeks, assenting, cheered his words. Book 4 Argument The Breach of the Truce and the First Battle The gods deliberate in council concerning the Trojan War. They agree upon the continuation of it, and Jupiter sends down Minerva to break the truce. She persuades Pandarus to aim an arrow at Menelaus, who is wounded, but cured by Machaon. In the meantime, some of the Trojan troops attack the Greeks. Agamemnon is distinguished in all the parts of a good general. He reviews the troops and exhorts the leaders, some by praises and others by reproofs. Nestor is particularly celebrated for his military discipline. The battle joins and great numbers are slain on both sides. The same day continues through this as through the last book, as it does also through the two following and almost to the end of the seventh book. The scene is holy in the field before Troy. On golden pavement, round the board of Jove, the gods were gathered. Hebe in the midst poured the sweet nectar. They, in golden cups, each other pledged, as down they looked on Troy. Then Jove, with cutting words and taunting tone, began the wrath of Juno to provoke. Two goddesses for Menelaus fight, thou, Juno, queen of Argos, and with thee, Minerva, shield of warriors. But ye two sitting aloof, well pleased it seems, look on, while laughter loving Venus, at the side of Paris standing, still averts his fate and rescues, but as now expecting death. To warlike Menelaus we decree of right the victory. But consult we now what may the issue be, if we shall light again the name of war and discord fierce, or the two sides in peace and friendship join. For me, if thus your general voice incline, let Priam's city stand and Helen back to warlike Menelaus be restored. So spoke the god. But seated side by side, Juno and Pallas' glances interchanged of ill portent for Troy. Pallas indeed sat silent, and though inly wroth with Jove, yet answered not a word. But Juno's breast could not contain her rage, and thus she spoke. What words, dread son of Saturn, dost thou speak? How wouldst thou render vain and void of fruit my weary labor and my horse's toil to stir the people, and on Priam's self and Priam's offspring? 
bring disastrous fate. Do as thou wilt, yet not with our consent. To whom in wrath the Cloud Compeller thus. Revengeful! How have Priam and his son so deeply injured thee, that thus thou seekst, with unabated anger, to pursue, till thou overthrow, the strong-built walls of Troy? Couldst thou but force the gates, and entering in, on Priam's mangled flesh, and Priam's sons, and Trojans all, a bloody banquet make? Perchance thy fury might at length be stayed? But have thy will, lest this in future times, twixt me and thee, be cause of strife renew. Yet hear my words, and ponder what I say. If e'er, in times to come, my will should be some city to destroy, inhabited by men beloved of thee, seek not to turn my wrath aside, but yield, as I do now, consenting, but with heart that ill consents. For of all cities fair, beneath the sun and starry heaven, the abode of mortal men, none to my soul was dear as sacred Troy, and Priam's self, and Priam's warrior race. For with drink offerings due, and fat of lambs, my altar still hath at their hands been fed. Such honor hath to us been ever paid. To whom the stag-eyed Juno thus replied, Three cities are there, dearest to my heart, Argos, and Sparta, and the ample streets of rich Mycenae. Work on them, thy will. Destroy them, if thine anger they incur. I will not interpose, nor hinder thee. Mourn them I shall, reluctant see their fall, but not resist. For sovereign is thy will, yet should my labors not be fruitless all, for I too am a god, my blood is thine, worthy of honor as the eldest born of deep designing Saturn, and thy wife, thine, who o'er all the immortals reigns supreme. But yield we to each other, I to thee, and thou to me. The other gods will all by us be ruled. On Pallas, then, enjoying that to the battlefields of Greece and Troy, she haste, and so contrive that Trojans first may break the treaty, and the Greeks assail. She said, The sire of gods and men complied. Thus with winged words to Pallas spoke. Go to the battlefield of Greece and Troy, in haste, and so contrive that Trojans first may break the treaty, and the Greeks assail. His words fresh impulse gave to Pallas's zeal, and from Olympus heights in haste, she sped, like to a meteor that, of grave portent, to warring armies or to seafaring men, the son of deep designing Saturn sends, bright flashing, scattering fiery sparks around, the blue-eyed goddess darted down to earth, and lighted in the midst Amazement held the Trojan warriors and the well-grieved Greeks, and one to other looked and said, What means this sign? Must fearful battle rage again? Or may we hope for gentle peace from Jove, who 
to mankind dispenses peace and war. Such was the converse Greeks and Trojans held. Pallas, meanwhile, amid the Trojan host, clad in the likeness of Antenor's son, Laodicus, a spearman stout and brave, searched here and there, if haply she might find the godlike Pandarus. Lycian's son she found, of noble birth and stalwart form, standing encircled by his sturdy band of bucklered followers from Isipus' stream. She stood behind him and addressed him thus, Wilt thou be ruled by me, Lycaean's son? For durst thou but at Menelaus shoot thy winged arrow, great would be thy fame, and great thy favor with the men of Troy, and most of all with Paris. At his hand thou shalt receive rich guerdon when he hears that warlike Menelaus by thy shaft subdued is laid upon the funeral pyre. Bend then thy bow at Atreus' glorious son, vowing to Phoebus, Lycaeus' guardian god, the archer king, to pay a firstling lambs an ample hecatomb, when home returned in safety to Zelia's sacred town. Thus she, and fool, he listened to her words. Straight he encased his polished bow, his spoil, one from a mountain ibex which himself, in ambush lurking, through the breast had shot true to his aim, as from behind a crag he came in sight, prone on the rock he fell. With horns of sixteen palms his head was ground, these deftly wrought a skillful hand, and polished smooth, and tipped the ends with gold. He bent, and resting on the ground his bow, strung it anew. His faithful comrades held their shields before him, lest the sons of Greece should make their onset ere his shafts could reach the warlike Menelaus, Atreus' son. His quiver then withdrawing from its case, with care a shaft he chose, ne'er shot before, well-feathered messenger of pangs and death. The stinging arrow fitted to the string, and vowed to Phoebus, like his guardian god, the archer king, to pay a firstling lambs an ample hecatomb, when home returned in safety. Zelia's sacred town. At once the sinew and the knock he drew, the sinew to his breast, and to the bow the iron head. Then, when the mighty bow was to a circle strained, sharp rang the horn, and loud the sinew twanged, as toward the crowd, with deadly speed, the eager arrow sprang. Nor, Menelaus, was thy safety then uncared for of the gods? Jove's daughter first, Pallas, before thee stood, and turned aside the pointed arrow, turned it so aside as when a mother from her infant's cheek, wrapped in sweet slumbers, brushes off a fly. Its course she so directed that it struck just where the golden clasps the belts restrained, and where the breastplate doubled, checked its force. On the close-fitting belt the arrow struck, right through the belt of curious workmanship it drove, and through the breastplate richly wrought, and through the coat of mail he wore beneath his inmost guard and best defense to check the hostile weapon's force. Yet onward still the arrow drove, and grazed the hero's flesh. Forth issued from the wound the crimson blood. 
as when some carrion Armionian made with crimson dye the ivory stains, designed to be the cheekpiece of a warrior's steed, by many a valiant horseman coveted, as in the house it lies, a monarch's boast, the horse adorning, and the horseman's pride. So Menelaus then thy graceful thighs and knees and ankles with thy blood were dyed. Great Agamemnon shuddered as he saw the crimson drops outwelling from the wound, shuddered the warlike Menelaus self. But when not buried in his flesh he saw the barb and sinew, back his spirit came. Then, deeply groaning, Agamemnon spoke, as Menelaus by the hand he held, and with him groaned his comrades. Brother dear, I wrought thy death, when late, uncompact sworn, I sent thee forth alone for Greece to fight, wounded by Trojans, who their plighted faith have trodden underfoot. But not in vain are solemn covenants, and the blood of lambs, the treaty wine outboard, and the hand plight given, wherein men place their trust. If not at once, yet soon or late, will Jove assert their claim, and heavy penalties the perjured pay with their own blood, their children's, and their wives. So in my inmost soul, full well I know the day shall come, when this imperial Troy, and Priam's race, and Priam's royal self, shall in one common ruin be o'erthrown, and Saturn's son himself, high-throned Jove, who dwells in heaven, shall in their faces Flash his aegis dark and dread, This treacherous deed avenging, This shall surely come to pass. But, Menelaus, Deep will be my grief if thou shouldst perish, Meeting thus thy fate. To thirsty Argos should I then return, By foul disgrace, o'erwhelmed, for with thy fall, the Greeks will mind them of their native land. And as a trophy to the sons of Troy, the Argive Helen leave. Thy bones, meanwhile, shall moulder here beneath the foreign soil. Thy work undone, and with insulting scorn, some vaunting Trojan, leaping on the tomb of noble Menelaus, thus shall say, On all his foes may Agamemnon so his wrath accomplish, who hath hither led of Greeks a mighty army, all in vain and bootless home, with empty ships hath gone, and valiant Menelaus left behind. Thus when men speak, gape, earth, and hide my shame. To whom the fair-haired Menelaus thus with cheering words, Fear not thyself, nor cause the troops to fear. The arrow hath not touched a vital part. The sparkling belt hath first turned it aside. The doublet next beneath, and coat of mail, the work of armorer's hands. To whom the monarch Agamemnon thus, Dear Menelaus, may thy words be true. The leech shall tend thy wound, and spread it o'er with healing ointments to assuage the pain. He said, and to the sacred herald called. Haste thee, Talthybius, summon with all speed the son of Esculapius, peerless leech Machaean. Bid him hither haste, 
to see the warlike Menelaus, chief of Greeks, who by an arrow from some practiced hand, Trojan or Lycian, hath received a wound, a cause of boast to them, to us of grief. He said, nor did the herald not obey, but through the brass-clad ranks of Greece he passed in search of brave Machaon. Him he found standing by bucklered warriors bold begirt, who followed him from Trichus. grassy plains. He stood beside him and addressed him thus. Up, son of Esculapius, Atreus' son, the mighty monarch, summons thee to see the warlike Menelaus, chief of Greeks, who by an arrow from some practiced hand, Trojan or Lycian, hath received a wound, a cause of boast to them, to us of grief. Thus he, and not unmoved, Machaon heard. They, through the crowd and through the widespread host, together took their way. But when they came where fair-haired Menelaus wounded stood, around him in a ring the best of Greece, and in the midst the godlike chief himself. From the close-fitting belt the shaft he drew, breaking the pointed barbs. The sparkling belt he loosened, and the doublet underneath, and coat of mail, the work of armorer's hand. But when the wound appeared in sight where struck the stinging arrow, from the clotted blood he cleansed it, and applied with skillful hand the herbs of healing power, which Chiron, erst in friendly guise, upon his sire bestowed. While round the valiant Menelaus they were thus engaged, advanced the Trojan hosts. They donned their arms, and for the fight prepared. In Agamemnon, then, no trace was seen of laggard sloth, no shrinking from the fight, but full of ardor, and to the field he rushed. He left his horses and brass-mounted car, the champing horses, by Eurymedon, the son of Ptolemy, Piraeus' son, were held aloof, but with repeated charge still to be near at hand, when faint with toil his limbs should fail him, marshalling his host. Himself on foot the warrior ranks arrayed, with cheering words addressing whom he found with zeal preparing for the battlefield. Relax not, valiant friends, your warlike toil, for Jove to falsehood ne'er will give his aid, and they who first, regardless of their oaths, have broken truce, shall with their flesh themselves the vultures feed, while we, their city raised, their wives and helpless children bear away. whom, remiss and shrinking from the war, he found, with keen rebuke, he thus assailed. Ye wretched Greeks, your country's foul reproach, have ye no sense of shame? Why stand ye thus like timid fawns that in the race run down? Stand all bewildered, spiritless, and tame. So stand ye now nor dare to face the fight. What, will ye wait the Trojans' near approach, where on the beach beside the hoary ship our goodly ships are drawn, and see if Jove will, or you his protecting hand extend? As thus the king the serried ranks reviewed, he came where thronging round their skillful chief, Idomeneus, 
the warlike bands of Crete were arming for the fight. Idomeneus, of courage stubborn as the forest boar, the foremost ranks arrayed. Meriones, the rearmost squadrons had in charge. With joy the monarch Agamemnon saw, and thus, with accents bland, Idomeneus addressed. Idomeneus, above all other Greeks, in battle and elsewhere, I honor thee. And in the banquet, where the noblest mix the ruddy wine for chiefs alone reserved, though others drink their share, yet by thy side, thy cup, like mine, still new replenish, stands to drink at pleasure. Up then, to the fight, and show thyself the warrior that thou art. To whom the Cretan king, Idomeneus, In me, Atrides, thou shalt ever find. As at the first I promised, comrade true. But go, and stir the other long-haired Greeks to speedy battle, since the Trojans now the truce have broken, and defeat and death must wait on those who have their oaths forsworn. He said, and Agamemnon went his way, rejoicing. Through the crowd he passed, and came where stood the Aegises. Them, in act to arm, amid a cloud of infantry he found. And as a goatherd from his watchtower crag beholds a cloud advancing o'er the sea, by Zephyr's breath impelled, as from afar he gazes, black as pitch, it sweeps along o'er the dark ocean's face, and with it brings a hurricane of rain. He shuddering sees, and drives his flock beneath a sheltering cave. So thick and dark, about the Aegises stirred, impatient for the war, the stalwart youths, black masses, bristling close with spear and shield. Well pleased, the monarch Agamemnon saw, and thus addressed them, Valiant chiefs, to you, the leaders of the brass-clad Greeks, I give, twere needless and unseemly, no commands, for well ye understand your troops to rouse to deeds of dauntless courage. Would to Jove, to Pallas, and Apollo, that such mind as is in you in all the camp were found, then soon should Priam's lofty city fall, taken and destroyed by our victorious hands. Thus saying, them he left, and onward moved. Nestor, the smooth-tongued Pylian chief, he found the troops arraying, and to valiant deeds his friends encouraging. Stout Pelagon, Alastor, Chromius, Hemon, warlike prince, and Bias, old, his people's sure defense. In the front rank, with chariot and with horse, he placed the car-born warriors. In the rear, numerous and brave, a cloud of infantry, compactly massed to stem the tide of war. Between the two he placed the inferior troops, that e'en against their will they needs must fight. The horsemen first he charged, and bade them keep their horses well in hand, nor wildly rush amid the tumult. See, he said, that none in skill or valor Overconfident, advance before his comrades, nor alone retire, 
For so your lines were easier forced, But ranging each beside a hostile car. Thrust with your spears, for such the better way, By men so disciplined, in elder days Were lofty walls and fenced towns destroyed. Thus he experienced in the wars of old. Well pleased the monarch Agamemnon saw, And thus addressed him, Would to heaven, old man, That as thy spirit, such too were thy strength And vigor of thy limbs. But now old age, the common lot of mortals, Weighs thee down. Would I could see some others in thy place, And thou couldst still be numbered with the young. To whom Gerenian Nestor thus replied, Atrides, I too fain would see restored The strength I once possessed, What time I slew the godlike Eutalian. But the gods on men bestow not all their gifts at once. I then was young, and now am bowed with age. Yet with the chariots can I still go forth, and age with sage advice, for such the right and privilege of age. To hurl the spear belongs to younger men, who after me were born who boast their vigor unimpaired. He said, and Agamemnon went his way rejoicing. To Menestheus next he came, the son of Pteus, charioteer renowned. Him found he circled by the Athenian bands, the razors of the war cry, close beside the sage Ulysses stood, around him ranged, not unrenowned, the Cephalonian troops. The sound of battle had not reached their ears, for but of late the Greek and Trojan hosts were set in motion. They expecting stood, till other Grecian columns should advance, assail the Trojans, and renew the war. Atrides saw, and thus reproachful spoke. O oh, son of Pateus, heaven-descended king, and thou too, master of all tricky arts, why lingering stand ye thus aloof, and wait for others' coming? Ye should be the first the hot assault of battle to confront. For ye are first my summons to receive, Whene'er the honored banquet we prepare, And well ye like to eat the savory meat, And at your will the luscious wine cups drain. Now stand ye here, and unconcerned Would see ten columns pass before you to the fight. To whom with stern regard, Ulysses thus. What words have passed the barrier of thy lips, Atrides? How with want of warlike zeal canst thou reproach us? When the Greeks again their furious war shall waken, thou shalt see, if that thou care to see, amid the ranks of Troy, the father of Telemachus in the forefront. Thy words are empty wind. Atrides saw him chafed, and smiling thus recalled his former words. Ulysses, sage, Laertes' high-born son, not overmuch I give thee blame, or orders, for I know thy mind to gentle counsels is inclined. Thy thoughts are one with mine. Then come, henceforth shall all be well, and if a hasty word have passed, may heaven regard it as unsaid. 
thus saying them, he left and onward moved. The son of Tydeus, valiant Diomed, standing he found amid his warlike steeds and well-built cars. Beside him, Sthenelus, the son of Capaneus, Atrides saw, and thus addressed him with reproachful words. Alas, thou son of Tydeus, wise and bold, why crouch with fear? Why thus appalled survey the pass of war? Not so had Tydeus crouched. His hand was ever ready from their foes to guard his comrades. So at least they say, whose eyes beheld his labors. I myself nor met him, e'er nor saw. But by report thy father was the foremost man of men. A stranger to Mycenae once he came with godlike Polynesus. Not at war, but seeking succor for the troops that lay encamped before the sacred walls of Thebes. For reinforcements earnestly they sued. The boon they asked was granted them, but Jove with unpropitious omens turned them back. Advancing on their journey, when they reached Esopus' grassy plains and rushes deep, the Greeks upon a mission Tydeus sent. He went, and many Thebans there he found feasting in Eteocles' royal hall. Amid them all, a stranger and alone, he stood unterrified and challenged all to wrestle with him, and with ease o'erthrew, so mighty was the aid that Pallas gave. Whereat, indignant, they, on his return, an ambush set of fifty chosen youths. Two were their leaders, Harmon's godlike son, Meon, and Lycophontes, warrior brave, son of Autophonus. And these two fared, but ill at Tydeus' hands he slew them all. Meon alone, obedient to the gods, he spared, and bade him bear the tidings home. Such Tydeus was, though greater in debate, his son will never rival him in arms. He said, brave Diomed in silence heard, submissive to the monarch's stern rebuke. Then answered thus the son of Capaneus, Atrides, Speaking up falsely. Well thou knowest the truth, that we, our fathers, far surpass. The seven-gated city Thebes we took with smaller force, beneath the wall of Mars, trusting to heavenly signs and favoring Jove, where they, by blind presumptuous folly, failed then equal not our father's deeds with ours. To whom thus Diomed, with stern regard, Father, be silent! Hearken to my words! I blame not Agamemnon, king of men, who thus to battle stirs the well-grieved Greeks. His will the glory be if we o'ercome the valiant Trojans and their city take. Great too his loss if they or us prevail. Then come, let us too for the fight prepare. He said, and from the car leaped down in arms. Fierce rang the armor on the warrior's breast that even the stoutest heart might quail with fear. As by the west wind driven, the ocean waves dash forward on the far resounding shore, wave upon wave, first curls the ruffled sea. With whitening crests anon, with thundering roar, it breaks upon the beach, 
and from the crags recoiling flings in giant curves its head aloft and tosses high the wild sea spray column on column so the hosts of greece poured ceaseless to the war to each the chiefs their orders gave the rest in silence moved nor would ye deem that mighty mass endued with power of speech so silently they moved in awe of their great captains far around flashed the bright armor they were girt withal on the other hand the trojans as the flocks that in the courtyard of some wealthy lord in countless numbers stand at milking time incessantly bleeding as their lambs they hear so rose their mingled clamors through the camp for not one language nor one speech was there but many nations called from distant lands these mars inspired and those the blue-eyed maid and fear and flight and discord unappeased of blood-stained mars the sister and the friend with humble crest at first anon her head while yet she treads the earth affronts the skies the gauge of battle in the midst she threw strode through the crowd and woe to mortals wrought when to the midst they came together rushed bucklers and lances and the furious might of mail clad warriors bossy shield on shield clattered in conflict loud the clamor rose then rose too mingled shouts and groans of men slaying and slain the earth ran red with blood as when descending from the mountain's brow two wintry torrents from their copious source pour downward to the narrow pass where meet their mingled waters in some deep ravine their weight of flood on the far mountain's side the shepherd hears the roar so loud arose the shouts and yells of those commingling hosts first mid the foremost ranks and tilicus a trojan warrior echepolis slew a crested chief thalasius noble son beneath his horsehair plumed helmet's peak the sharp spear struck deep in his forehead fixed it pierced the bone then darkness veiled his eyes and like a tower amid the press he fell him elefino brave abantian chief son of chalcadon seizing by the feet dragged from beneath the darts in haste to strip his armor off but short lived was the attempt for bold agenor marked him as he drew the corpse aside and with his brass tipped spear thrust through his flank unguarded as he stooped beside his shield and slapped his limbs in death the spirit was fled but hotly o'er him raged the war of greeks and trojans fierce as wolves they fought man struggling hand to hand with man then ajax telamon a stalwart youth son of anthemion simoisius slew whose mother gave him birth on simoisius banks when with her parents down from ida's heights she drove her flock thence simoisius slew nor destined he his parents to repay their early care for short his term of life by godlike ajax mighty spear subdued 
him to the front, advancing in the breast. By the right nipple, Ajax struck right through. From front to back, the brass-tipped spear was driven out through the shoulder. Prone in dust he fell. As some tall poplar, grown in marshy mead, smooth-stemmed, with branches tapering o'er the head, which with the biting axe the real might fells to beg the fellows of his well-built car. Sapless beside the river lies the tree, so laid the youthful Simoisius, felled by godlike Ajax hand. At him, in turn, the son of Priam, Antiphus, encased in radiant armor, from amid the crowd his javelin threw. His mark indeed he missed, but through the groin Ulysses' faithful friend, Lucas, he struck in act to bear away the youthful dead. Down on the corpse he fell, and, dying of the dead, relaxed his grasp. Fierce anger at his comrade's slaughter filled Ulysses' breast. In burnished armor clad, forward he rushed, and standing near around he looked and poised on high his glittering lance. Beneath his aim the Trojans' back recoiled. Nor vainly flew the spear. Democuan, a bastard son of Priam, met the blow. He from Abydos came, his high-bred mares there left to pasture. Him, Ulysses, filled with fury at his loved companion's death, smote on the head. Through either temple passed the pointed spear, and darkness veiled his eyes. Thundering fell, and loud his armor rang. At this the Trojan chiefs, and Hector's self, began to give ground. The Greeks, with joyful shouts, seized on the dead, and forward urged their course. From Ilum's heights, Apollo, filled with wrath, looked down, and to the Trojans shouted loud, Uprouse ye, valiant Trojans! Give not way before the Greeks! Their bodies are not stone nor iron to defy your trenchant swords. And great Achilles, fair-haired Thetis' son, fights not, but o'er his anger broods apart. So from the city called the heavenly voice. The Greeks, meanwhile, all glorious palace fired, moved mid the tumult, and the laggards roused. Then fell Diores, Amarincius' son. A rugged fragment of a rock had crushed his ankle and right leg. From Innis came the Thracian chief who hurled it, Pyrrhus, son of Imbasus. The tendons both and bones the huge mass shattered. Backward in the dust he fell, both hands extending to his friends, gasping his life away. Then quick up ran he who the blow had dealt, and with his spear thrust through him on the navel. From the wound his bowels gushed, and darkness veiled his eyes. But he, advancing through the breast, was struck above the nipple by the Aetolian chief Tossus, and through the lungs the spear was driven. Tossus approached, and from his breast withdrew the sturdy spear, and with his sharp-edged sword across his waistband gave the mortal stroke, yet could not touch his arms. For all around the Thracian warriors, with their tufted crowns, their long spears held before them, him 
though stout and strong and valiant, kept at bay, her force he yielded. And thus side by side were laid the two, the Thracian and the Athenian chief, and round them many a valiant soldier. Well might the deeds achieved that day deserve his praise, who, through that bloody field, might pass by sword or spear, unwounded by the hand of Pallas, guarded from the weapon's flight. For many a Trojan, many a Greek, that day prone in the dust and side by side were they.
Book 5 Argument The Acts of Diomed Diomed, assisted by Pallas, performs wonders in this day's battle. Pandarus wounds him with an arrow, but the goddess cures him, enables him to discern gods from mortals, and prohibits him from contending with any of the former, excepting Venus. Aeneas joins Pandarus to oppose him. Pandarus is killed, and Aeneas in great danger, but for the assistance of Venus, who, as she is removing her son from the fight, is wounded on the hand by Diomed. Apollo seconds her in his rescue, and at length carries off Aeneas to Troy, where he is healed in the temple of Pergamus. Mars rallies the Trojans, and assists Hector to make a stand. In the meantime, Aeneas is restored to the field, and they overthrow several of the Greeks. Among the rest, Clopolemus is slain by Sarpedon. Juno and Minerva descend to assist Mars. The latter incites Diomed to go against that god. He wounds him and sends him groaning to them. The first battle continues through this book. The scene is the same as in the former. Such strength and courage then to Diomed the son of Tydeus and Pallas gave, as raised mid all the Greeks the glory of his name. For from his helm and shield a fiery light there flashed, like autumn's star that brightest shines when newly risen from his ocean path. So from the warrior's head and shoulders flashed that fiery light. To the midst he urged his furious course, where densest masses fought. There was one, Darius, mid the Trojan host, the priest of Vulcan, rich of blameless life. Two gallant sons he had, Ideas named, and Phegeus, skilled in all the points of war. These parted from the throng, the warrior, they on their car, while he on foot advanced. When near they came, first Phegeus threw his spear. O'er the left shoulder of Tydides passed the erring weapon's point, and missed its mark. His ponderous spear in turn Tydides threw, and not in vain. On Fiju's breast it struck, full in the midst, and hurled him from the car. Ideas from the well-wrought chariot sprang, and fled, nor durst his brother's corpse defend. Nor had he so escaped the doom of death, but Vulcan bore him safely from the field, in darkness shroud. That his aged sire might not be wholly of his sons bereaved, the car Tydides to his comrades gave, and bade them to the ships the horses drive. Now when the Trojans, Darius' sons, beheld the one in flight, the other stretched in death, their spirits within them wailed. But Pallas took the hand of Mars, and thus addressed the god, Mars, Mars, thou bane of mortals, blood-stained lord, razor of cities, wherefore leave we not the Greeks and Trojans to contend, and see to which the sire of all will victory give, while we retire and shun the wrath of death. Thus say, from the battle, Mars she led, and placed him on Scamander's steep banks. The Greeks drove back the Trojan host. 
The chiefs slew each his victim. Agamemnon first, the mighty monarch, from his chariot hurled Odeus, the sturdy Halizonian chief. Him, as he turned, between the shoulder blades the javelin struck, and through his chest was driven. Thundering he fell, and loud his arms rang. On Phaestus, Boris' son, the Ionian chief, who from the fertile plains of Tarnic came, then sprang by Dominus, and as he sought to mount upon his car, the Cretan king, through his right shoulder, drove the pointed spear. He fell. The shades of death his eyes o'erspread, and of his arms the followers stripped his corpse. The son of Atreus, Menelaus, slew Scamandros, son of Strophus, sportsman king, in woodcraft skillful, by Diana's self, taught to slay each beast that chased the mountain forest holes. But not availed him then the archer queen, Diana's counsels, nor his boasted art of distant. For as he fled, the lance of Menelaus, Atreus's warlike son, behind his neck, between the shoulder blades, his flight arrested. Through his chest, headlong he fell, and loud his arm. Phereclus by Meriones was slain, son of Harmonides, whose practiced hand knew well to fashion many a work of art. By Pallas highly favored, he the ships for Paris built, first origin of Freighted with evil to the man of Troy, and to himself, who knew not heaven's decrees. Him, in his headlong flight, in hot pursuit, Meriones o'ertook, and thrust his lance through his right flank. Beneath the bone was driven the spear, and pierced him through, prone on his knees, groaning. Meges Pedeus slew, and Mors slew, bastard born, but by Theano reared with tender care, and nurtured as her son, with her own children, for her husband's sake. Him, Phileos, warrior son, approaching near, thrust through the junction of the head and neck, crashed through his teeth the spear beneath the tongue. Prone in the dust he gnashed the blazing point. Eurypolis, Eumaean's noble son, Ipsino, slew, the worthy progeny of Dolopia, Scamander's priest, and by the people as a god revered. Him, as he fled before him, from behind, Eurypolis, Eumaean's noble son, smote with his sword. From the shoulder point, the brawny arm he severed. To the ground, down fell the gory head. The darkling shades of death and rigorous doom, his eyelids closed. Thus labored they amid the stubborn fight. But of Tydides, none might say to whom. Or whether with the hosts of Troy or Greece he mingled in the fight, hither and thither o'er the plain he rushed, like to a wintry stream that brimming o'er breaks down its barriers in its rapid course, nor well built bridge can stem the flood, nor fence guards the fertile fields as down it pours its sudden torrent, swollen with rain. Many a goodly work of man destroys. So back were born before Tydides' might the serried ranks of Troy. 
nor dare to wait, despite their numbers, his impetuous charge. Him, when Lycaon's noble son beheld careering o'er the plain, the serried ranks driving before him, quick at Tydeus' son he bent his bow, and onward as he rushed on the right shoulder near the breastplate's joint the stinging arrow struck. Right through it passed and held its way at blood. Then shouted loud Lycaon's noble son, Arouse ye valiant Trojans, ye who goad your flying steeds. The bravest of the Greeks is wounded, nor, I deem, can long withstand my weapon. Indeed, from Lycia's shore, by Phoebus' counsel sent, I join the war. Thus he Vain glorious, but not so was quelled the godlike chief. Back he withdrew and stood beside his car, and thus to Sthenelus, the son of Capaneus, his speech addressed. Up, gentle son of Capaneus, descend from off the car, and from my shoulder draw this stinging arrow for. He said, and down leaped from the chariot Sthenelus, and stood beside him, and as forth he drew the shaft, gushed out the blood, and dyed the twisted man. Then thus the valiant son of Tydeus prayed, Hear me, thou child of aegis-bearing Jove, unconquered! Amid the deadly fight, thy friendly aid my father e'er sustained. Let me in turn thy favor find, and grant within my reach and compass of my spear that man may find himself who unawares hath wounded me, and vainly boasting deems I shall not long behold the light of day. Prayed the chief, and Pallas heard his prayer. To all his limbs, to feet and hands alike, she gave fresh vigor, and with winged words beside him as she stood, addressed him thus: Go, fearless onward, Diomed, to meet the Trojan hosts, for I within thy breast. My father's dauntless courage have infused, such as of old in Tydeus' bosom dwelt, bold horseman, buckler clad. And from thine eyes the film that dimmed them I have purged away, that thou mayst well, twixt gods and men, discern. If then some god make trial of thy force, with other of the immortals fight thou not. But should Jove's daughter Venus dare pray, thou needst not shun at her to cast thy spear. This said, the blue-eyed goddess disappeared. Forthwith again, amid the foremost ranks, Tydides mingled. Keenly as before, his spirit against the Trojans burned to fight. With threefold fury now he sought the fray. As when a hungry lion has o'erleaped the sheepfold, him the guardian of the flock has wounded, not disabled. By his wound to rage excited, but not forced to fly. The fold he enters, scares the trembling sheep, That, closely huddled, each on other press, Then pounces on his prey, and leaps the fence. So pounced Tydides on the Trojan host. Astinos and Hyperion 
Then, spears guarded. Through the breast of one he drove his spear, and with his mighty sword he smote the other on the collarbone, the shoulder, and severed him from the neck and back. Them left he there to lie. Of Abbas then and Polyidus went in hot pursuit, sons of Polyidus, an aged seer, whose vision. Stayed them not, but both were doomed. Pray to valiant Diomed to fall. Xanthus and Thoan, then the heroes slew, the sons of Phelops, children of his age. He, born with years, no other sons begot, heirs of his wealth. They two together fell. To their father left a load of grief, that from the battle they returned not home, and distant kindred all his substance share. On Chromius and Echemon next he fell, two sons of Priam on one chariot bore, and as a lion springs upon a herd, and breaks the neck of heifer, or of steer feeding in woodland glade, with such a spring, these two, in vain, resisting, from their car to die to his world, then stripped their arms, and bade his followers lead their horses to the ships. Him, when Aeneas saw amid the ranks dealing destruction, through the fight and throng of spears he plunged, how he might find the godlike Pandarus. Like him as a son he found, of noble birth and stalwart form, and stood before him and addressed him thus. Where, Pandarus, are now thy winged shafts, thy bow and well-known skill? Wherein with thee can no man here contend, nor Lycia boast through all her white spread plains a truer aim. Then raise to Jove thy hand, and with thy shaft strike down this chief, whoe'er he be, that thus is making fearful havoc in our host, relaxing many a warrior's limbs of death. If he be not indeed a god incensed against the Trojans for neglected rights, for fearful is the vengeance of a god. Whom answered thus Lycaon's noble son? Aeneas, chief and counselor of Troy, most like in all respects to Tydeus' son he seems. His shield I know, and visored helm, and horses. Whether he himself be God, I cannot tell. But if he be indeed the man I think him, Tydeus' valiant son, he fights not thus without the aid of heaven, but by his side, his shoulders veiled in cloud, some god attends his steps, and turns away the shaft that just hath reached him. For even now a shaft I shot, which by the breastplate's joint pierced his right shoulder through. Full sure I deemed that shaft had sent him to the shades, and yet it slew him not. Tis sure some angry god, nor horse have I nor car on which to mount, but in my sire Lycaon's wealthy house, eleven fair chariots stand, all newly built, each with its cover, by the side of each, two steeds, on rye and barley white, are fed, and in his well-built house, when here I came, Lycaon, aged warrior, urged me oft, with horses and with chariots, high upborne, to lead the Trojans in a stubborn fight. I hearkened not. Twere better if I had, yet 
fear'd I, lest my horses, want to feed in plenty, unstinted by the soldiers' wants, might of their customed forage be deprived. I met them there, that hither came on foot, and trusting to my bow, they trust it seems. Two chiefs already have I struck, the sons of Tydeus and of Atreus, with true aim drawn blood from both, yet but increased their rage. Sad was the hour when down from where it hung I took my bow, and hasting to the aid of godlike Hector, thither led my troops. But should I e'er return and see again my native land, my wife, my lofty hall, then may a stranger's sword cut off my if with these hands I shatter not and burn the bow that thus hath failed me at my need. And answered thus Aeneas, chief of Troy, Speak thou not thus, our fortunes shall not change till thou and I, with chariot and with horse, this chief encounter, and his prowess prove and mount my car, and see how swift my steeds. Hither and thither, in pursuit or flight, from those of Tross descended, scour the plain. So if the victory to Diomed, the son of Tydeus, should by Jove be given, we yet may safely reach the walls of Troy. Take thou the whip and reins, while I descend to fight on foot, or Thou the chief engage, and leave to me the conduct of the call. Whom answered thus Lycaon's noble son? Aeneas, of thy horses and thy car take thou the charge. Beneath the accustomed hand, with more assurance would they draw the car, if we from Titus' son be forced to fly. Nor struck with panic, and thy voice unheard, refuse to bear us from the battlefield. So should ourselves be slain, and Tydeus' son in triumph drive thy horses to the ships. But thou, thy horses and thy chariot, guide, while I his onset with my lance receive. Thus say. On the car they mounted both, and toward Tydides urged their eager steeds. Then Sthenelus beheld the noble son of Capius, and to Tydides cried, O son of Tydeus, dearest to my soul, two men I see, of might invincible, impatient to engage thee. Pandarus, well skilled in archery, Lycian's son. With him, Aeneas, great Anchises' son, who from immortal Venus boasts his birth. Then let us timely to the car retreat, lest, moving thus amid the foremost ranks, I daring pay the forfeit of my life. To whom brave Diana, with stern regard, Talk not to me of flight, I heed thee not. It is not in my nature so to fight with skulking artifice and faint retreat. My strength is yet unbroken. I should shame to mount the car, but forward will I go to meet these chiefs' encounter. For my soul, Pallas, forbids the touch of fear to know. Nor shall their horses speed procure for both a safe return, though one escape my arm. This too I say, and bear my words in mind, by Pallas' counsel, if my hap should be to slay them both, leave thou my horses here, the reins attaching to the chariot rail, and seize, and from the Trojans to the ships Drive off the horses in Aeneas' car. 
from those descended, which shall see in Jove, on Tros for Ganymede his son is stoned. With these may none beneath the sun compare. Anchises, king of men, the breed obtained by cunning, to the horses sending mares without the knowledge of Laomedon. Six colts were thus engendered, four of these in his own stalls he reared, the other two gave to Aeneas, fear-inspiring chief. These could we win, our praise were great indeed. Such converse while they held, the twain approached, their horses urged to speed. Then thus began to Diomed, the Chian's noble son. Great son of Titus, warrior brave and skilled, my shaft, it seems, has failed to reach thy life. Try we then now what hap attends my spear. He said, and poising, hurled his ponderous spear, and struck Tydides' shield. Right through the shield drove the keen weapon, and the breastplate reached. Then shouted loud Lycaon's noble son, Thou hast it through the flank, nor canst thou long survive the blow. Great glory now is mine. To whom unmoved, valiant Diomed, Thine aim hath failed, I am not touched. And now I deem we part not hence, Till one of ye glut with his blood The insatiate lord of war. He said, The spear by Pallas guided Struck beside the nostril, Underneath the eye, Crashed through the teeth, And cutting through the tongue, Beneath the angle of the jaw, Came forth. Down from the car he fell, And loudly rang his glittering arms. Aside the startled steeds Sprang devious, from his limbs the spirit fled. Down leaped Aeneas' spear and shield in hand against the Greeks to guard the valiant dead. And like a lion, fearless in his strength, around the corpse he stalked this way and that, his spear and buckler round before him held to all who dared approach him threatening death with fearful shouts. A rocky fragment then, Tydides lifted up, a mighty mass which scarce two men could raise, as men are now. But he, unaided, lifted it with ease. With this he smote Aeneas near the groin, where the thigh bone inserted in the hip turns in the socket joint rugged mass, the socket crushed, and both the tendons broke, and tore away the flesh. Down on his knees, yet resting on his hand, the hero fell, and o'er his eyes the shades of darkness spread. Then had Aeneas, king of men, been slain, had not his mother, Venus, child of Jove, who to Anchises, where he fed his flocks, the hero bore his peril quickly seen. Around her son she threw her snowy arms, and with a veil thick folded, wrapped him round from hostile spears to guard him, lest some Greek should pierce his breast and rob him of his life. She from the battle thus her son removed, nor did the son of Capitus neglect the strict injunction by Tydides given. His reins, attaching to the chariot rail, far from the battle din, he checked and left his own fleet steeds. 
and rushing forward, seized, and from the Trojans toward the camp drove off the sleek-skinned horses of Lys Khan. These to Theopolis, his chosen friend, he gave, among his comrades best esteemed, of soundest judgment, toward the ships to drive. Then his own car, mounting, seized the reins, and urged with eager haste his fiery steeds, seeking to die. He, meanwhile, pressed on in keen pursuit of Venus. Her he knew, the unwarlike goddess, not of those that like the Lana fierce or Pallas range, exulting through the black stained fields of war. Her, searching through the crowd at length, he found, and springing forward with his pointed spear, a wound inflicted on her tender hand. Piercing the ambrosial veil, the grace's work, the sharp spear grazed her palm below the wrist. Forth from the wound the immortal current flowed, pure ichor, life stream of the blessed gods. They eat no bread, they drink no red wine, and bloodless thanks, and deathless they become. The goddess shrieked aloud, and dropped her son. But in his arms Apollo bore him off, in a thick cloud enveloped, lest some Greek might pierce his breast, and rob him of his life. Loud shouted brave to Dides, as she fled, Daughter of Jove, from battlefields retire! Enough for thee, weak woman, to delude! If war thou seek'st, the lesson thou shalt learn shall cause thee shudder, but to hear it named. Thus he, but ill at ease and sorely paved, the goddess fled. Her, Iris, swift as wind, caught up, and from the tumults bore away, weeping in pain, her fair skin soiled. Mars, on the left hand of the battlefield, she found, his spear reclining by his side, and, veins in cloud, his car and flying steeds. Kneeling, her brother, she besought to lend the flying steeds, with golden frontlets crowned. Dear brother, aid me hence, and lend thy car to bear me to Olympus, seat of gods. Great is the pain I suffer from a wound received from Diomed, a mortal man, who now would dare with Jove himself to fight. He lent the steeds with golden frontlets crowned. In deep distress she mounted on the car, Beside her Iris stood, and took the reins, and urged the coursers. Nothing loth they flew, and soon to high Olympus, seat of gods, they came. Swift Iris there, the coursers stayed, loosed from the chariot, and before them placed ambrosial forage. On her mother's lap, Dione, Venus fell, she in her arms embraced, and soothed her with her hand, and said, Which of the heavenly powers hath wronged thee thus, my child, as guilty of some open shame? Who answered thus the laughter-loving queen? The haughty son of Tydeus, Diomed, hath wounded me. Because my dearest son, Aeneas, from the field I bore away. No more twixt Greeks and Trojans is the fight, But with the gods themselves the Greeks contend. To whom Dione, heavenly goddess, thus, 
Have patience, dearest child, though much enforced, restrain thy anger. We, in heaven who dwell, have much to bear from mortals, and ourselves too oft upon each other's sufferings lay. Mars had his sufferings, by Aeolus' sons, Otis and Ephialtes, strongly bound, he thirteen months in brazen fetters lay, and there had pined away the god of war, insatiate Mars, had not their stepmother, a beauteous Arabia, sought the aid of Hermes. He, by stealth, released the god, sore worn and wasted by his galling chains. Juno too suffered, when Amphitryon's son, through her right breast a three-barbed arrow sent. Dire and unheard of were the pangs she bore. Great Pluto's self the stinging arrow felt, when that same son of aegis-bearing Jove assailed him in the very gates of hell, and wrought him keenest anguish, pierced with pain, to high Olympus, to the courts of Jove. Groaning he came. The bitter shaft remained deep in his shoulder fixed, and grieved his soul. But soon, with soothing ointments, Peon's hand, for death on him was powerless, healed the wound. Accursed was he, of daring overbold, reckless of evil deeds, who with his bow assailed the gods who on Olympus dwell. The blue-eyed palace, well I know, has urged Tydides to assail thee, fool and blind, unknowing he how short his term of life who fights against the gods. For him no child upon his knees shall lisp a father's name. Safe from the war and battlefield returned. Brave as he is, let Diomed beware. He meets not some more dangerous foe than thee. Then, fair Aegiale, addressed his child, the noble wife of valiant Diomed, shall long, with lamentations loud, disturb the slumbers of her house. Vainly mourn her youthful lord, the bravest of the Greeks. She said, and wiped the ichor from the wound. Her hand was healed, the grievous pains allayed. But Juno and Minerva, looking on, with words of bitter mockery, Saturn's son provoked. And thus the blue-eyed goddess spoke. O oh, father, may I speak without offense? Venus, it seems, has sought to lead astray some Grecian woman and persuade to join those Trojans, whom she holds in high esteem. And, as her hand, the gentle dame caressed, a golden clasp has scratched her slender arm. Thus she, and smiled the sire of gods and men. He called the golden Venus to his side, and, Not to thee, my child, he said, Belong the deeds of war? Do thou Bestow thy care on deeds of love, and tender marriage ties, and leave to Mars and Pallas feats of arms. Such converse, while they held, brave Diomed again assailed Aeneas. Well he knew Apollo's guardian hand around him thrown, yet by the god, undaunted, on he pressed to slay Aeneas, and his arms obtain. Thrice was his onset made, with murderous aim, and thrice Apollo struck his glittering shield. A 
But when with godlike force he sought to make his fourth attempt, the far destroyer spoke in terms of awful menace. Be advised, Tydides, and retire, nor as a god esteem thyself, since not alike the race of gods immortal and of earth-born men. He said, and Diomed, a little space before the far destroyer's wrath, retired. Apollo, then Aeneas, bore away far from the tumult, and in Pergamus, where stood his sacred shrine, bestowed him safe. Latona there, and Diane, archer queen, in the great temple's innermost recess, gave to his wounds their care, and soothed his pride. Meanwhile, Apollo of the Silver Bow, a phantom form prepared, a counterpart of great Aeneas, and alike in arms. Around the form of Trojans and of Greeks, loud was the din of battle. Fierce the strokes that fell on rounded shield and the tough bull's hide, and lighter targ before each warrior's breast. Then thus Apollo to the god of war, Mars, Mars, thou bane of mortals, blood-stained lord, razor of cities, wert not well thyself to interpose, and from the battlefield withdraw this chief, Tydides? Such his pride he now would dare withdraw himself to fight. Venus of late he wounded in the wrist, and, like a god, but now confronted me. He said, and sat on Ilum's topmost height, while Mars, in likeness of the Thracian chief, swift Acamas, amid the Trojan ranks, moved to and fro, and urged them to the fight. To Priam's heaven-descended sons he called, Ye sons of Priam, heaven-descended king, how long will ye behold your people slain, till to your very doors the war be brought? Aeneas, Noble-souled Anchises' son, in like esteem with Hector held, is down. On to his aid, our gallant comrade, save. He said, his words fresh courage gave to all. Then thus Sarpedon, in reproachful tone, dressed the godlike Hector. Where is now Hector, the spirit that heretofore was thine? Twas once thy boast that even without allies, thyself, thy brethren, and thy house alone the city could defend. For all of these I look in vain, and see not one. They all as curs around a lion, cower and crouch. We, strangers and allies, maintain the fight. I, to your aid from lands afar remote, from Lycia came, like Xanthus' eddying stream. There left a cherished wife and infant son, and rich possessions, which might envy move. Yet I, my troops, encourage, and myself have played my part, though not have I to lose, not that the Greeks could drive or bear away. But thou standst idly by, nor bidst the rest maintain their ground, 
and guard their wives and homes? Beware, lest ye, as in the meshes caught of some wide sweeping net, become the prey and booty of your foes, who soon shall lay your prosperous city level with the dust. By day and night should this thy thoughts engage, with constant prayer to all thy brave allies, firmly to stand and wipe this shame away. He said, and Hector felt the biting speech. Down from his car he leaped, and through the ranks, two javelins brandishing, he passed, to arms exciting all, and raised his battle cry. The tide was turned. Again they faced the Greeks. In serried ranks, the Greeks, undaunted, stood. As when the wind from off a threshing floor, when men are winnowing, blows the chaff away, when yellow series with the breeze divides the corn and chaff, which lies in whitening heaps, so thick the Greeks were whitened o'er with dust, which to the brazen vault of heaven arose beneath the horses' feet. That with the crowd were mingled, but the drivers turned to fight. Unwearied still, they bore the brunt. But Mars, the Trojans succoring, the battlefields veiled in thick clouds, from every quarter dropped. Thus he, of Phoebus of the Golden Sword, obeyed instruction, bidding him arouse the courage of the Trojans, when he saw Pallas approaching to support the Greeks. Then from the wealthy shrine, Apollo's self, Aeneas brought, and vigor fresh infused. Amid his comrades once again he stood. They joyed to see him yet alive and sound and full of vigor, yet no question asked, no time for question then, amid the toils imposed by Phoebus of the Silver Bow, and blood-stained Mars, and discord unappeased. Meanwhile, Ulysses and the Agassiz both, and Diomed, with courage for the fight, the Grecian force inspired. They, undismayed, shrank not before the Trojans' rush and charge. In masses firm they stood, as when the clouds are gathered round the misty mountain top by Saturn's sun in breathless calm, while sleep the force of Boreas and the stormy winds that with their breath the shadowy clouds disperse. So stood the Greeks, nor shunned the Trojans' charge. Through all the army, the Memnon passed and cried, Brave comrades, quit ye now, like men. Bear a stout heart, and in the stubborn fight, let each to other mutual succor give. By mutual succor more are saved than fall. In timid flight, nor fame nor safety lies. Thus he, and straight his javelin threw, and struck a man of mark, Aeneas' faithful friend, Deicoan, the son of Pergasus. By Troy, as ever foremost in the field, in equal honor held with Priam's sons. His shield the monarch Agamemnon struck. The shield's defense was vain. The spear passed through beneath the belt, and in his groin was lodged. Under him, he fell, and loud his armor rang. 
on the other side, Aeneas slew two chiefs, the bravest of the Greeks, Orsilochus and Crethon, sons of Diomedes, who dwelt in thriving Thera. Rich in substance he, and from the mighty river Alpheus traced his high descent, who through the Pylian land his copious water pours. To him was born Orsilochus, of numerous tribes, the chief. To him succeeded valiant Diocles, to whom were born twin sons, Orsilochus and Crethon, skilled in every point of war. They, in the vigor of their youth, to Troy, had sailed amid the dark ribbed ships of Greece, of Atreus' sons a quarrel to uphold. O'er them both the shades of death were spread. As two young lions, by their tawny vein, nursed in the mountains' forests deep recess, on flocks and herds their youthful fury pour with havoc to the sheepfolds, till themselves succumb or mastered by the hand of man. So fell these two beneath Aeneas' hand, and like two lofty pines in death they lay. The warlike Menelaus saw their fall with pitying eye, and through the foremost ranks with brandished spear advanced by Mars impelled, who hoped his death by great Aeneas' hand. Him Nestor's son Antilochus beheld, and hastened to his aid, for much he feared, lest ill befall the monarch, and his death deprive them of their warlike labor's fruit. They too, with force combined of hand and spear, pressed onward to the fight. Antilochus, his station keeping close beside the king. Before the two combined, Aeneas feared, bold warrior as he was, to hold his ground. The slain they drew within the Grecian lines, placed in their comrades' hands, and turning back, amid the foremost mingled in the fray. Then, brave as Mars, Pylemenes they slew, the buckled Paphlagonian's warlike chief. Him Menelaus, hand to hand engaged, pierced with a spear thrust through the collarbone, while with a ponderous stone Antilochus full on the elbow smote Achimnius' son, Mardon, his charioteer an act to turn his fiery steeds to flight. Down from his hands fell to the ground the ivory mounted reins. On rushed Antilochus, and with his sword across the temples smote. Gasping, he upon his neck and shoulders from the car pitched headlong, and for there the sand was deep. A while stood balanced, till the horse's feet dashed him upon the ground. Antilochus, the horses seizing, drove them to the ships. Hector beheld athwart the ranks, and rushed, loud shouting, to the encounter. At his back followed the thronging bands of Troy, by Mars and fierce Bellana led. She by the hand, wild uproar held. While Mars, a giant spear brandished aloft. And, stalking now before, now following after Hector, urged them on. Quailed at the sight of valiant Diomed. As when a man, long journeying o'er the plain, all unprepared, stands sudden on the brink of a swift stream, down rushing to the sea, 
boiling with foam, and back recoils. So then recoiled to Dides, and addressed the crowd. O friends, we marvel at the might displayed by Hector, spearmen skilled and warrior bold. But still, some guardian god his steps attends and shields from danger. Now beside him stands, in likeness of a mortal, Mars himself. Then, turning still your faces to your foes, retire, nor venture with the gods to fight. He said, the Trojans now were close at hand, and mounted both upon a single car, two chiefs, Menestes and Anchilius, well skilled in war, by Hector's hand were slain. With pitying eyes, great Ajax Telamon beheld her fall. Advancing close, he threw his glittering spear. The son of Selagus it struck, and Phaeus, who in pieces dwelt in land and substance rich, by evil fate impelled to Priam's house, he brought his aid. Below the belt the spear of Ajax struck, and in his groin the point was buried deep. Thundering he fell. Then forward Ajax sprang to seize the spoils of war. Fast and fierce the Trojans showered their weapons, bright and keen, and many a lance the mighty shield received. Ajax, his foot firm planted on the slain, withdrew the brazen spear, yet could not strip his armor off, so galling flew the shafts, and much he feared his foes might hem him in, who closely pressed upon him, many in grave. And, valiant as he was, and tall and strong, still drove him backward, he perforce retired. Thus labored they amid the stubborn fight. Then evil fate induced Tlepolemus, valiant and strong, the son of Hercules, heaven-born Sarpedon, to confront in fight. When near they came, of cloud-compelling Jove, Grandson and son, Sopolemus began. Sarpedon, Lycian chief, what brings thee here, trembling and crouching, all unskilled in war? Falsely I speak who fabled thee, the son of Aegis bearing Jove. So far out thou beneath their mark, who claimed in elder days that royal lineage. Such my father was, of courage resolute, of lion heart, with but six ships, and with a scanty band, the horses by Laomedon withheld, avenging he overthrew this city, Troy, and made her streets a desert. But thy sword is poor, thy troops are wasting fast away. Nor deem I that the Trojans will in thee, even were thy valor more, and Lysias' aid their safeguard find. But vanquished by my hand, this day the gates of Hades thou shalt pass. To whom the Lycian chief Sarpedon thus. Tlepolemus, the sacred walls of Troy, thy sire o'erthrew, by folly of one man, Laomedon, who with injurious words his noble service recompensed, nor gave the promised steeds for which he came from far. For thee, I deem thou now shalt meet thy doom here at my hand. 
upon thee my spear shall win renown for me. Thy soul to Hades send. Thus, as Sarpedon spoke, Tlepolemus upraised his ashen spear. From both their hands the ponderous weapons simultaneous flew. Full in the throat, Tlepolemus received Sarpedon's spear. Right through the neck it passed, and o'er his eyes the shades of death were spread. On the other side, his spear, Sarpedon, struck on the left thigh. The eager weapon passed right through the flesh, and in the bone was fixed. The stroke of death his father turned aside. Sarpedon from the field his comrades bore, weighed down and tortured by the trailing spear. For in their haste to bear him to his car, no one bethought him from his thigh to draw the weapon forth. So sorely were they pressed. The Greeks, too, from the battlefield conveyed the slain to Polaris. Ulysses saw, patient of spirit, but deeply moved at heart, and with conflicting thoughts his breast was torn. If first he should pursue the Thunderer's son, or deal destruction on the luscious host. But fate had not decreed the valiant son of Jove to fall beneath Ulysses' hand. So on the Lycian's palace turned his way. Alas, or then, and Cyrenus slew Cronus, alias Critinus, no limit. Nor had ended then the list of Lycian warriors by Ulysses slain. But Hector of the glancing helm held. Through the front ranks he rushed with burnished crest, resplendent, flashing terror of the Greeks. With joy Sarpedon saw his near approach, and with imploring tones addressed him thus. Hector, thou son of Priam, leave me not a victim to the Greeks, but lend thine aid. Then in your city let me end my days, for not to me is given again to see my native land, for safe returning home to glad my sorrowing wife and infant child. Thus he, but Hector, answering not a word, passed on in silence, hasted to pursue the Greeks and pour destruction on their host. Beneath the oak of Aegis bearing Jove, his faithful comrades laid Sarpedon down, and from his spy, the valiant Pelagon, his loved companion, drew the ashen spear. He smooth, and giddy mists o'erspread his eyes, but soon revived as on his forehead blew, already gasped for breath, the cooling breeze. By Mars and Hector of the brazen helm, the Greeks hard pressed, yet fled not to their ships, nor yet sustained the fight, but back retired, soon as they learned the presence of the god. Say then, who first, who last, the prowess felt of Hector, Priam's son, and mail-clad Mars? The godlike Teuthras first, Orestes next, old charioteer. Spearman skilled, Trichus, Enomaeus, and Helenus, the son of Enops and Oresbius, girt with sparkling girdle, in Hyle dwelt the careful lord of bounteous wealth, beside Cephas' marshy banks. Boeotia's chiefs around him dwelt on fat and fertile soil. Juno, 
a white-armed queen who saw these two, the Greeks, destroying in the stubborn fight, to Pallas thus her winged words addressed. O oh, heaven, brave child of Aegis bearing Jove, vain was our word to Menelaus given, that he the well-built walls of Troy should raise and safe return, if unrestrained, we leave ferocious Mars to urge his mad career. Come then, let us too mingle in the fray. She said, and Pallas, blue-eyed maid, complied. Offspring of Saturn, Juno, heavenly queen, herself the immortal steeds caparisoned. Adorned with golden frontlets. To the car he be the circling wheels of brass attached. It spoke that on an iron axle turned. The fellows were of gold and fitted round with brazen tires. A marvel to behold. The knaves were silver, rounded every way. The chariot board on gold and silver bands was hung and round it ran a double rail. The pole was all of silver, at the end a golden yoke, with golden yoke bands fair. And Juno, all on fire to join the fray, beneath the yoke the flying coursers led. Pallas, the child of Aegis bearing Jove, within her father's threshold dropped her veil, a very texture work of her own hands, the purest bond of cloud-compelling Jove, and stood accoutred for the bloody fray. Her tasseled aegis round her shoulders next she threw, with terror circled all around, and on its face were figured deeds of arms, and strife, and courage high, and panic there too a gorgon's head of monstrous size, frowned, terrible, portent of angry Jove. And on her head a golden helm she placed, four-crested, double-peaked, whose ample verge a hundred cities' champion might suffice. Her fiery car she mounted, in her hand a spear she bore, long, weighty, tough, wherewith the mighty daughter of a mighty sire sweeps down the ranks of those her hate pursues. Then Juno sharply touched the flying steeds, forthwith spontaneous opening grated harsh the heavenly portals, guarded by the hours who heaven and high Olympus have in charge to roll aside or draw the veil of cloud. Through these the excited horses held their way. They found the son of Saturn from the gods sitting apart upon the highest crest of many ridged Olympus. There arrived the white-armed goddess Juno stayed her steeds, and thus addressed the sovereign lord of heaven. O oh, Father Jove, canst thou behold unmoved the violence of Mars? How many Greeks, reckless and uncontrolled, he hath destroyed? To me a source of bitter grief. Meanwhile, Venus and Phoebus of the Silver Bow look on, well pleased, who sent this madman forth, to whom both law and justice are Say, Father Jove, shall I thine anger move, if with disgrace I drive him from the field? To whom the cloud compeller thus replied, Go send against him Pallas. She, I know, hath oft inflicted on him grievous pain. He said, the 
White armed queen with joy obeyed. She urged her horses, nothing loth. They flew midway between the earth and starry heaven, far as his sight extends. Who from on high looks from his watchtower o'er the dark blue sea? So far at once the neighing horses bound. But when to Troy they came, beside the streams where Simois and Scamander's waters meet, the white armed goddess stayed her flying steeds, loosed from the car, and veiled in densest cloud. For them, at bidding of the river god, ambrosial forage grew. The goddesses, swift as the wild with pigeon's rapid flight, sped to the battlefield to aid the Greeks. But when they reached the thickest of the fray, where thronged around the might of Diomed, the bravest and the best, as lions fierce, or forest boars, the mightiest of their kind, there stood the white-armed queen, and called aloud, in form of Stentor, the brazen voice, whose shout was as the shout of fifty men. Shame on ye, Greeks, base cowards, brave alone in outward semblance. While Achilles yet went forth to battle from the Dardan gates, the Trojans never ventured to advance. So dreaded they his ponderous spear. But now, far from the walls beside your ships, they fight. She said, her words their drooping courage roused. Meanwhile, the blue-eyed Pallas went in haste in search of Tydeus' son. Beside his car she found the king, in act to cool the wound inflicted with a shaft of Pallas. Beneath his shield's broad belt, the clogging sweat oppressed him and his arm was faint with toil. The belt was lifted up, and from the wound he wiped the clotted blood. Beside the car, the goddess stood, and touched the yoke, and said, Little like Tydeus' self is Tydeus' son. Low was his stature, but his spirit was high. And even when I, from combat, rashly waged, would fain have kept him back. One time in Phoebes he found himself an envoy, and alone, without support among the Thebans all. I counseled him, in peace, to share the feast. But by his own impetuous courage led, he challenged all the Thebans to contend with him in the wrestling and o'erthrew them all with ease, so mighty was the aid I gave. Be now I stand beside, and guard from harm, and bid thee boldly with the Trojans fight. But if the labors of the battlefield or task thy limbs, or heartless fear restrain, no issue thou art bound Titan's loins. Whom answered thus the valiant Diomed? I know thee, goddess, who thou art, the child of Aegis bearing Jove. To thee my mind I freely speak, nor aught will I conceal, nor heartless fear, nor hesitating doubt restrain me. But I bear thy words in mind other of the immortals not to fight, but should Jove's daughter Venus dare the fray, at her I need not shun to throw my spear. Therefore I thus withdrew, and others too, exhorted to retire, since Mars himself I saw careering o'er the battlefield. To whom the blue-eyed goddess Pallas Thou son of Typhus, dearest to my soul, Fear now no more with Mars himself to fight, 
nor other god such aid will I bestow. Come then, at him the first, direct thy car, encounter with him hand to hand, nor fear to strike this madman, this incarnate curse, this shameless renegade, who late agreed with Juno and with me to come at Troy and aid the Grecian cause, who now appears, the Greeks deserted, in the Trojan ranks. Thus Pallas spoke, and stretching forth her hand, backward his comrade Sthenelus she drew from off the chariot. Down in haste he sprang, his place beside the valiant Diomed the eager goddess took. Beneath the weight's loud groan, open axle, in the car a mighty goddess and a hero bore. Then Pallas took the whip and reins, and urged direct at Mars the fiery coursers. The bravest of the Aetolians, Periphus, Ocesius' stalwart son, he had just slain and stood in act to strip him of his arms. The helmet then of darkness Pallas donned to hide her presence from the sight of Mars. But when the blood-stained god of war beheld advancing toward him, godlike Diomed, the corpse of stalwart Periphus, he left there where he fell to lie, while he himself of valiant Diomed encounter met. When near they came, first Mars his ponderous spear advanced beyond the yoke and horse's reins with murderous aim. But Pallas from the car turned it aside and foiled the vain attempt. Then Diomed thrust forward in his turn his ponderous spear. Lo, on the flank of Mars, guided by Pallas with successful aim, just where the belt was girt, the weapon struck. It pierced the flesh, and straight was back withdrawn. Then Mars cried out aloud with such a shout, as if nine thousand or ten thousand men should simultaneous raise their battle cry. Trojans and Greeks alike in terror heard, trembling, so fearful was the cry of Mars. As black with clouds appears the darkened air, when after heat the blustering winds arise, so Mars to valiant Diomed appeared, as in thick clouds he took his heavenward flight. With speed he came to great Olympus' heights, the abode of gods, and sitting by the throne of Saturn's son, with anguish torn, he showed the immortal stream that trickled from the wound, and thus to Jove his piteous words addressed. O oh, Father Jove, canst thou behold, unmoved, these acts of violence? The greatest ills we gods endure, we each to other owe, who still in human quarrels interpose. Of thee we all complain, thy senseless child is ever on some evil deed intent. The other gods, who on Olympus dwell, are all to thee obedient and submiss, but thy pernicious daughter, nor by word nor deed dost thou restrain, who now excites the o'erbearing son of Tydeus, Diomed, upon the immortal gods to vent his rage. Venus, of late, he wounded in the wrist, and as a god, but now encountered me. Barely I escaped by swiftness of my feet, else mid a ghastly heap of corpses slain, in anguish had I lain, and, if alive, yet lived disabled, 
by his weapons stroke? Whom answered thus the cloud compeller Jove with look indignant? Come no more to me, thou wavering turncoat, with thy whining prayers. Of all the gods who on Olympus dwell, I hate thee most, for thou delightst in naught but strife and war. Thou hast inherited thy mother Juno's proud, unbending mood, whom I can scarce control. And thou, methinks, to her suggestions owest thy present plight? Yet, since thou art my offspring, and to me thy mother bore thee, I must not permit that thou shouldst long be doomed to suffer pain. But had thy birth been other than it is, for thy misdoings thou hadst long ere now been banished from the gods' companionship. He said, and straight to Pian gave command to heal the wound. With soothing anodynes, he healed it quickly. Soon as liquid milk is curdled by the fig tree's juice and turns in whirling flakes, so soon was healed the wound. By Hebe bathed and robed afresh, he sat in health and strength restored by Saturn's son. Mars, thus arrested in his murderous course, together to the abode of Jove returned the queen of Argus and the blue-eyed maid. Book 6 Argument The Episodes of Glaucus and Diomed and of Hector and Andromache. The gods having left the field, the Grecians prevail. Helenus, the chief augur of Troy, commands Hector to return to the city in order to appoint a solemn procession of the queen and the Trojan matrons to the temple of Minerva to entreat her to remove Diomed from the fight. The battle relaxing during the absence of Hector, Glaucus and Diomed have an interview between the two armies where, coming to the knowledge of the friendship and hospitality passed between their ancestors, they make exchange of their arms. Hector, having performed the orders of Hellenus, prevailed upon Paris to return to the battle and, taken a tender leave of his wife Andromache, hastens again to the field. The scene is first in the field of battle between the rivers Simois and Scamander, and then changes to Troy. The gods had left the field, and o'er the plain hither and thither surged the tide of war, as couched the opposing chiefs their brass-tipped spears midway twixt Simois and Scamander's streams. First through the Trojan phalanx broke his way, the son of Telamon, the prop of Greece, the mighty Ajax, on his friends the light of triumph shedding, as Eusorus' son he smote, the noblest of the Thracian bands, valiant and strong, the gallant Achilles. Full in the front, beneath the plumed helm, the sharp spear struck, and crashing through the bone, the warrior's eyes were closed in endless night. Next, valiant Diomed, Axylus, slew the son of Teuthrenes, who had his home in fair Arispa, rich in substance he, and loved of all. For, dwelling near the road, he oped to all his hospitable gate. But none of all he entertained was there to ward aside the bitter doom of death. There fell they both, he and his charioteer, Calesius, who 
athwart the battlefield his chariot drove. One fate o'ertook them both. Then Drusus and Opheltius of the armed Euryalus despoiled his hot pursuit. Deceipus next, and Pedasus assailed, brothers whom a Barbaria Nyad nymph to bold Bucalion bore. Bucalion, son of great Laomedon, his eldest born, though bastard. He upon the mountainside on which his flocks he tended, met the nymph, and of their secret loves, twin sons were born. Whom now at once Euryalus of strength and life deprived, and of their armor stripped. By Polypetes' hand, in battle strong was slain Astyrus. Pidites fell, chief of Percote, by Ulysses' spear, and Teucer, godlike Ereteon, slew. Antilochus, the son of Nestor, smote with gleaming lance Aeneas. Elatus by Agamemnon, king of men, was slain. Who dwelt by Sedneus' wildly flowing stream upon the lofty heights of Pegasus? By Leitus was Philocus in flight or tame. Eurypolis, Melampus slew. Then Menelaus, good in battle, took Adrastus captive, for his horses, scared and rushing wildly o'er the plain, amid the tangled tamarisk scrub, his chariot broke, snapping a pole. They, with the flying crowd, held cityward their course. He, from the car, hurled headlong, prostrate, lay beside the wheel, prone on his face in dust, and at his side, poising his mighty spear, Atreides stood. Adrastus clasped his knees, and suppliant cried, Spare me, great son of Atreus, for my life, accept a price. My wealthy father's house, a goodly store contains of brass and gold, and well-wrought iron, and of these he fain would pay a noble ransom, could he hear that in the Grecian ships I yet survived. His words to pity moved the victor's breast. Then had he bade his followers to the ships a captive bear, but running up in haste, fierce Agamemnon cried in stern rebuke, Soft-hearted Menelaus, why of life so tender? Hath thy house received, indeed, nothing but benefits at Trojan hands? Of that abhorred race, let not a man escape the deadly vengeance of our arms. No, not the infant in its mother's womb. No, nor the fugitive. But be they all, they and their city, utterly destroyed, uncared for, and from memory blotted out. Thus as he spoke, his counsel fraught with death, his brother's purpose changed. He with his hand Adrastus thrust aside, whom with his lance fierce Agamemnon through the loins transfixed. And as he rolled in death upon his breast, planting his foot, the ashen spear withdrew. Then loudly Nestor shouted to the Greeks, Friends, Grecian heroes, ministers of Mars, loiter not now behind to throw yourselves upon the prey and bear it to the ships. Let all your aim be now to kill. Anon ye may at leisure spoil your slaughtered foes. With words like these, he fired the blood of all. 
Now had the Trojans, by the warlike Greeks, In coward flight within their walls been driven. But to Aeneas, and to Hector thus, The son of Priam, Helenus, The best of all the Trojan seers, Addressed his speech. Aeneas, and thou, Hector, Since on you of all the Trojans and the Lycian hosts Is laid the heaviest burthen, For that ye excel alike in counsel and in fight, Stand here a while, and moving to and fro, On every side, around the gates, Exhort the troops to rally, Lest they fall disgraced, Flying for safety to their women's arms, and foes, exulting triumph in their shame. Their courage thus restored, worn as we are, we with the Greeks will still maintain the fight, for so, perforce, we must. But Hector, thou haste to the city, there our mother find, both thine and mine. On Ilium's topmost height, by all the aged dames accompanied, Bid her the shrine of blue-eyed Pallas seek. Unlock the sacred gates, and on the knees of fair-haired Pallas Place the fairest robe in all the house, the amplest, best esteemed, And at her altar vow to sacrifice twelve yearling kind That never felt the gold. So she have pity on the Trojan state, Our wives and helpless babes, And turn away the fiery son of Tydeus, Spearman fierce, the minister of terror, Bravest he, in my esteem, Of all the Grecian chiefs. For not Achilles' self, the prince of men, Though goddess-born, such dread inspired. So fierce his rage, and with his prowess none may vie. He said, nor uncomplying, Hector heard his brother's counsel. From the car he leaped in arms upon the plain, And brandished high his javelins king. And moving to and fro, the troops encouraged And restored the fight. Rallying, they turned and faced again the Greeks. These ceased from slaughter, and in turn gave way, deeming that from the starry heaven some god had to the rescue come. So fierce they turned. Then to the Trojans Hector called aloud, Ye valiant Trojans, and renowned allies, Quit you like men. Remember now, brave friends, your wanted valor. I to Ilium go, to bid our wives and reverend elders Raise to heaven their prayers with vows of hecatombs. Thus saying, Hector of the glancing helm turned to depart, and as he moved along, the black bull's hide, his neck and ankles smote, the outer circle of his bossy shield. Then Tydeus' son, and Glaucus in the midst, son of Hippolochus, stood forth to fight. But when they near were met, to Glaucus first, the valiant Diomed, his speech addressed, Who art thou, boldest man of mortal birth? For in the glorious conflict heretofore I ne'er have seen thee, But in daring now thou far surpassest all Who hast not feared to face my spear. Of most unhappy sires, the children, they whom I encounter meet. But if from heaven thou comest, and art indeed a god, I fight not with the heavenly powers. Not long did Dryas' son, Lycurgus brave, survive, 
who dared the immortals to defy. He mid their frantic orgies in the groves of lovely Nysa put to shameful bout the youthful Bacchus' nurses. They in fear dropped each her thyrsus, scattered by the hand of fierce Lycurgus, with an ox goad on. Bacchus himself, beneath the ocean wave in terror, plunged, and trembling, refuge found in Thetis' bosom from a mortal's threats. The gods indignant saw and Saturn's son smote him with blindness, nor survived he long, hated alike by all the immortal gods. I dare not then the blessed gods oppose, but be thou mortal, and the fruits of earth thy food, approach and quickly meet thy doom. Whom the noble Glaucus thus replied, Great son of Tydeus, why my race inquire? The race of man is as the race of leaves. Of leaves one generation by the wind is scattered on the earth, another soon in spring's luxuriant verdure bursts to light. So with our race, these flourish, those decay. But if thou wouldst in truth inquire and learn the race I spring from, not unknown of men, there is a city in the deep recess of pastoral Argos, Ephyri by name. There Sisyphus of old his dwelling had, of mortal men the craftiest, Sisyphus, the son of Aeolus. To him was born Glaucus, and Glaucus in his turn begot Bellerophon, on whom the gods bestowed the gifts of beauty and of manly grace. But Cretus sought his death, and mightier far from all the coasts of Argos drove him forth, to Cretus subjected by Jove's decree. For him, the monarch's wife, Antia, nursed a maddening passion, and to guilty love would fain have tempted him, but failed to move the upright soul of chaste Bellerophon. With lying words she then addressed the king, Die, Pretus, thou, or slay Bellerophon, who basely sought my honor to assail. The king with anger listened to her words. Slay him he would not, that his soul abhorred. But to the father of his wife, the king of Lycia, sent him forth with tokens charged of dire import on folded tablets traced, poisoning the monarch's mind to work his death. To Lycia, guarded by the gods, he went. But when he came to Lycia, and the streams of Xanthus, there with hospitable rites, the king of widespread Lycia welcomed him. Nine days he feasted him, nine oxen slew. But with the tenth return of rosy morn, he questioned him, and for the tokens asked, he, from his son-in-law, from Cretus, bore. The token's fatal import understood, he bade him first the dread Chimera slay, a monster sent from heaven, not human born, with head of lion and a serpent's tail and body of a goat, and from her mouth there issued flames of fiercely burning fire. Yet her confiding in the gods he slew. Next with the valiant Solomai he fought, the fiercest fight that e'er he undertook. Thirdly, the women warriors he o'erthrew, the Amazons, from whom, returning home, the king another stratagem devised. 
for choosing out of the best of Lycius' sons, he set an ambush. They returned not home, for all by brave Bellerophon were slain. But by his valor, when the king perceived his heavenly birth, he entertained him well, gave him his daughter, and with her the half of all his royal honors he bestowed, a portion to the Lycians meted out, fertile in corn and wine, of all the state the choicest land to be his heritage. Three children there to brave Bellerophon were born, Isander and Hippolochus, Laodamia last, beloved of Jove, the lord of council, and to him she bore godlike Sarpedon, the brazen helm. Bellerophon, at length, the wrath incurred of all the gods, and to the Elenian plain alone he wandered. There he wore away his soul, and shunned the busy haunts of men. Insatiate Mars, his son Isander slew in battle with the valiant Solomon. His daughter perished by Diana's wrath. I from Hippolochus my birth derived. To Troy he sent me, and enjoined me off to aim at highest honors and surpass my comrades all nor on my father's name discredit bring, who held the foremost place in Ephyre, and Lycia's wide domain. Such is my race, and such the blood I boast. He said, and Diomed, rejoicing, heard. His spear he planted in the fruitful ground, and thus with friendly words the chief addressed. By ancient ties of friendship are we bound, for godlike Enus in his house received for twenty days the brave Bellerophon. They many a gift of friendship interchanged, a belt with crimson glowing Enus gave. Bellerophon, a double cup of gold, which in my house I left when here I came. Of Tydeus no remembrance I retain, for yet a child he left me when he fell with his Achaeans at the gate of Thebes. So I, in Argos, am thy friendly host, thou mine in Lycia when I thither come. Then shun we, e'en amid the thickest fight, each other's lance. Enough there are for me of Trojans and their brave allies to kill, as heaven may aid me, and my speed of foot. And Greeks enough there are for thee to slay, if so indeed thou canst. But let us now our armor interchange, that these may know what friendly bonds of old our houses join. Thus, as they spoke, they quitted each his car, clasped hand in hand, and plighted mutual faith. Then Glaucus of his judgment Jove deprived, his armor interchanging gold for brass, a hundred oxen's worth for that of nine. Meanwhile, when Hector reached the oak beside the Sean Gate, around him thronged the wives of Troy and daughters, anxious to inquire the fate of children, brothers, husbands, friends. He to the gods exhorted all to pray, for deep the sorrows that are many hung. But when to Priam's splendid house he came, with polished corridors adorned, Within were fifty chambers, all of polished stone, placed each by other. There the fifty sons of Priam with their wedded wives reposed. On the other side, within the court, were built twelve chambers, near the roof, of polished stone, placed each by other. There 
the sons-in-law of Priam, with their spouses chaste reposed. To meet him there his tender mother came, and with her led the young Laodice, fairest of all her daughters. Clasping then his hands, she thus addressed him, Why, my son, why comest thou here, and leavest the battlefield? Are Trojans by those hateful sons of Greece, fighting round the city, sorely pressed? And comest thou, by thy spirit moved, to raise on Ilium's heights thy hands in prayer to Jove? But tarry till I bring the luscious wine, that first to Jove and to the immortals all thou mayst thine offering pour, then with the draught thyself thou mayst refresh. For great the strength which generous wine imparts to men who toil, as thou hast toiled, thy comrades to protect. To whom great Hector of the glancing helm no, not for me, mine honored mother, pour the luscious wine, lest thou unnerve my limbs, and make me all my wanted prowess lose. The ruddy wine I dare not pour to Jove with hands unwashed, nor to the cloud-girt son of Saturn may the voice of prayer ascend, from one with blood bespattered and defiled. Thou. With the elder women seek the shrine of Pallas, bring your gifts, and on the knees of fair-haired Pallas place the fairest robe in all the house, the amplest, best esteemed, and at her altar vow to sacrifice twelve yearling kine that never felt the goad, so she have pity on the Trojan state, our wives and helpless babes and turn away the fiery son of Tydeus, spearman fierce, the minister of terror, to the shrine of Pallas thou. To Paris I to call, if haply he will hear. Would that the earth would gape and swallow him, for great the curse that Jove through him hath brought on men of Troy, on noble Priam, and on Priam's sons. Could I but know that he were in his grave, methinks my sorrows I could half forget. He said, She, to the house returning, sent the attendants through the city to collect the train of aged suppliants. She, meanwhile, her fragrant chamber sought wherein were stored rich garments by Sidonian women were, whom godlike Paris had from Sidon brought, sailing the broad sea o'er, the selfsame path by which the high-born Helen he conveyed. Of these the richest in embroidery, the amplest and the brightest, as a star refulgent, placed with care beneath the rest, Queen, her offering bore to Pallas's shrine. She went, and with her many an ancient dame. But when the shrine they reached on Ilium's height, Theano, fair of face, the gates unlocked. Daughter of Sisius, sage Antenor's wife, by Trojans named at Pallas's shrine to serve, they, with deep moans to Pallas, raised their hands. But fair Theano took the robe and placed on Pallas's knees, and to the heavenly maid, daughter of Jove, she thus addressed her prayer. Guardian of cities, Pallas, awful queen, goddess of goddesses, Break thou the spear of Tydeus' son, and grant that he himself, prostrate before the sea and gates, may fall. So at thine altar will we sacrifice twelve yearling kine that never felt the goad, if thou have pity on the state of Troy, the wives of Trojans, and their hopeless babes. 
thus she, but Pallas answered not her prayer. While thus they called upon the heavenly maid, Hector to Paris's mansion bent his way, a noble structure which himself had built, aided by all the best artificers who in the fertile realm of Troy were known. With chambers, hall, and court, on Ilium's height, near to where Priam's self and Hector dwelt, there entered Hector, well beloved of Jove, and in his hand his ponderous spear he bore, twelve cubits long. Bright flashed the weapon's point of polished brass, with circling hoop of gold. There in his chamber found he whom he sought, about his armor busied, polishing his shield, his breastplate, and his bended bow, while Argive Helen, mid her maidens, placed the skillful labors of their hands, or looked. To him thus Hector, with reproachful words, Thou dost not well thine anger to indulge. In battle round the city's lofty wall, the people fast are falling. Thou the cause that fiercely thus around the city burns the flame of war and battle, and thyself wouldst others blame who from the fight should shrink? Up, ere the town be wrapped in hostile fires! To whom in answer godlike Paris thus, Hector, I own not causeless thy rebuke, yet will I speak, hear thou and understand. T'was less from anger with the Trojan hosts, and fierce resentment, that I here remained, than that I sought my sorrow to indulge. Yet hath my wife, e'en now with soothing words, urged me to join the battle, so I own, were best, and victory changes oft her side. Then stay while I my armor don, or thou go first. I, following, will o'ertake thee soon. He said, but Hector of the glancing helm made answer none. Then thus with gentle tones Helen accosted him. Dear brother mine, of me degraded, sorrow bringing vile, O oh, that the day my mother gave me birth, Some storm had on the mountains cast me forth, Or that the many dashing ocean's waves Had swept me off, ere all this woe were wrought. Yet if these evils were of heaven ordained, would that a better man had called me wife, a sounder judge of honor and disgrace? For he, thou knowest, no firmness hath of mind, nor ever will, a want he well may rue. But come thou in, and rest thee here a while, dear brother, on this couch, for travail sore encompass thy soul by me imposed, degraded as I am, and Paris's guilt, on whom this burthen heaven hath laid, that shame on both our names through years to come shall rest. To whom great Hector of the glancing helm, though kind thy wish, yet, Helen, ask me not to sit or rest, I cannot yield to thee, for to the succor of our friends I haste, who feel my loss, and sorely need my aid. But thou, thy husband, rouse, and let him speed, that he may find me still within the walls, for I too homeward go, to see once more my household, and my wife, and infant child, for whether I may e'er again return, 
I know not. Or if heaven have so decreed that I this day by Grecian hands should fall. Thus saying, Hector of the glancing helm turned to depart. With rapid step he reached his own well-furnished house, but found not there his white-armed spouse, the fair Andromache. She, with her infant child and maid the while, was standing, bathed in tears, in bitter grief, on Ilium's topmost tower. But when her lord found not within the house his peerless wife, upon the threshold pausing, thus he spoke. Tell me, my maidens, tell me true, which way your mistress went, the fair Andromache, or to my sisters, or my brother's wives, or to the temple where the fair-haired dames of Troy invoke Minerva's awful name. To whom the matron of his house replied, Hector, if truly we must answer thee, nor to thy sisters, nor thy brother's wives, nor to the temple where the fair-haired dames of Troy invoke Minerva's awful name, but to the height of Ilium's topmost tower Andromache is gone. Since tidings came, the Trojan force was overmatched, and great the Grecian strength, whereat, like one distract, she hurried to the walls, and with her took, born in the nurse's arms, her infant child. So spoke the ancient dame, and Hector straight through the wide streets his rapid steps retraced. But when at last the mighty city's length was traversed, and the sea and gates were reached, whence was the outlet to the plain, in haste running to meet him came his priceless wife, Aeacian's daughter, fair Andromache. Aeacian, who from Thebes Cilicia swayed, Thebes, at the foot of Placos's wooded height, his child to Hector of the brazen helm was given in marriage. She it was who now met him, and by her side the nurse who bore, clasped to her breast, his all unconscious child, Hector's loved infant, fair as morning star, whom Hector called Scamandrius, but the rest Astyanax, in honor of his sire, the matchless chief, the only prop of Troy. Silent he smiled, as on his boy he gazed. But at his side, Andromache, in tears, hung on his arm, and thus the chief addressed, Dear Lord, thy dauntless spirit will work thy doom, nor hast thou pity on this, thy helpless child, or me, forlorn, to be thy widow soon. For thee will all the Greeks, with force combined, assail and slay. For me, twere better far of thee bereft to lie beneath the sod, nor comfort shall be mine if thou be lost, but endless grief. To me nor sire is left, nor honored mother. Fell Achilles' hand, my sire Aeacian slew, what time his arms the populous city of Cilicia raised, the lofty-gated Thebes. He slew indeed, but stripped him not, he reverenced the dead and o'er his body, with his armor burnt, a mound erected, and by the mountain nymphs, the progeny of Aegis-bearing Jove, planted around his tomb a grove of elms. There were seven brethren in my father's house. All in one day they fell, amid their herds and fleecy flocks, by fierce Achilles' hand, my mother, Queen of Placus wooded height, brought with the captives here. 
he soon released for costly ransom. But by Diane's shafts, she in her father's house was stricken down. But Hector, thou to me art all in one, sire, mother, brethren, thou my wedded love. Then, pitying us, within the tower remain, nor make thy child an orphan, and thy wife a hapless widow. By the fig tree here array thy troops, for here the city wall, easiest of access, most invites assault. Thrice have their boldest chiefs this point assailed. The two Aegises, brave Idomeneus, the Atridae both, and Tydeus, warlike son, or by the prompting of some heaven-taught seer, or by their own adventurous courage led. To whom great Hector of the glancing helm, Think not, dear wife, that by such thoughts as these my heart has ne'er been wrung, but I should blush to face the men and long-robed dames of Troy if, like a coward, I could shun the fight. Nor could my soul the lessons of my youth so far forget, whose boast it still has been in the forefront of battle to be found, charged with my father's glory and mine own. Yet in my inmost soul too well I know the day must come when this our sacred Troy and Priam's race and Priam's royal self shall in one common ruin be overthrown. But not the thoughts of Troy's impending fate, nor Hecuba's, nor royal Priam's woes, nor loss of brethren numerous and brave by hostile hands laid prostrate in the dust, so deeply wring my heart as thoughts of thee, thy days of freedom lost and led away, a weeping captive by some brass-clad Greek, haply an Argos, at a mistress's beck, condemned to ply the loom, or water draw from Hyperesia's or Messia's fount, heart wrung by stern necessity constrained. Then they who see thy tears perchance may say, Lo, this was Hector's wife, who, when they fought on plains of Troy, was Ilium's bravest chief. Thus may they speak, and thus thy grief renew, for loss of him, who might have been thy shield, to rescue thee from slavery's bitter hour. Oh, may I sleep in dust, ere be condemned to hear thy cries, and see thee dragged away. Thus, as he spoke, great Hector stretched his arms to take his child, but back the infant shrank, crying, and sought his nurse's sheltering breast, scared by the brazen helm and horsehair plume that nodded fearful on the warrior's crest. <laughs> Laughed the fond parents both, and from his brow Hector the cask removed, and set it down, all glittering on the ground. Then kissed his child, and danced him in his arms. Then thus to Jove and to the immortals all addressed his prayer. Grant, Jove, and all ye gods, that this my son may be as I, the foremost man of Troy, for valor fame, his country's guardian king, that men may say, this youth surpasses far his father, when they see him from the fight, from slaughtered foes, with bloody spoils of war, returning to rejoice his mother's heart. 
thus saying, in his mother's arms he placed his child. She to her fragrant bosom clasped, smiling through tears with eyes of pitying love. Hector beheld and pressed her hand, and thus addressed her. Dearest, wring not thus my heart, for till my day of destiny is come, no man may take my life, and when it comes, nor brave nor coward can escape that day. But go thou home, and ply thy household cares, the loom and distaff, and appoint thy maids their several tasks, and leave to men of Troy, and chief of all, to me, the toils of war. Great Hector said, and raised his plumed helm, and homeward slow, with oft reverted eyes, shedding hot tears, his sorrowing wife returned. Arrived at valiant Hector's well-built house, her maidens pressed around her, and in all arose at once the sympathetic grief. For Hector, yet alive, his household mourned, deeming he never would again return, safe from the fight by Grecian hands unharmed. Nor lingered Paris in his lofty halls, but donned his armor, glittering o'er with brass, and through the city passed with bounding steps. As some proud steed, that well-filled manger fed, his halter broken, neighing, scours the plain, and revels in the widely flowing stream to bathe his sides, then tossing high his head, while o'er his shoulders streams his ample mane, light borne on active limbs, in conscious pride, to the wide pastures of the mares he flies. So Paris, Priam's son, from Ilium's height, his bright arms flashing like the gorgeous sun, hastened with boastful mien and rapid step. Hector he found, as from the spot he turned, where with his wife he late had converse held. Whom thus the godlike Paris first addressed, Too long, good brother, art then here detained, impatient for the fight, by my delay. Nor have I, timely, as thou bad'st me, come. To whom thus Hector of the glancing helm? My gallant brother, none who thinks aright can cavil at thy prowess in the field, for thou art very valiant. But thy will is weak and sluggish, and it grieves my heart when from the Trojans, who in thy behalf such labors undergo, I hear thy name coupled with foul reproach. But go we now, henceforth shall all be well, if Jove permit that from our shores we drive the invading Greeks, and to the ever-living gods of heaven in peaceful homes our free libations pour. Book 7 Argument. The single combat of Hector and Ajax. The battle renewing with double ardor upon the return of Hector, Minerva is under apprehension for the Greeks. Apollo, seeing her descends from Olympus, joins her near the Sean Gate. They agree to put off the general engagement for that day, and incite Hector to challenge the Greeks to a single combat. Nine of the princes accepting the challenge, the lot is cast and falls upon Ajax. 
these heroes, after several attacks, are parted by the night. The Trojans, calling a council, Antenor proposes the delivery of Helen to the Greeks, to which Paris will not consent, but offers to restore them her riches. Priam sends a herald to make this offer, and to demand truce for burning the dead, the last of which only is agreed to by Agamemnon. When the funerals are performed, the Greeks, pursuant to the advice of Nestor, erect a fortification to protect their fleet and camp, flanked with towers and defended by a ditch and palisades. Neptune testifies his jealousy at this work, but is pacified by a promise from Jupiter. Both armies pass the night in feasting, but Jupiter disheartens the Trojans with thunder and other signs of his wrath. The three and twentieth day ends with the duel of Hector and Ajax. The next day the truce is agreed. Another is taken up in the funeral rites of the slain, and one more in building the fortification before the ships. So that's somewhat. Above three days is employed in this book. The scene lies wholly in the field. Thus, as he spoke, from out the city gates, the noble Hector passed, and by his side his brother Paris. In the breast of both burns the fierce ardor of the battlefield. As when some god a favoring breeze bestows on seamen tugging at the well-worn oar, faint with excess of toil, even so appeared these brethren twain to Troy's or labored host. Then to their prowess fell, by Paris's hand, Menestheus, royal Arithuus' son, whom to the king in honor where he dwelt, the stag-eyed dame Philomedusa bore, while Hector smote with well-directed spear beneath the brass-bound headpiece through the throat Diomedes, and slacked his limbs in death. And Glaucus, leader of the Lycian bands, son of Hippolochus, amid the fray, Iphinous, son of Dexius, born on high by two fleet mares upon a lofty car, pierced through the shoulder. From the car he fell, prone to the earth, his limbs relaxed in death. But then, when Pallas saw, amid the fray, Stealing destruction on the hosts of Greece. From high Olympus to the walls of Troy she came in haste. Apollo there she found, as down he looked from Ilium's topmost tower, devising victory to the arms of Troy. Beside the oak they met. Apollo first, the son of Jove, the colloquy began. Daughter of Jove, from great Olympus's heights, why comest thou here, by angry passion led? Wouldst thou the victory, swaying here and there, give to the Greeks? Since pitiless thou seest the Trojans slaughtered, be advised by me, for so twere better. Cause we for today the rage of battle and of war to cease. Tomorrow morn shall see the fight renewed until the close of Ilium's destiny. For so ye goddesses have wrought your will that this fair city should in ruin fall. To whom the blue-eyed goddess thus replied, so be it, Archer King, with like intent I from Olympus came. But say, what means wilt thou devise to bid the conflict cease? To whom Apollo, royal son of Jove? The might of valiant Hector let us move, to challenge to the combat, man to man, some Grecian warrior 
while the brass-clad Greeks their champion urge the challenge to accept, and godlike Hector meet in single fight. He said, nor did Minerva not assent. But Helenus, the son of Priam, knew the secret counsel by the gods devised. And, drawing near to Hector, thus he spoke, Hector, thou son of Priam, sage as Jove in counsel, hearken to a brother's words. Bid that the Greeks and Trojans all sit down, and thou defy the boldest of the Greeks with thee in single combat to contend. By revelation from the eternal gods, I know that here thou shalt not meet thy fate. He said, and Hector joyed to hear his words. Forth in the midst he stepped, and with his spear grasped in the middle, stayed the Trojan ranks. With one accord they sat. On the other side, Atrides bade the well-grieved Greeks sit down, while in the likeness of two vultures sat on the tall oak of Aegis-bearing Jove, Pallas, and Phoebus of the Silver Bow, with heroes' deeds delighted. Dense around bristled the ranks with shield and helm and spear, as when the west wind freshly blows and brings a darkening ripple o'er the ocean waves, e'en so appeared upon the plain the ranks of Greeks and Trojans. Standing in the midst, thus to both armies, noble Hector spoke, Hear, all ye Trojans, and ye well-grieved Greeks, the words I speak, the prompting of my soul. It hath not pleased the high-throned Saturnian Jove to ratify our truce, who both afflicts with labors hard, till either ye shall take our well-fenced city, or yourselves to us succumb beside your ocean-going ships. Here have ye all the chiefest men of Greece. Of all, let him who dares with me to fight stand forth, and godlike Hector's might confront. And this I say, and call to witness Jove, if with the sharp-edged spear he vanquish me, he shall strip off and to the hollow ships in triumph bear my armor. But my corpse... Restore, that's so the men and wives of Troy. May deck with honors due my funeral pyre. But by Apollo's grace, should I prevail, I will his arms strip off and bear to Troy, and in Apollo's temple hang on high. But to the ships his corpse I will restore, that so the long-haired Greeks with solemn rites may bury him, and to his memory raise by the broad Hellespont a lofty tomb. And men in days to come shall say, who urged their full-oared bark across the dark blue sea, Lo, there, a warrior's tomb of days gone by, a mighty chief whom glorious Hector slew. Thus shall they say, and thus my fame shall live. Thus Hector spoke. They all in silence heard, shamed to refuse, but fearful to accept. At length, in anger, Menelaus rose, groaning in spirit, and with bitter words reproached them. Shame, ye braggart cowards! Shame! Women of Greece, I cannot call you men. T'were foul disgrace, indeed, 
and scorn on scorn. Give Hector's challenge, none of all the Greeks should dare accept. To dust and water turn all ye who here in glorious heartless sit. I will myself confront him. For success, the immortal gods above the issues hold. Thus, as he spoke, he donned his dazzling arms. Then, Menelaus, had thine end approached by Hector's hands, so much the stronger he, had not the kings withheld thee and restrained. Great Agamemnon's self, wide-ruling king, seizing his hand, addressed him thus by name. What? Heaven-born Menelaus, art thou mad? Beseems thee not such folly, curb thy wrath. Though vexed, nor think with Hector to contend, thy better far, inspiring dread in all. From his encounter in the glorious fight, superior far to thee, Achilles shrinks. But thou, amid thy comrades' ranks, retire. Some other champion will the Greeks provide. And, fearless as he is, and of the fight, insatiate, yet will Hector, should he scape unwounded from the deadly battle strife, be fain, methinks, to rest his weary limbs. He said, and with judicious counsel swayed his brother's mind. He yielded to his words, and gladly his attendants doffed his arms. Then Nestor rose, and thus addressed the Greeks, Alas, alas, what shame is this for Greece? What grief would fill the aged Peleus' soul, sage chief in council, of the Myrmidons' leader approved, who often in his house would question me, and loved from me to hear of all the Greeks, the race and pedigree. Could he but learn how Hector cowed them all? He to the gods with hands upraised would pray his soul might from his body be divorced and sink beneath the earth. Oh, would to Jove, to Pallas and Apollo, such were now my vigorous youth, as when beside the banks of swiftly flowing Celidon, the men of Pylos with the Arcadian spearmen fought by Phaea's walls round the Odinus streams. Then, from the ranks, in likeness as a god, advanced their champion, Eruthalian bold. The arms of Erythuus he wore, of godlike Erythuus, whom men and richly girdled women had surnamed the Mace-Bearer, for not with sword or bow he went to fight, but with an iron mace broke through the squadrons. Him Lycurgus slew, by stealth not bravery, in a narrow way, where not availed his iron mace from death to save him, or Lycurgus with his spear Preventing thrust him through the midst, he fell prostrate, and from his breast the victor stripped his armor off, the gift of brass-clad Mars, and in the tug of war he wore it oft. But when Lycurgus felt the approach of age, he to his faithful follower and friend to a Euthalian gave it, therewith armed he now to combat challenged all the chiefs. None dared except, for fear had fallen on all. Then I, with dauntless spirit, his might opposed, 
the youngest of them all. With him I fought, and Pallas gave the victory to my arm. Him there I slew, the tallest, strongest man, for many another there beside him lay. Would that my youth and strength were now the same, then soon should Hector of the glancing helm a willing champion find. But ye of Greece, the foremost men with Hector fear to fight. The old man spoke reproachful. At his words uprose nine warriors. Far before the rest, the monarch Agamemnon, king of men. Next, Tydeus' son, the valiant Diomed. The two Aegises clothed with courage high. Idomeneus, and of Idomeneus, the faithful follower, brave Meriones, equal in fight to blood-stained Mars. With these, Eurypylus, Eumene's noble son. Tossus, and Dremon's son, Ulysses, last. These all, with Hector, offered to contend. Then, thus again, Gerenian Nestor spoke. Shake then the lots, on whomsoe'er it fall, great profit shall he bring to Grecian arms, great glory to himself, if he escape unwounded from the deadly battle strife. He said, each marked his several lot, and all together threw in Agamemnon's helm. The crowd, with hands uplifted, prayed the gods, and looking heavenward said, Grant, Father Jove, the lot on Ajax, or on Tydeus' son, or on Mycenae's wealthy king, may fall. Thus they. Then aged Nestor shook the helm, and forth, according to their wish, was thrown the lot of Ajax. Then from left to right a herald showed to all the chiefs of Greece, in turn, the token. They who knew it not disclaimed it all, but when to him he came, who marked and threw it in Atrides' helm, the noble Ajax, and, approaching, placed the token in his outstretched hand, forthwith he knew it, and rejoiced. Before his feet he threw it down upon the ground, and said, O oh, friends, the lot is mine, great is my joy, and hope o'er godlike Hector to prevail. But now, while I my warlike armor don, Pray. ye to Saturn's royal son, apart, in silence, that the Trojans hear ye not, or even aloud, for naught have we to fear. No man against my will can make me fly by greater force or skill, nor will I hope my inexperience in the field disgrace the teaching of my native Salamis. Thus he, and they to Saturn's royal son, addressed their prayers, and looking heavenward said, O Father Jove, who rulest on Ida's height, most great, most glorious. Grant that Ajax now may gain the victory and immortal praise. Or if thy love and pity Hector claim, give equal power and equal praise to both. Ajax, meanwhile in dazzling brass, was clad, and when his armor all was duly donned, Forward he moved, as
as when gigantic Mars leads nations forth to war, whom Saturn's son in life-destroying conflict hath involved. So moved the giant Ajax, prop of Greece, with sternly smiling mien, with haughty stride he trod the plain, and poised his ponderous spear. The Greeks, rejoicing on their champion, gazed. The Trojans' limbs beneath them shook with fear. Even Hector's heart beat quicker in his breast. Yet quail he must not now, nor back retreat amid his comrades. He, the challenger! Ajax approached. Before him, as a tower, his mighty shield he bore, sevenfold, brass bound, the work of Tycheus, best artificer that wrought in leather. In highly dwelt. Of sevenfold hides the ponderous shield was wrought, of lusty bulls. The eighth was glittering brass. This by the son of Telamon was born before his breast. To Hector close he came, and thus with words of haughty menace spoke. Hector, I now shall teach thee, man to man, the metal of the chiefs we yet possess, although Achilles of the lion heart, mighty in battle, be not with us still, he, by his ocean-going ships, indeed against Atreides, nurses still his wrath. Yet there are those who dare encounter thee, and not a few. Then now begin the fight. To whom great Hector of the glancing helm, Ajax, brave leader, Son of Telamon, deal not with me as with a feeble child, or woman ignorant of the ways of war. Of war and carnage every point I know, and well I know to wield, now right, now left, the tough bull's hide that forms my stubborn targ. Well know I too my fiery steeds to urge, and raise the war cry in the standing fight. But not in secret ambush would I watch to strike, by stealth, a noble foe like thee, but slay thee, if I may, in open fight. He said, and, poising, hurled his ponderous spear. The brazen covering of the shield it struck, the outward fold, the eighth above the seven of tough bull's hide. Through six it drove its way with stubborn force, but in the seventh was stayed. Then Ajax hurled in turn his ponderous spear, and struck the circle true of Hector's shield. Right through the glittering shield the stout spear passed and through the well-wrought breastplate drove its way, and underneath the linen vest it tore. But Hector, stooping, shunned the stroke of death. Withdrawing then their weapons, each on each they fell, like lions fierce or tusked boars, in strength the mightiest of the forest beasts. Then Hector fairly on the center struck the stubborn shield, yet drove not through the spear, for the stout brass the blunted point repelled. But Ajax, with a forward bound, the shield of Hector pierced, right through the weapon passed, arrested with rude shock the warrior's course, and grazed his neck that spouted forth the blood. Yet did not Hector of the glancing helm flinch from the contest. Stooping to the ground, with his broad hand a ponderous stone, 
he seized that lay upon the plain, dark, jagged, and huge, and hurled it against the sevenfold shield, and struck full on the central boss. Loud rang the brass. Then Ajax raised a weightier mass of rock, and sent it whirling, giving to his arm unmeasured impulse. With a millstone's weight it crushed the buckler. Hector's knees gave way. Backward he staggered, yet upon his shield sustained, till Phoebus raised him to his feet. Now had they hand to hand with swords engaged, had not the messengers of gods and men, the heralds interposed, the one for Troy, the other umpire for the brass-clad Greeks, Talthybius and Ideus, well approved. Between the chiefs they held their wands, and thus Ideus, both with prudent speech addressed, no more, brave youths, no longer wage the fight. To cloud-compelling Jove ye both are dear, both valiant spearmen. That we all have seen. Night is at hand, behooves us yield to night. Whom answered thus the son of Telamon? Ideas, bid that Hector speak those words. He challenged all our chiefs, let him begin. If he be willing, I shall not refuse. To whom great Hector of the glancing helm. Ajax, since God hath given thee size and strength and skill, and with the spear of all the Greeks, None is thine equal. Cease we for today the fight. Hereafter we may meet, and heaven decide our cause, and one with victory crown. Night is at hand, behooves us yield to night. So by the ships shalt thou rejoice the Greeks, and most of all, thy comrades and thy friends. And so shall I in Priam's royal town rejoice the men of Troy and long-robed dames who shall with grateful prayers the temples throng. But make we now an interchange of gifts that both the Trojans and the Greeks may say on mortal quarrel did those warriors meet Yet parted thence in friendly bonds conjoin. This said, a silver-studded sword he gave, With scabbard and with well-cut belt complete. Ajax, a girdle rich with crimson dye, They parted, Ajax to the Grecian camp, and Hector to the ranks of Troy returned. Great was the joy when him they saw approach, alive and safe, escaped from Ajax's might, and arm invincible. And toward the town they led him back, beyond their hope preserved, while to Atrides' tent the well-grieved Greeks led Ajax glorying in his triumph gained. But when to Agamemnon's tents they came, the king of men to Saturn's royal son, a bullock slew, a male of five years old. The carcass then they flayed, and cutting up, severed the joints. Then fixing on the spits, roasted with care, and from the fire withdrew. Their labors ended, and the feast prepared, they shared the social meal, nor lacked their aught. To Ajax then the chine's continuous length, as honors mead the mighty monarch gave. 
After an age of thirst and hunger satisfied, the aged Nestor first his mind disclosed. He, who before the sagest counsel gave, now thus with prudent speech began and said, Atreides, and ye other chiefs of Greece, since many a long-haired Greek hath fallen in fight, whose blood beside Scamander's flowing stream fierce Mars has shed, while to the viewless shades their spirits are gone, behooves thee with the morn the warfare of the Greeks to intermit. Then we, with oxen and with mules, the dead from all the plain will draw, and from the ships a little space removed will burn with fire, that we, returning to our native land, may to their children bear our comrades' bones. Then will we go, and on the plain erect around the pyre one common mound for all, then quickly build before it lofty towers to screen both ships and men, and in the towers make ample portals with well-fitting gates that through the midst a carriageway may pass, and a deep trench around it dig to guard both men and chariots, lest on our defense the haughty Trojans should too hardly press. He said, and all the kings his words approved. Meanwhile, on Ilium's height, at Priam's gate, the Trojan chiefs a troubled council held, which opening, thus the sage Antenor spoke. Hear now, ye Trojans, Dardans, and allies, the words I speak, the promptings of my soul. Back to the sons of Atreus, let us give the Argive Helen, and the goods she brought. For now, in breach of plighted faith, we fight. Nor can I hope, unless to my advice ye listen, that success will crown our arms. Thus having said, he sat, and next arose the godlike Paris, fair-haired Helen's lord, who thus with winged words the chiefs addressed. Hostile to me, Antenor, is thy speech. Thy better judgment, better counsel knows. But if in earnest such is thine advice, thee of thy senses have the gods bereft. Now, Trojans, hear my answer. I reject the counsel, nor the woman will restore. But for the goods, whate'er I hither brought to Troy from Argos, I am well content to give them all and others add beside. This said, he sat. And aged Priam next, a god in council, Dardan's son, arose, who thus with prudent speech began and said, Hear now, ye Trojans, Dardans, and allies, the words I speak, the promptings of my soul. Now through the city take your wanted meal, look to your watch, let each man keep his guard. Tomorrow shall I, Deus, to the ships of Greece, to both the sons of Atreus, bear the words of Paris, cause of all this war. And ask, besides, if from the deadly strife such truce they will accord us as may serve to burn the dead. 
Hereafter we may fight till heaven decide and won with victory crown. He said, and they, obedient to his word, throughout the ranks prepared a wanted meal. But with the morning to the ships of Greece, Aegeus took his way. In council there, by Agamemnon's leading ship, he found the Grecian chiefs, the ministers of Mars, and mid them all the clear-voiced herald spoke, Ye sons of Atreus, and ye chiefs of Greece, from Priam and the gallant sons of Troy I come to bear, if ye be pleased to hear, the words of Paris, cause of all this war, the goods which hither in his hollow ships would he had perished, rather, Paris brought, he will restore and others add beside. But further says the virgin wedded wife of Menelaus, though the general voice of Troy should bid him, he will not restore. Then bids me ask if from the deadly strife such truce he will accord us as may serve to burn the dead. Hereafter we may fight till heaven decide and won with victory crown. Thus he, they all in silence heard. At length up rose the valiant Diomed and said, let none from Paris now propose to accept, or goods, or Helen's self. A child may see that now the doom of Troy is close at hand. He said, the sons of Greece with loud applause, the speech of valiant Diomed confirm. Then two ideas. Agamemnon thus. Ideas, thou hast heard what answer give the chiefs of Greece. Their answer I approve. But for the truce, for burial of the dead, I not demur. No shame it is to grace with funeral rites the corpse of slaughtered foes. Be witness, Jove, and guard the plighted truce. He said, and heavenward raised his staff. And back to Ilum's walls, Ideas took his way. Trojans and Dardans there in council met, expecting, sat, till from the Grecian camp Ideas should return, he came and stood in mid-assembly, and his message gave. Then all in haste, their several ways dispersed, for fuel some, and some to bring the dead. The Greeks too from their well-manned ships went forth, for fuel some, and some to bring the dead. The sun was newly glancing on the earth, from out the ocean's smoothly flowing depths, climbing the heavens, when on the plain they met. Hard was it then to recognize the dead. But when the gory dust was washed away, shedding hot tears, they placed them on the wains. Nor loud lament by Priam's high command was heard. In silence they, with grief suppressed, heaped up their dead upon the funeral pyre. Then burnt with fire, and back returned to Troy. The well-grieved Greeks, they too, with grief suppressed, heaped up their dead upon the funeral pyre then burnt with fire, 
and to the ship's return. But ere twas morn, while daylight strove with night, about the pyre a chosen band of Greeks had kept their vigil, and around it raised upon the plain one common mound for all, and built in front a wall with lofty towers to screen both ships and men, and in the towers made ample portals with well-fitting gates that through the midst a carriageway might pass. Then dug a trench around it, deep and wide, and in the trench a palisade they fixed. Thus labored through the night the long-haired Greeks. The gods assembled in the courts of Jove, with wonder viewed the mighty work, and thus Neptune, earth-shaking king, his speech began. O oh, Father Jove, in all the widespread earth shall men be found in counsel and design to rival us, immortals? Seest thou not how round their ships the long-haired Greeks have built a lofty wall and dug a trench around? Nor do the gods have paid their offerings due? Wide as the light extends shall be the fame of this great work, and men shall lightly deem of that which I and Phoebus jointly raise with toil and pain for great Laomedon. To whom in wrath the cloud compeller thus Neptune, earth-shaking king, what words are these? This bold design to others of the gods, of feebler hands and power less great than thine, might cause alarm. But far as light extends of this great work, to thee shall be the fame. When with their ships the long-haired Greeks shall take their homeward voyage to their native land. This wall shall by the waves be broken through, and sink a shapeless ruin in the sea. O'er the wide shore again thy sands shall spread, and all the boasted work of Greece o'erwhelm. Amid themselves such converse held the gods. The sun was set, the Grecian work was done. They slew and shared by tents the evening meal. From Lemnos Isle a numerous fleet had come, freighted with wine, and by Euneus sent, whom fair Hypsipyle to Jason born. For Atreus' sons, apart from all the rest, of wine the son of Jason had dispatched a thousand measures. All the other Greeks hastened to purchase, some with brass and some with gleaming iron, other some with hides, cattle or slaves, and joyous waxed the feast. All night the long-haired Greeks their revels held, and so in Troy the Trojans and allies. But through the night his anger Jove expressed with awful thunderings. Pale they turned with fear. To earth the wine was from the goblets shed, nor dared they drink until the Bacian stew had first been poured to Saturn's mighty son. Then lay they down and sought the boon of sleep. Book 8 Argument The Second Battle and the Distress of the Greeks Jupiter assembles a council of the deities and threatens them with the pains of Tartarus 
if they assist either side. Minerva only obtains of him that she may direct the Greeks by her counsels. The armies join battle. Jupiter on Mount Ida weighs in his balances the faiths of both, and affrights the Greeks with his thunder and lightnings. Nestor alone continues in the field in great danger. Diomed relieves him, whose exploits and those of Hector are excellently described. Juno endeavors to animate Neptune to the assistance of the Greeks, but in vain. The acts of Teucer, who is at length wounded by Hector and carried off. Juno and Minerva prepare to aid the Grecians, but are restrained by Iris, sent from Jupiter. The night puts an end to the battle. Hector continues in the field, the Greeks being driven to the fortifications before the ships, and gives orders to keep the watch all night in the camp to prevent the enemy from re-embarking and escaping by flight. They kindle fires through all the field and pass the night under arms. The time of seven and twenty days is employed from the opening of the poem to the end of this book. The scene here, except of the celestial machines, lies in the field toward the seashore. Now mourn in saffron robe the earth o'erspread, and Jove, the lightning's lord of all the gods, a council held upon the highest peak of many ridged Olympus. He himself addressed them, they his speech attentive heard. Hear, all ye gods and all ye goddesses, the words I speak, the promptings of my soul. Let none among you, male or female, dare to thwart my counsels. Rather, all concur, that so these matters I may soon conclude. If from the rest apart one god I find, presuming or to Trojans or to Greeks to give his aid, with ignominious stripes, Back to Olympus shall that god be driven, or to the gloom of Tartarus profound. Far off the lowest abyss beneath the earth, with gates of iron and with floor of brass, beneath the shades as far as earth from heaven. There will I hurl him, and ye all shall know in strength, how greatly I surpass you all. Make trial, if ye will, that all may know. A golden cord let down from heaven, and all both gods and goddesses your strength apply. Yet would ye fail to drag from heaven to earth, strive as ye may. Your mighty master, Jove? But if I choose to make my power be known, the earth itself and ocean, I could raise, and binding round Olympus's ridge the cord, leave them suspended so in middle air, so far supreme my power o'er gods and men. He said, and they, confounded by his words, in silence sat, so sternly did he speak. At length the blue-eyed goddess Pallas said, O father, son of Saturn, king of kings, well do we know thy power invincible? Yet deeply grieve we for the warlike Greeks, condemned to hopeless ruin. From the fight, since such is thy command, we stand aloof. 
but yet some saving counsel may we give, lest in thine anger thou destroy them quite. To whom the cloud compeller, smiling thus, Be of good cheer, my child, unwillingly I speak, yet will not thwart thee of thy wish. He said, and straight the brazen-footed steeds of swiftest flight, with manes of flowing gold, he harnessed to his chariot, all in gold himself arrayed, the golden lash he grasped of curious work, and mounting on his car, urged the fleet coursers. Nothing loth, they flew midway betwixt the earth and starry heaven. To Ida's spring abounding hill he came, and to the crest of Gagaris, wild nurse of mountain beasts, a sacred plot was there, whereon his incense-honored altar stood. There stayed his steeds, the sire of gods and men, loosed from the car and failed with clouds around. Then on the topmost ridge he sat, in pride of conscious strength, and looking down surveyed the Trojan city and the ships of Greece. Meantime, the Greeks throughout their tents in haste dispatched their meal, and armed them for the fight. On the other side, the Trojans donned their arms, in numbers fewer, but with stern resolve, by hard necessity constrained, to strive for wives and children in the stubborn fight. The gates all opened wide, Forth poured the crowd of horse and foot, and loud the clamor rose. When in the midst they met, together rushed bucklers and lances, and the furious might of mail-clad warriors, bossy shield on shield, clattered in conflict. Loud the clamor rose. Then rose two mingled shouts and groans of men slain and slain. Earth ran red with blood. While yet twas morn and waxed the youthful day, thick flew the shafts, and fast the people fell on either side. But when the sun had reached the middle heaven, the Eternal Father hung his golden scales aloft, and placed in each the fatal death lot, for the sons of Troy the one, the other for the brass-clad Greeks, then held them by the midst. Down sank the lot of Greece, down to the ground, while high aloft mounted the Trojan scale, and rose to heaven. Then loud he bade the volleying thunder peal from Ida's heights, and amid the Grecian ranks he hurled his flashing lightning. At the sight, amazed they stood, and pale with terror shook. Then not Idomeneus, nor Atreus' son, the mighty Agamemnon, kept their ground, nor either Ajax, ministers of Mars. Gerenian Nestor, aged prop of Greece, alone remained, and he, against his will, his horse sore wounded by an arrow shot by godlike Paris, fair-haired Helen's lord. Just on the crown, when close behind the head, first springs the mane, the deadliest spot of all, the arrow struck him. Maddened with the pain he reared, then plunging forward, with the shaft fixed in his brain, and rolling in the dust, the other steeds in dire confusion threw. 
while old Nestor, with his sword, essayed to cut the reins and free the struggling horse. Amid the rout, down came the flying steeds of Hector, guided by no timid hand, by Hector's self. Then had the old man paid the forfeit of his life, but good at need the valiant Diomed his peril saw, and loudly shouting on Ulysses called, Ulysses, sage, Laertes' godlike son, why fliest thou, coward-like amid the throng? And in thy flight to the aim of hostile spears, thy back presenting. Stay, and hear with me from this fierce warrior, guard the good old man. He said, but stout Ulysses heard him not, and to the ships pursued his hurried way. But in the front, Tydides, though alone, remained undaunted. By old Nestor's car he stood, and thus the aged chief addressed. Old man, these youthful warriors press thee sore, thy vigor spent, and with the weight of years oppressed, and hopeless too thy charioteer, and slow thy horses, mount my car, and prove how swift my steeds, or pursuits, or flight, from those of Tros descended, scour the plain. My noble prize from great Aeneas won. Leave to the attendants these, while mine we launch against the Trojan host, that Hector's self may know how strong my hand can hurl the spear. He said, and Nestor his advice obeyed. Two attendants, valiant Sthenelus and good Eurymedon, his horses took, while on Tydides' car they mounted both. The aged Nestor took the glittering reins and urged the horses. Hector soon they met, and as he came, his spear Tydides threw. Yet struck not Hector, but his charioteer who held the reins. The brave Cabeus' son, Enipolus, through the breast transfixed, beside the nipple. From the car he fell, the startled horses swerving at the sound, and from his limbs the vital spirit fled. Deep for his comrade slain was Hector's grief. Yet him, though grieved perforce, he left to seek a charioteer, nor wanted long his steeds, a guiding hand. For Archeptolemus, brave son of Aphytus, he quickly found, and bade him mount his swiftly flying car, to his hands the glittering reins transferred. Then fearful ruin had been wrought, and deeds untold achieved. And like a flock of lambs, the adverse hosts, been cooped beneath the walls, had not the sire of gods and men beheld, and with an awful peal of thunder, hurled his vivid lightning down. The fiery bolt before Tydides' chariot plowed the ground, fierce flashed the sulfurous flame, and whirling round beneath the yoke, the affrighted horses quailed. From Nestor's hand escaped the glittering reins, and trembling, thus to Diomed he spoke. Turn we to flight, Tydides. Seest thou not that Jove from us his aiding hand withholds? This day to Hector, Saturn's son, decrees the meed of victory. On some future day, if so he will, the triumph may be ours. For man, how brave soe'er, cannot o'errule the will of Jove, so much the mightier he. Whom answered thus the valiant Diomed? Truly, old man, 
wisely dost thou speak, but this the bitter grief that wrings my soul. Some day, amid the counsellors of Troy, Hector may say, Before my presence scared Tydides sought the shelter of the ships. Thus when he boasts, gape, earth, and hide my shame. To whom Gerenian Nestor thus replied, Great son of Tydeus, O oh, what words are these? Should Hector brand thee with a coward's name, No credence would he gain from Trojan men, Or Dardan, or from Trojan warriors' wives, Whose husbands in the dust thy hand hath laid. He said, and mid the general rout To flight he turned his horses. On the flying crowd, with shouts of triumph, Hector at their head, the men of Troy their murderous weapons showered. Loud shouted Hector with glancing helm, Tydides, heretofore the warrior Greeks have held thee in much honor, placed on high at banquets, and with liberal portions graced, and flowing cups. But thou, from this day forth, shalt be their scorn. A woman's soul is thine. Out on thee, frightened girl, thou ne'er shalt scale our Trojan towers, and see me basely fly, nor in thy ships our women bear away. Ere such thy boast, my hand shall work thy doom. Thus he, and greatly was Tydides moved to turn his horses and confront his foe. Thrice thus he doubted, thrice at Jove's command, from Ida's height the thunder pealed in sign of victory, swaying to the Trojan side. Then to the Trojans Hector called aloud, Trojans, and Lycians, and ye Dardans, famed in close encounter. Quit ye now, like men, put forth your wonted valor, for I know that in his secret counsels Jove designs glory to me, disaster to the Greeks. Fools in those wretched walls that put their trust Scarce worthy notice, helpless to withstand my onset. And the trench that they have dug, our horses easily can overleap. When I reach the ships, be mindful ye, to have at hand the fire, wherewith the ships we may destroy, while they themselves shall fall an easy prey, bewildered by the smoke. He said, Thus with cheering words addressed his horses. Xanthus and Podargus thou, Ethan and Lampus, now repay the care on you bestowed by fair Andromache, Aeson's royal daughter. Bear in mind how she, with ample store of provender, your mangers still supplied, before e'en I, her husband, from her hands the wine cup took. Put forth your speed, that we may make our prize of Nestor's shield, whose praise extends to heaven, its handles and itself of solid gold. And from the shoulders of Tydides strip his gorgeous breastplate, work of Vulcan's hands. These could we take, methinks this very night would see the Greeks embarking on their ships. Such was his prayer. But Juno, on her throne, trembled with rage, till great Olympus quaked, and thus to Neptune, mighty god, she spoke. O oh, thou of boundless might, earth-shaking god, 
Seest thou unmoved the ruin of the Greeks? Yet they in again, and in here is it. With grateful offerings which thine altars crown, then give we them the victory. If we all who favor Greece together should combine to put to flight the Trojans and restrain all seeing Jove, he might be left alone on Ida's summit to digest his wrath. To whom in anger Neptune thus replied, O Juno, rash of speech, what words are these? I dare not counsel that we all should join against Saturn's son, so much the stronger he. Such converse held they. All the space meanwhile within the trench, between the tower and ships, was closely thronged with steeds and bucklered men, by noble Hector, brave as Mars, and led by Jove to victory, cooped in narrow space. We now had burnt with five the Grecian ships. But Juno bade Atreides haste to rouse their fainting courage. Through the camp he passed, on his broad hand, a purple robe he bore, and stood upon Ulysses' lofty ship, the midmost, whence to shout to either side, or to the tents of Ajax Telamon, or of Achilles, who, at each extreme, confiding in their strength, had moored their ships. Thence to the Greeks he shouted loud and clear, Shame on ye, Greeks, base cowards, brave alone in outward semblance. Where are now the vaunts which once, so highly of ourselves we deemed, ye made, vain glorious braggarts as ye were, in Lemnos Isle, when feasting on the flesh of straight-horned oxen, and your flowing cups crowning with ruddy wine, not one of you, but for a hundred Trojans in the field, or for two hundred, deemed himself a match. Now quail ye all before a single man, Hector, who soon shall wrap our ships in fire. O oh, Father Jove, what sovereign heir hast thou so far deluded, of such glory robbed? Yet ne'er on this disastrous voyage bent have I unheeded past thine altar by, choicest offerings burning still on each in hopes to raise the well-built walls of Troy. Yet to this prayer at least thine ear incline, Grant that this coast in safety we may leave, nor be by Trojans utterly subdued. He said, and Jove with pity saw his tears, and with a sign his people's safety vouched. He sent an eagle, noblest bird that flies, who in his talons bore a wild deer's fawn. The fawn he dropped beside the holy shrine, where to the lord of divination, Jove, the Greeks were wont their solemn rites to pay. The sign from heaven they knew. With courage fresh assailed the Trojans, and the fight renewed. Then None of all the many Greeks might boast that he, before Tydides drove his car across the ditch, and mingled in the fight. His was the hand that first a crested chief, the son of Bradman, Achilleus, struck. He turned his car for flight, but as he turned, the lance of Diomed behind his neck between the shoulders, through his chest was driven. Headlong he fell, and loud his armor rang. Next 
to Tydides and Amemnon the king, and Menelaus, Atreus' godlike sons. The Aegises both in dauntless courage clothed, Idomeneus, whom Meriones, his faithful comrade, terrible as Mars, Eupolis, Eumenes' noble son. The ninth was Teucer, who with bended bow behind the shield of Ajax Telamon took shelter. Ajax o'er him held his shield. Thence looked he round and aimed amid the crowd. As he saw each Trojan wounded fall, struck by his shafts, to Ajax close he pressed, as to its mother sheltering arms, a child concealed and safe beneath the ample tar. Say then, who first of all the Trojans fell by Teucer's arrows slain? Orsilochus and Ophelestes. Dito, Ormenus, and godlike Lycophontes, Cronus, Emopeia, the Leon's son, and valiant Melanippus. All of these, each after another, Teucer laid in the dust. Him, Agamemnon, with his well strung bow, thinning the Trojan ranks, with joy beheld. Standing at his side, addressed him thus. Teucer, good comrade, son of Telamon, shoot ever thus if thou wouldst be the light and glory of the Greeks, and of thy sire who nursed thine infancy, and in his house maintained, though bastard, him, though distant far. To highest fame let thine achievements raise. This do I say, and will make good my word. If, by the grace of Aegis bearing Jove, and Pallas, Ilium's well-built walls be raised, a gift of honor, second but to mine, I in thy hands will place a tripod bright, or with their car and harness, two brave steeds, or a fair woman who thy bed may share. To whom in answer, valiant Teucer thus, Most mighty son of Atreus, why excite who lacks not zeal? To the utmost of my power, since first we drove the Trojans back, I watch, ceasing every chance to ply my shafts. Eight barbed arrows have I shot in now, and in a warrior each has found its mark. That savage hound alone defeats my aim. At Hector, as he spoke, another shaft he shot, ambitious of so great prize. He missed his aim, but Priam's noble son, Gorgythia, through the breast his arrow struck, whom from Asani brought a wedded bride of heavenly beauty, Castanera bore. Down sank his head, as in a garden sinks a ripened poppy charged with vernal rains, so sank his head beneath his helmet's weight. At Hector yet another arrow shot Teucer, ambitious of so great a prize. Yet this too missed, by Phoebus turned aside. But Archeptolemus, the charioteer of Hector, onward hurrying, through the breast it struck beside the nipple. From the car he fell, aside the startled horses swerved, and as he fell, the vital spirit fled. Deep for his comrade slain was Hector's grief. Yet him, though grieved at heart, 
perforce left and to Cipriones, his brother, called, and near at hand, the horse's reins to take, he heard and straight obeyed. Then Hector leaped down from his glittering chariot to the ground, his fearful war cry shouting, in his hand a ponderous stone carried, and intent to strike him down, at Teucer straight he rushed. He from his quiver chose a shaft in haste, and fitted to the cord, but as he drew the sinew, Hector, glancing helm, hurled the huge mass of rock, which Teucer struck near to the shoulder, where the collarbone joins neck and breast, the spot most opportune, and broke the tendon. Paralyzed, his arm dropped helpless by his side. Upon his knees he fell, and from his hands let fall the bow. Not careless, Ajax saw his brother's fall. O'er him spread in haste his covering shield. Two faithful friends, Asistius, Achaeus' son, Brave Alastor from the press withdrew and bore him deep groaning to the ships. Then Jove again Trojan courage fired, and backward to the ditch they forced the Greeks. Proud of his prowess, Hector led them on, and as a hound that fleet of foot or takes a bull or lion, object of his chase, springs from behind and fastens on his flank, yet careful watches, lest he turn to bay, so Hector pressed upon the long-haired Greeks, slaying the hindmost, they in terror fled, but passed at length the ditch and palisade, lost many Trojans slain, before the ships they rallied from their fight, and one to other called, and one and all with hands uplifted prayed to all the gods, while Hector here and there on every side his flying coursers wheeled with eyes that flashed awful as Gorgon's or as blood-stained Mars. Juno, the white-armed queen, with pity moved to Pallas, thus her winged words addressed. O oh, heaven, brave child of Aegis-bearing Jove, can we, even now, in this their sorest need, refuse the Greeks our aid? By one subdued, one single man, of pride unbearable, Hector, the son of Priam, who e'en now has caused them endless grief. To whom again the blue-eyed goddess Pallas thus replied, I too would fain behold him robbed of life, in his own country slain by Grecian hands, but that my sire, by ill advice misled, rages in wrath, still thwarting all my plans, forgetting now how oft his son I saved, sore wearied with the toils Eurystheus gave, oft would his tears ascend to heaven, and oft from heaven would Jove dispatch me to his aim. But if I then had known what now I know, when to the narrow gates of Pluto's realm he sent him forth to bring from Erebus its guardian dog, he never had returned in safety from the march of Styx profound. He holds me now in hatred, 
and his ear to Thetis lens, who kissed his knees and touched his beard, and prayed him to avenge her son, Achilles. Yet the time shall come when I shall be once more his own dear blue-eyed maid. But haste thee now, prepare for us thy car, while to the house of Aegis-bearing Jove I go, and don my armor for the fight, to prove if Hector of the glancing helm, the son of Priam, will unmoved behold us too advancing o'er the pass of war. Or if the flesh of Trojans, slain by Greeks, shall sate the maw of ravening dogs and birds. She said. The white-armed queen her word obeyed. Juno, great goddess, royal Saturn's child, the horses brought with golden frontlets crowned. While Pallas, child of Aegis bearing Jove, within her father's threshold, dropped her veil of airy texture, work of her own hands. The curious donned of cloud compelling Jove, and stood accoutred for the bloody fray. Her fiery car she mounted, in her hand a spear she bore, long, weighty, tough, wherewith the mighty daughter of a mighty sire sweeps down the ranks of those her wrath pursues. Then Juno sharply touched the flying steeds. Forthwith, spontaneous opening, grated harsh the heavenly portals, guarded by the hours, who heaven and high Olympus have in charge to roll aside or close the veil of cloud. Through these the excited horses held their way. From Ida's heights the son of Saturn saw, and filled with wrath, the heavenly messenger, the golden-winged Iris, thus bespoke. Haste thee, swift Iris, turn them back, and warn that farther they advance not. Tis not meet that they and I in war should be opposed. This too I say, and will make good my words. Their flying horses I will lame, themselves dash from their car, and break their chariot wheels. And ten revolving years heal not the wound where strikes my lightning. So shall Pallas learn what tis against her father to contend. Juno less moves my wonder and my wrath. Whate'er I plan, tis still her want to thwart. Thus he. Ida to Olympus' height, the storm-swift Iris on her errand sped. At many-ridged Olympus' outer gate, she met the goddesses, and stayed their course, and thus conveyed the sovereign will of Jove. Whither away? What madness fills your breasts? To give the Greeks your succor, Jove forbids. Thus he threatens, and will make it good. Your flying horses he will lame. Yourselves dash from the car, and break your chariot wheels. And ten revolving years heal not the wounds his lightning makes. So, Pallas, shalt thou learn what tis against thy father to contend. Juno less moves his wonder and his wrath. Whate'er he plans, tis still her want to thwart. But overbold and void of shame art thou, if against Jove thou dare to lift thy spear. Thus, as she spoke, Swift Iris disappeared, and 
Juno thus to Pallas spoke, No more, daughter of aegis-bearing Jove, can we, for mortal men, his sovereign will resist. Live they or die, as each man's fate may be, while he, twixt Greeks and Trojans, as tis meet, his own designs accomplishing decides. She said, and backward turned her horse's heads. The horses from the car the hours unyoked, and safely tethered in the heavenly stalls. The car they reared against the inner wall, that brightly polished stone. The goddesses themselves, meanwhile, amid the immortals all, with sorrowing hearts, on golden seats reclined. Ere long, on swiftly rolling chariot borne, Jove to Olympus, to the abode of gods, from Ida's height, returned. The earth-shaking god, Neptune, unyoked his steeds, and on the stand secured the car, and spread the covering o'er. Then on his golden throne, all-seeing Jove sat down. Beneath his feet, Olympus shook. Juno and Pallas only sat aloof. No word they uttered, no inquiry made. Jove knew their thoughts, and thus addressed them both. Pallas and Juno, wherefore sit ye thus in angry silence? In the glorious fight, no lengthened toil have ye sustained to slay the Trojans, whom your deadly hate pursues. Not all the gods that on Olympus dwell could turn me from my purpose. Such my might, and such the power of my resistless hand. But ye were struck with terror, ere ye saw the battlefield, and fearful deeds of war. But this I say, and bear it in your minds. Had I my lightning launched, and from your car had hurled ye down, yet ne'er had reached again Olympus's heights. The immortal gods abode? So spoke the god, but seated side by side, Juno and Pallas' glances interchanged of ill portent for Troy. Pallas indeed sat silent, and though inly wroth with Jove, yet answered not a word, but Juno's breast could not contain her rage. And thus she spoke. What words, dread son of Saturn, dost thou speak? Well do we know thy power invincible, yet deeply grieve we for the warlike Greeks condemned to hopeless ruin. From the fight, since such is thy command, we stand aloof, but yet some saving counsel may we give lest in thine anger thou destroy them quite. To whom the Cloud Compeller thus replied, Yet greater slaughter, stag-eyed queen of heaven, tomorrow shalt thou see, if so thou list, wrought on the warrior Greeks by Saturn's son. For Hector's proud career shall not be checked, until the wrath of Peleus's godlike son beside the ships be kindled, in the day when round Patroclus's corpse in narrow space, e'en by the vessel's sterns, the war shall rage. Such is the voice of destiny. For thee I reck not of thy wrath, nor should I care, though thou wert thrust beneath the lowest deep of earth and ocean, where Iapetus and Saturn lie, uncheered by ray of sun, or breath of air, in Tartarus profound. Though there thou wert to banishment consigned, I should not heed, 
brooked thy reproaches here unmoved, for viler thing is none than thou. He said, but white-armed Juno answered not. The sun, now sunk beneath the ocean wave, drew o'er the teeming earth the veil of night. The Trojans saw, reluctant, day's decline. But on the Greeks, thrice welcome, thrice invoked with earnest prayers, the shades of darkness fell. The noble Hector then, to council, called the Trojan leaders. From the ships apart he led them, by the eddying river's side, to a clear space of ground, from corpses free. They from their cars, dismounting, to the words of godlike Hector listened. In his hand his massive spear he held, twelve cubits long, whose glittering point flashed bright with hoop of gold encircled round. On this he leant and said, Hear me, ye Trojans, Dardans, and allies. I hoped that to the breezy heights of Troy we might ere now in triumph have returned, the Grecian ships and all the Greeks destroyed. But night have come too soon, and saved a while the Grecian army and their stranded ships. Then yield we to the night, prepare the meal, unyoke your horses, and before them place their needful forage. From the city bring oxen and sheep, the luscious wine provide, bring bread from out our houses, and collect good store of fuel, that the live long night, e'en till the dawn of day, may broadly blaze our numerous watchfires, and illume the heavens. Lest e'en by night, the long-haired Greeks should seek o'er the broad bosom of the sea to fly, that so not unassailed they may embark, nor undisturbed, but haply some may bear e'en to their homes the memory of a wound received from spear or arrow, as on board they leaped in haste, and others too may fear to tempt with hostile arms the power of Troy. Let the sacred herald's voice proclaim throughout the city that the stripling youths and hoary-headed sires allot themselves in several watches to the heaven-built towers. Charge too the women in their houses each to kindle blazing fires. Let careful watch be set, lest in the absence of the men the town by secret ambushed be surprised. Such, valiant Trojans, is the advice I give, and what tonight your wisdom shall approve, will I, at morn, before the Trojans speak. Hopeful to Jove, I pray, and all the gods, to chase from hence these fate-inflicted hounds, by fate sent hither on their dark-ribbed ships. Now keep we through the night our watchful guard, and with the early dawn, equipped in arms, upon their fleets our angry battle pour. And shall I know if Tydeus' valiant son back from the ships shall drive me to the walls, or I, triumphant, bear his bloody spoils. Tomorrow morn his courage will decide if he indeed my onset will await. But ere tomorrow's sun be high in heaven, he, mid the foremost, if I augur right, wounded and bleeding in the dust shall lie, and many a comrade round him. Would to heaven I were assured to be from age and death exempt, and held in honor as a god, Phoebus or Pallas, as I am assured the coming day is fraught with ill to Greece. 
Thus Hector spoke. The Trojans shouted loud. Then from the yoke the sweating steeds they loosed, and tethered each beside their several cars. Next from the city speedily they brought oxen and sheep, the luscious wine procured, brought bread from out their houses, and good store of fuel gathered. Wafted from the plain, the winds to heaven the savory odors bore. Full of proud hopes upon the pass of war, all night they camped, and frequent blazed their fires. As when in heaven, around the glittering moon, the stars shine bright amid the breathless air, and every crag and every jutting peak stands boldly forth, and every forest glade, even to the gates of heaven, is opened wide the boundless sky. Shines each particular star distinct, joy fills the gazing shepherd's heart. So bright, so thickly scattered o'er the plain, before the walls of Troy, between the ships and Xanthus's stream, the Trojan watchfires blazed. A thousand fires burnt brightly, and round each sat fifty warriors in the ruddy glare. Champing the provender before them laid barley and rye, the tethered horses stood beside the cars and waited for the morn.